Can you hear me now? Does everything sound okay? Great. Sorry about that. It was obviously not intentional. Uh, all I said was, what's up, Onagu? How's it going, man leggings and Genesis? Appreciate it. I'm not back to regular streaming, though I, as I said last week, will stream a little more while I'm playing more. I didn't play a ton the past few sets is probably the largest factor in why I didn't stream much. I just didn't really enjoy them that much. I don't know how I feel yet about Midnight Hunt. Uh, I try not to develop too much of a feeling the first week or two, because anytime you're solving a new puzzle, it's pretty fun in my opinion. Uh, so then really the question is like, is it still interesting like two weeks later? I mean, I should, I should say in drafts, not in weeks because everybody gets to draft very different amounts. But if the set is still interesting 20 drafts in, let's say, or uh, 50 drafts in, you know, that that's when like, you know, that's, that's what I'm really talking about. Not like, I try not to say like, oh, this set is so awesome. Like week one, because it's a new set. I'm enjoying it. I'm trying to figure stuff out. But anyways, as far as, um, me, I'm not on a regular schedule again, I will probably have random streams like this uh, sporadically, at least for the next couple weeks. Um, thanks to everybody who is tuned in. Thank you for the support. I appreciate it. I saw there was a subscription or two, which I think I thanked while it was on mute, but thank you, uh, Jay Zaller. Appreciate it. And Pitaku. Also, thank you, LSV, for the compliment on the beard. I know you've been rocking a beard for a long time. Sorry about any heat you're taking on Twitter for, you know, your support of fascism or whatever. Um, thanks for stopping in though. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks Cindy. It's just, L let me sit before I pop into the draft, which I'm going to do in just a second. Uh, cause this is, this is definitely going to be, I'm going to do a couple of drafts. Uh, you know, I'm, and once I get into the magic content, I'm not going to chat about much except what's going on in the magic content. Um, so as far as, uh, polls on who the best drafter is and things like that, what that question can be get can get a very different answer with only very minor tweaks in what you're really asking. Like for example, are you asking who's the most likely to win a given draft match? Because that includes play skill, not just the value you create during the draft portion. What if, on the other hand, somebody is the best at executing under the time constraints of draft with the knowledge they previously have? but not good at figuring out new draft formats, like how valuable everything is kind of, you know, in the abstract or whatever. So then the best drafter would be different depending on whether the question was, if you lock somebody, everyone in a room for an hour, for X long, and then have everybody draft, or you let people just like, you know, consume content and play on arena for a week and talk to people and then have you, everybody draft. So I take it as a huge compliment that so many people consider me the best drafter of all time or things like that. I personally would probably take ham if you were like, hey, there's a draft match in a randomly selected format starting in like 10 minutes and like, you know, the, your life depends on that, the outcome of that match. My nomination would be ham. Now, if you're asking like, who's the best limited theorist, who figures out the most different things. But the thing is, depending on where you're coming from and what you're facing in terms of a tournament, a team, a challenge, you know, your, um, what you're even trying to figure out is different. So it's a really complex question, but ultimately I don't think there's any definitive answer, but I find it really humbling and really flattering that so many people choose me because that means that they felt like they learned a lot about draft from me over the years. And that's really what matters the most to me. I listen, I like winning. I like getting to the top of things. Everybody does. But I've said from day one, and I think my personality will always match this, and anybody who knows me really well would agree with this, I'm way more of an analyst than a competitor. I, I want to explore everything to the fullest. I want to figure everything out. And then at the end of the day, the chips fall where they may. I think that's actually partially helped me to compete well because I don't feel a ton of pressure. I think that's also, um, you know, kind of hindered my results some that I've, I frequently am not giving my all, but that's also because it's not how I can optimally use my resources in terms of my life. So anyways, I just wanted to talk about that for a second. Um, but I, as usual, when I saw the poll, I definitely just really appreciated how many people like vote for me and stuff, because like I said, to me, it's just the thing that communicates clearly to me is that people feel like they've learned a lot from my content. And that's like, you know, if I, if I'm going to leave one mark on magic, I would want it to be that. Not that I was thought of as like, you know, the tightest technical player of all time or something. That's actually LSV who's in the chat right now. But that, you know, somebody who developed a lot of good limited theory that people learn from helped them to think about limited uh, better and clearer and like figure out formats more and things like that. Um, 
So anyways, I just wanted to briefly talk about that because, you know, it was, it's always a, a thing that comes up on Twitter from time to time. And listen, rankings are fun. I'm not in any way against it. Uh, it's all in good fun. And, you know, you can take the question exactly how you want. If the person leaves it open-ended like like Hain did on this weekend's uh, tweet about it or poll about it, sometimes people are more specific and put it in the qualifiers, whatever. I mean, I love a good ranking. I just wanted to put out my two cents. So anyways, thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Uh, thank you to the people who subscribed when I was on that little uh, diatribe there. Um, appreciate you, Liberathon, Nova Asterix, Saul. I see Janice gifted LSV a sub. It's true what they say, the rich get richer. I appreciate the support and the generosity, Janice, even if LSV doesn't need it. Thank you, Sir Billingsworth. Appreciate the subscription. Well, I've drafted every set on stream, Wikip, uh, but the last draft format I drafted regularly on a schedule was the start of Strixhaven. And then when I stopped liking Strixhaven about three weeks in and I realized I just didn't want to be drafting it this much, then I then I stopped and dedicating that amount of time to it. But uh, it really hasn't been that long. I mean, I, uh, I've been done the sweatsuit almost every week, so I've been streaming about once a week instead of about three times a week. And I've done a few random streams other than that. But anyways... Like I said, that's just another huge compliment that people miss my stream, and I really do appreciate the support. And, you know, like I said, I can't promise anything specific, but it's free to follow, so if you want to know what I'm on, just just push follow. And if not, you can follow me on Twitter, you can follow me on here, wherever. I usually tweet about it, etc. So, on that note, let's get into some Premier Draft Midnight Hunt. Going to do best of one rank. That's pr mostly what I play these days. I'm kind of addicted to the speed of it and the ranking system. Even though sub games like that that don't have any real value are great ways to trick and manipulate people, I'm not above human psychology. They get me too. So I'm pretty addicted to best of one at this point. You're not late, uh, Yoitz Rerian. You're here at the perfect time. I'm literally in the draft queue. Thank you, Professor Dumbledore. So I looked up the date I started it because I was, I was tweeting pictures of it and all of that. Um, the, the beard is exactly two months and three days old from literally the last day I shaved. Not so this is a two month beard for me. So I'm pretty pleased with how thick it's grown in, in just a couple months. I trimmed it once, but mostly just the length. So pretty much gotten to near full thickness in two months, which I think is pretty good. Thank you, mini ploppy. Appreciate the subscription. Yeah, so I I played this weekend, exactly as I said, I can't learn as much when I'm playing from the poker table. It's kind of like, you know, you're spreading your mental energy, like I'll play, when I play on my phone from the poker table, I get more combined than if I like was only doing magic or poker, but I don't do either one as well. You know what I mean? Like I might play poker at 70% of my ability and I might learn like half of what I would normally learn because my mind is also on the poker game. So anyways, and I'm making up those exact numbers, obviously. But so anyways, I did a bunch of drafts this weekend, but I don't have like the highest degree of confidence in anything. I think the blue-black is definitely good. I saw like what LSV tweeted about it. And uh, I think Ryan Sachs said something about basically like, you know, and he understands this. He's like basically forcing blue-black for now, going to see how long it takes, you know, for, for everyone else to catch up and figure out what's next to get ahead of the curve. Because that is how it works. Like blue black could be the best deck and the most and like an obvious one that's easy to put together so if you're on it day two and you jam at day two you may get good results that doesn't mean you also want to be jamming at day nine a week later a bunch of everyone may know it's the best deck may understand how to draft it and your results may get worse anyways let's get into this pack willow geist seems fine but not great it's not going to grow that quickly spell rune painters fine also not great not that easy to trigger root, root wild creeper here is good I don't think this pack is very good. I think Spellroom Painter is probably the best card. Maybe Rejuvenator. I don't. I don't know. This pack just looks bad to me. Um, if there was something really good in that pack, like like that green on combo with a bunch of text, I'm not even sure I've ever read that one yet. Um, but uh, basically, that just seemed like a horrible pack. Thank you, the MDR. Appreciate the subscription. Hopefully, your assessment of that pack matches mine because I thought it was really bad. Um, yeah, okay, so let's see. Curse of Surveillance. This is just draw two cards a turn from the turn you play this, right? You put it on the opponent, you draw two cards a turn. That's not bad for five mana. 
Um, let's see. Obsessive Astronomer is a pretty good two drop. You can pass and flip and rummage. I assume Siege Zombie that everybody's talking about is Diagraph Horde, which is obviously an awesome card. It's basically a five mana three four that like does four damage or gives you like sack fodder and stuff like that. Um, Select a Sanctifier is also pretty good. Pretty easy to just pass, flip, and get a card on a future turn. I think that Obsessive Astronomer following like a Red Uncommon is probably the right pick. I don't think it's bad to take um, any of those other cards, basically. I think all of these cards are pretty close. Like I said, I'm not claiming that uh, the card I'm taking is definitely better than the next... Oh, well, is Siege Zombie the 3-4 for 5 that we were just talk that I was just talking about then? Or is it a different card actually called Siege Zombie or something? I think you could certainly take that there. It's probably better uh, than Spell Rune Painter. I might have even just missed it if that was in the pack. I don't think I even saw it, really. I mean, listen, I think it's a good card. It is a 5-drop. You only want so many 5-drops. Um, but I actually just didn't see it, if that's the card. Siege is 2-2, two, two, tap, 3, deal, 1 damage. Oh, yeah, that card's fine. I, I think I don't think that card is as good as Astronomer. I mean, if you want, I mean, as Spell Rune, not not by much. Like it's not much different. But and if you want to really prioritize Black, then by all means. But I mean, that's it's just a two mana two two. So I'm gonna stick with the red werewolf theme we've got going here and take Village Watch. So now let's see. So we have a, the most mediocre red on common werewolf theme in history. Um, all three of these cards, I think, are pretty solid that you're happy to have make your main. None are anything special. Let's see what's here. So Selectus Sanctifier would go well, though, with the day-night werewolf theme we're doing. Organ Hoarder, definitely better than Select Celestus Sanctifier. Organ Hoarder is not an LSV card-drawing card. This is just a good card. Because you don't fall behind when you draw cards off 4-mana 3-2s. Like, 4-mana 3-2 is only, like, one power and toughness or so off rate. Maybe, you know, one and a half power and toughness. So, like, you can trade this for their three drop and still keep the card drop. Um, that said, though, I feel like we've seen a lot more white than blue. I'm kind of thinking I want the select a sanctifier. Feel like this is a good situation for, like, a red-white werewolf stack in this seat. Given, it feels like those are the colors we're seeing, right? I mean, there was the pick before this. I took the the village watch over it, and I, but I think the white card's better. There was the three mana uncommon white. Uh, card basically the uncommon version of Celestis Sanctifier. It's like a three mana three three with Ward One, and when you it makes a day or whatever. So I took I took this I took the red card over because we already had two red cards. But I th I feel like white and red were the colors we're seeing, and I think we just got rewarded. And I think I was right. Angel Fire Ignition is a totally broken rare, right? Like this card is near unbeatable. It's just a red white gold card. So I so I mean I think we successfully found the open colors here in red and white. Hey, thanks for the subscription, Voxy. One of the best subscriptions you can ever get. Another top uh, limited creator, content creator and streamer. Appreciate the support. Okay, so here, this is an easy flame channeler. Of note, there is an organ hoarder chilling in the pack as well. So it does seem like basically we're not seeing black or green and red, blue, and white are all pretty available to us. So that said, pretty easy to unite's rush, I think. There's plenty of one toughness creatures in this format, so I've liked this card. I mean, you can't always cycle it off for three mana at no cost, but you know, like that's a real cost to pay on early turns. But if you ever kill a one toughness creature with it, even if it only costs one or two mana, the one toughness creature, that's a profitable exchange. Like that card did work for you. Um, okay, so now I guess I'm just gonna take another neonate's rush. I mean, these blue cards are somewhat tempting. But again, Angel Fire Ignition is like a really busted card, I think. Like, it's a gold card, so I get why we were able to see it fifth pick pack one. You you're, you're got to be red and white. I mean, somewhat splashable. But I think it's a really powerful card. So, okay, just going to stick with prioritizing red. Obviously, we're not committed to white. I mean, we're 100% to play red. Especially if we did, like, want to splash Angel Fire Ignition. It is single white. We could always just pick up an Evolving Wilds or something. Also, our red cards are really aggressive, which tend to go well with, like, white and not that well with blue in general. I don't know, though. Blue isn't... Blue's, like, a weird color in this format. I don't think it's really very aggressive or controlling. I think it's more, like, good for fueling zombies and stuff. Like... 
you know, like, blue is good at fueling, like, the graveyard and that stuff, so it works well in blue-white as the, like, disturb archetype, and it works well with black in the zombie archetype. I'm not really sure what you do with blue-red in this format, or blue-green. I mean, I don't think blue-green is an archetype, really, so much as, you know, you just draw cards and cast big green creatures and whatever, but I don't know, like, really, like, is blue, what is blue-red trying to lean into as far as to get the most out of its cards? I don't think I've drafted blue-red a single time in this format. And, like, I've done probably, I don't know, 20-ish drafts. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Appreciate the subscription. Blue and red is spells matter. I mean, that's norm. That's probably the most frequent thing it is, but there aren't that many spells matters cards at common in this, in this set, right? Like, for blue red, like... You know, when that when that deck is good, you're usually building around things. Like, if you think about, like, War of the Spark, right, where that deck was probably at its best, you had Spell Gorger Weird, and you had uh, the Burning Prophet thing for 2 mana 1-3. That was two different commons that were absolutely excellent for Spells Matter. What commons does Blue Red have? I mean, yeah, you can get back a removal with Ardent Elemental List, but you can do that just as well in a red-black deck. Okay, so here we're obviously going to take Moonveil Regent. This is like a, you know... I don't want to call this broken in the same way that, like, six mana Lilianas that just single-handedly win the game from any game state are broken. This is, like, an A plus S minus broken rare, right? Four mana, four, four flyer. If it deals, you get to deal one or two. If it dies, you get to deal one or two. And once your hand is pretty much empty, you can draw a card when you cast a spell. Clearly a very good card. Clearly better than, like, an efficient red common removal. Like, this card, Moonveil Region is better than, like, Cathartic Pyre, which is, you know, a, probably the best red removal. I'm, I can't necessarily think of every rare one. But at the same time, it's not, like, board-dominating broken or something. Okay, so Voldaren Ambusher is pretty good if you have a decent amount of vampires. Remember, if you have one other vampire out and you attack and then play this, you get to kill a 2-2. That said, you've got to be able to deal them damage, but our deck's going to be pretty good at dealing them a small amount of damage if we want to. We're an aggro deck for sure. And then the next question is, do we have vampires? I think we do, because Stinger's a vampire, Perforator's a vampire. These are like wizards and not vampires. So we have two, and we do have a bunch of Neonates rushes that we won't necessarily play all of. We got really late. So I think this is a pick between the Ambusher and the Sanctifier. If we're definitely going to be red-white, the Sanctifier is better. We have a decent amount of werewolves. You know, I'm going to take the Sanctifier also because there's another red co card that I'd be happy to table, the 2-mana two 2-1 two vamp. I mean, it's nowhere near as good, of course, but we will probably table it if somebody takes the uh, the, uh, the pinging vampire that I was considering there, the Ambusher. And uh, we're, we shouldn't table Sanctifier because it was like the only white card in the pack. So I think it makes sense since there was two good red cards, at least playable red cards, and one white card, that we take the white card so we can maybe table the red one. Okay, so Thermal Alchemist, it's a damage a turn. It turns on stuff like um, the card I was just talking about, the Voldaren Ambusher. Uh, we're not going to untap it too much, but we have spells, including flashback spells. So, uh, But I think that we're a little aggro deck. I think this is a pretty clear Gavany Silversmith. Um, this card is going to be at its best if you have a bunch of cheap red and white creatures, which we do. Speaking of Dual Craft Trainer, also excellent uh, with a bunch of cheap red and white creatures of different sizes. Otherwise, there's Spell Rune Painter, which should be fine in our deck, but not exciting. Can't believe I first picked this card. Like, this card is like a sixth pick. It's like a fine playable, but it's like, it's not a first pick. Um, I haven't actually had Lunar Frenzy much. I mean, it could be a good finisher. I don't really like finishers because when your opponent's attacking you and you're behind, they're basically a mulligan. Um, I think here's a pretty cl clear dual craft trainer. I think this is the best card. And then, uh, we'll see what we, which of those red cards we table if we have an interesting decision. So now it's the Perforator or the Candlegrove Witch. The Candlegrove Witch is definitely, I don't think a Thar's Call is very good. I know you can play it when they're tapped and get a 1-1 immediately, so you don't get completely 2-for-1 if they kill your creature. But does a one does the 1-1 one -one even do that much? And, like, if you don't have it on a flyer, you can't even attack or block with the creature because they'll just trade with it. So I think this is one of the two drops, and I think we're pretty committed to red-white at this point, so I'm going to take Candlegrove Witch because it's the better of the two drops. So now there's Burn the Accused. I mean, all of the white and red cards in this pack are pretty close and playable for us. Um, let's see, we have one five drop. We have a handful of fours. Plenty of twos. Really, we just have a good curve all around. I think the Odrix Outrider is probably the best of these cards, especially if you're going to be trading off little creatures and pressuring them. Um, 
So I don't, I think it's the right one to take unless you feel like we have too many fours, which, I mean, we don't. We have four fours, which is a fine number. All right, these cards are pretty unexciting. I mean, I like the Stinger just fine. I don't want a lot of that card. I wouldn't necessarily mind a second. Morning Patrol is fine too. Not great, I think. So there's a decent amount of hype on Lunark Veteran I saw, probably based on like the 17 lands data or something. As usual, I don't think the data is properly telling the conclusions that you want, but I do think there's something legitimate there. And this format is just a lot of racing and stuff like that. So I can see life gain being worth a lot. I'm going to take Trapper over here because of the zero power and we have a decent amount of Coven and we're really aggro deck. So life gain is not worth, it's not on the high end is what it's worth, worth for us. But I definitely do think that's a good card, especially if your deck is less aggro and you feel like you're going to win if the game goes long. Okay, another Sanctifier. Obviously, I don't need Neonate's Rush number four, five. That is a card that gets worse in multiples because they're not going to keep having one toughness creatures. So like, you do want to value those lower as you get more of them. I'm highly unlikely to play four. Hey, thanks for the raid, Lady Lavinius. Appreciate the support. I hope you had a good stream. Thank you, Harry Houdini. Appreciate the subscription also. Thank you for the nice compliment as well. I prefer money, but compliments are good too. That's why I thank you for the subscription first, the compliment second. Um, so let's see. So we're not switching colors. We're committed to red-white. Um, so there's the question of candle trap. Or Candle Trap, because I don't think Moon Silver Key is really playable unless you have some kind of good artifact it can search for that you actually want. Or maybe if you're really desperate for the sources and you're splashing, you didn't get Evolving Wilds, but we're pretty much just a two-color red-white aggro deck. So this is pretty much an easy Candle Trap. Candle Trap's just good removal. Even if they can still block with it once, then I can just pay three or just keep attacking, whatever. Um, obviously, it's a better removal if you're not an aggro deck, but it's still solid removal for us. So let's see, where are we at... We have this powerful Coven card. It's good to know about just the one. And then we have all these Celestis Sanctifiers. And this this is a good Coven 2 drop. Coven 2 drop. Okay. So we're just, yeah, like we're just a very solid red white aggro deck with not that much synergy and perfectly fine power level. And a curve is good. We don't really need anything. So we just want to be basically taking the best cards. I think Famished Foragers and Lamhold Harrier are pretty close. I'm going to go with the Harrier here, though. I think our deck's pretty aggressive, but I'm going to want to play like 17 lands because we have uh, some fives and fours. So that gives us a mana sink to make sure we're not flooded and we really, and we really want to hit our two drops. I definitely think you could have took the four drop there. I think it was a close pick. This is already 23 cards, so we're going to end up cutting some of the weakest ones of these when we build. So we should probably start to figure out what those are now so we can, you know, have a more accurate assessment of our curve. I mean, I'm not going to play four Neonates Rushes here without other synergies. Let's assume we play, like, two. That's pretty easy. Probably cut, like, a Stinger, unless we get uh, Vampire's cards. I think Trapper's better. Okay, so here there's Sanctifier, Captain, and Harrier again. I mean, I think Sanctifier's good. I mean, I don't think it's, like, great or whatever, but I think it's, like better than these uh these other cards search party captain isn't bad it might be, it would be our first one and we do have plenty of two drops so we can play it on curve on turn three i mean i think sanctifier and captain are pretty close they're both basically three drop white creatures like one's a two two that gets you a card immediately one's the three two that you know night days and like you'll get you'll basically get a card out of over the long run um so we're not playing a splash green Unnatural Moonrise would be good for us if we were, but we're not. Is Seize playable? I don't. I didn't think this card was good. Create a red elemental, power and tough sequence number of instant sorceries in your graveyard. No, we can't use that. We're not going to have that many. Uh, the combat trick, no. I think I honestly, just between the three drop and the two drop again, and it's really just curve considerations. I think we just took a three in the, um, the what you might call it, the search party captain. So this time I'll take the two in the Harrier. So again, basically, do we want the one-drop Lunark Veteran here or the three-drop Ritual Guardian? I think they're both fine. Neither one's, like, exceptional. Maybe we'll go with the one-drop this time. I don't think it's going to be great for us because the next pretty aggressive, 
But I mean, we can use the bodies and we have a lot of creatures. It's never a bad thing to gain life to be able to double spell, you know, with your cheap uh, creatures like that, like the veteran. Okay, so a less Lunar Frenzy is actually good. I think it's Search Party Captain over the five drops. Is Frenzy good? Does this deck want one Lunar Frenzy? Eh, for science, right? This is the only way we're going to figure it out. I mean, I have an aggro deck full of cheap creatures. If Lunar Frenzy is going to be good, it's going to be good in my deck, right? So it makes sense to take one, I think, kind of see how it is here. Candlegrove Witch is a good two drop for a deck like ours, but we're not hurting for two drops. I think Search Party Captain is probably a better three since I took all those Lambhole Terriers. Late Gavany Silversmith, that's an excellent pickup that's obviously going to make our deck. I don't think we're going to play any of these cards. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we're going to want like one card. We're not going to play any of those cards. I'm not going to start thinking about which one is the least bad and stands no chance to make our deck. So this is 26. So we already have to cut two cards. Cut like the Stinger. Since we have better one drops with the Trapper and the Veteran. The twos look great. The threes look good. Yeah, the curve is just good. All the cards are good. So I'm not sure what the last cut or two is. I'm Which one? Oh, the Pump Spell Courage? Yeah, maybe I could have considered that a little bit more. I mean, I don't know how much I love Pump Spells, especially in a format where the creatures are often attacking past each other or, like, you're being attacked by something you basically can't block. But, uh... It's an efficient enough card, like, if your deck wants that. So, I mean, let's take a look at our deck laid out here. Um, we have a lot of... Well, these aren't really four. Search Party Captain, realistically, is going to cost three the vast majority of the time. So that said, though, we do have... Yeah, the curve's just really good, actually. Like, we don't really have, like, mad extra twos, but we could cut our weakest one. We have six. We have two one-drop creatures that are both pretty good. We have a bunch of threes. Like, we don't have too many fours, nor are we missing them. We have five. I mean, this is... I'm not saying this deck is anything incredible. Like, I, you know, like, the power level's good, nothing special. I might go 7-0. I might go 1-3. It's arena best of one. But the curve is pretty much perfect. This is, like, what you want, like, a, a, a mid mid-rangey 17 lands aggro deck to have, like, as its curve. This is almost textbook. We've got, like, six two drops plus a couple playable one drops, and then three, five, like, six-ish three drops, and then, like, five-ish four drops, one five drop, like, I mean, we could go to 16 lands. How are our mana sinks? We have Tapper. We have these Harriers, which are pretty decent mana sinks if we're ahead. Powerful uh, flashback spell. Yeah, but these help us draw a card for two to three mana also. And these can help us find lands. I think we can probably go to 16 lands. In which case, maybe I want to try and cut a 5 or a 4, though. Well, we're not cutting Dualcraft Trainer or Gavany a Silversmith here. Or Odrix Outrider or Moon Regent. So we're probably not cutting a 5 or a 4, then. I guess I, I could cut this card. I mean, it's pretty good. 5 mana, 4, 3 haste, and then it flips into a 5, 4. Um, I mean, Stinger's good, but we're not, like, hyper aggro or something. We're just, like, a cheap, aggressive deck that's going to attack. I use the word aggro a lot, meaning that we're going to... We expect to be the one attacking, but, like, a lot of the time. But, like, it's not like we're, like, flooding the board with ones and twos and cheap spells trying to, like, end the game on turn six or something. No, the five's not that good. It's cuttable. But it, it's a pretty good curve topper, too. I mean, it's 4-3 haste, and then it flips. If it didn't have haste, it would be an easy cut. Painter seems bad. Yeah, Painter's cuttable too. I don't have a lot of instants. That's a, that's a reason to cut it. And I do have a lot of early drops. Yeah, maybe Painter for my first pick. Just my worst card in my deck. <laughs> Remember, that pack was absolutely horrendous. It was between that and Siege Zombie and like one or two other okay playables and whatever. Yeah, the five drops certainly on the, on the cuttable, cuttables. The cuttables, I would say, are Village Watch. I don't think the fours are really cuttable at all. Um, I mean, we could always cut a Neonate's Rush. It's fine. Harrier is the worst two. I think the Veteran's probably worse than the Trapper in our deck. Um, and the card I actually cut so far, the Spell Rune Painter is the worst three. So I think basically the stack on the right are the cuttable cards. Like, I don't think it's crazy to cut any one of these cards here on the right. Cutting something else. I mean, the Frenzy might be cuttable too. I'm trying that. I don't have an idea of how good it is. But... 
I think I'm down with the painter as the cut. The reasons mostly being we have a lot to do early. Um, I could see that big haste creature really swinging a game. Like I said, I think haste is worth a lot in this format. I think that this is a pretty aggressive format where the creatures are frequently like attacking past each other and like life total actually matters. So I like, I think haste is worth a lot in this format. So having your like, you know, you're just a notch behind and then you play your four, three haste and attack with everything and swing the board, I think might be a little better than it seems. Thanks, Andy Pip. Appreciate the subscription. I don't think it's unreasonable at all to play 17, Janice. So I was like on the fence between 16 and 17, but I realized I have like two search party captains, two neonates. So that's four cards that draw a card for like three-ish mana. So that'll help me hit land four. So I could candle trap it and keep attacking, but they get to draw the card when it dies. That doesn't seem very good. Um, I could attack and trade and let them draw a card and play the search party captain, or I'm casting nothing. So it looks like I'm going to two for one myself. Normally I wouldn't do this, but I think it's better than casting absolutely nothing. So if I had drawn like a diff different three drop, I would just not attack here. I would just play the other three drop and pass the turn. But since the only way I can use any mana this turn, and it's use three or use zero, is to make that trade and play the captain, I think it becomes worth it. Okay, 2-1 can't block. Seems like a good chance to just slap down the silversmith and get full value while they're tapped. I'm going to end up holding this land probably because the, when the astronomer flips, you get to rummage. So we want to hold any dead cards now, like lands. Obviously, you don't really want to kill this thing or it gets to kill your best creature, basically. So you do it if you have to towards the end of a game or something, especially then since it's you sack. So like if you kill Vengeful Strangler, like when life totals are high, you basically have to sack what they put it on because you can't sack things forever. If you kill it on like the last turn or the next to last turn, then you can just choose to sack like your token, your worst creature, etc. So basically, you never want to block that thing early. And then late, you have to evaluate like, do I need to do it? So, okay, nothing I can do about that. We're going to attack and play our creatures and then just sack the search party captain because, like I said, I can't sack permanents forever from this early. I'm going to hold the land so that I can discard it to the astronomer uh, if we ever, if day turns to night. Thanks, Just Renu. So like I said, I pretty much have to sack the captain because I could sack something else, but the next turn I'm going to have to sack again. So what I was trying to explain was like, it's totally okay to kill this card on like, like the last turn, the next to last turn in a tight race. Then they put it on your best creature. You get to attack with it. Then on their next upkeep, you sack like your token or whatever, and then the game ends. But like you do not want to kill Vengeful Stranglers when you have a decent target out and it's early in the game. Obviously, if it's like turn two or three and they attack and you have nothing else out, you can just block and trade with it, right? Then it doesn't even go anywhere really, but... Then it doesn't go anywhere, but okay. So now if we pass the turn, we'll get to discard these two lands and draw new cards. Or we could attack. If we attack and they block, we can use the frenzy. But it's just gonna like kill the creature that blocks it, unless they go for like a double block or something, which there's no reason for them to do. I think we probably want to take the one turn off and rummage two lands away and see what we get, right? can even use the Frenzy on defense. It's not nearly as good, won't deal trample damage, but we can still use our mana and give something first strike. So I'm going to go ahead and pass and uh, double rummage here. Since I already have two mountains, I'm pretty happy to discard. And then we'll see uh, what we draw and start playing again from there. Okay, well, that doesn't change anything, right? I still get my rummage. Cool. So assuming they like attack all, I'll block the Unruly Mob and go for the Lunar Frenzy. Um, Unruly Mob is definitely the one we want to kill because if I kill one of the other ones, then the mob will grow. 
Assuming they attack with just this covert cut, cut, cut purse, I'm just not even going to block, probably. It already comes back from the dead. It'll grow the unruly mob. Just doesn't seem worth a block. Okay, so now that the rummage creature is gone, playing the lands has way less of a drawback. I mean, this turn is pretty much scripted. We're even turning on Coven, so we can play our uh, Regent and our Veteran, you know, in the order that gets us a life, and then Candle Grove Witch gets flying, and we can attack them and all kinds of good stuff. Hey, uh, Tobruk. Yeah, I think that attack with the 2-1 would have been good, but maybe they didn't do it, because since they didn't play any other creature, they were only even giving up one point of damage, because they had the Siege Zombie. So, like, if I have a trick or a good block or whatever, then maybe the play, like, isn't worth it for them, and by not doing it, they're only missing one damage, not two, because it's the difference between pinging with the Siege Zombie or not. So I can, I can see the rationale behind their play, I'm not saying it was optimal or not, I don't know. So we're one point short of killing them. Oh, no, no, we just killed them with Coven, right? With the two flyers. Okay, so they're just dead. So they don't have any flyers. Unless they can do something for one white, they're just dead to Lunar Frenzy. Uh, I don't know what the stream title says. Uh, if one of the mods wants to change it, that would be great. If it says something that it shouldn't say. But I, I think this should be game. I can't really see what they can do here with a white mana. I do wouldn't want to be clear, though. I wouldn't view this game as Lunar Frenzy performing well. If this is like any other card, I just attack them, candle trap something, and drop the other thing, and they die on the following turn. This is a game where, like... So magic's really tricky when you're trying to assess how good a card it is. What you're trying to do is figure out how much value it created. And by that, I mean how much it increased your win percentage, right? So, like, let's say a card does three damage to the opponent, like Lightning Bolt, and they're at three and you bolt them. Does that mean Lightning Bolt increased your win percentage? Well, if they have no cards in their library and they were going to draw and they couldn't draw, so if you passed the turn, they would have decked and you would have won anyway, Lightning Bolt did not produce any value because it took you from 100% to win to 100% to win. On the other hand, let's say they were going to attack you for lethal on the following turn, and the only way you could win the game was your one out or lightning bolt. Well, lightning bolt won you a game that almost nothing else would have because they have like a ton of creatures, so it created value, right? So like, it's really hard to assess in Magic exactly how much value each card creates. Even a card that's winning you the game, like ending the game in the moment, may not actually have created value because it just brought your win percent from 100 to 100. Or it might have brought your win percent from 99 to 100 or something and created some very small amount of value. So the point there is that little rant about the concept, but the point was that's not a, that wasn't a performance by the combat trick, in my opinion. Like, my dragon won me that game. The combat trick just won't, just ended the game a turn earlier than, like, the dragon would have on its own is the, is the point I'm trying to make. But hopefully thinking about it that way, the concept is useful to you as well. Thanks, Drops. Thanks, Iwan. I hope you have a great time as well. All right, so I would block and make this trade, except I have Neonate's Rush, so I'm clearly not going to because I want there to be the target, the one toughness target in play for me to ping. Interestingly enough, you might want to think about if your opponent doesn't make a block that seems fairly obvious like that, they may have a reason for it. So, for example, let's say right now I had some really good three drop to drop, so I dropped that. If I was Jonas, my opponent here, I might be thinking, hmm, that's weird. My opponent didn't block with Lamhold Harrier, and I'm on the play attacking them with a three-power creature. They must have a reason to not want to trade their 2-2 for my 3-1 and save three life, like something that does one damage. All right, what is the Patrician Geist? Flying, other spirits you control get plus one plus one, spells you cast from the graveyard. Okay, it doesn't really affect anything So I think at the moment. So I think this is just attack, and then Neonates rush the 3-1. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try and change the title. I mean, I don't know what it even says or anything, but is the title, like, does the title still say Sweatsuit or something? Okay, so let's see. We probably just want to play our Flyer. I don't know if Blue-White has too many ways to kill it. And of course, if they even though the Gale Drifter comes back from the dead, I, if they want to like bury a 3-2 flyer in play to bring back a 2-2 flyer for their fifth turn, I'm cool with that. 
This is not a race I'm currently winning. So we're going to attack. They probably won't block. And then just play our dragon. If I could, like, double spell, I might have sandbagged the dragon. Like, if this Sanctifier was another 2-2, I might play the 2-2 drops instead of the 1-4 drop. But I'm not going to use one less mana and play a card that doesn't impact the board here. There are a decent amount of X1s. I, I'm happy to include a Neonate's Rush or two in my deck. I wouldn't want to play a ton of that card. But um, I think more often than not, when you the first one you draw per game will we'll trade down one mana or even on mana or up or down two mana. So let's say on average, down like half to one mana and up a card. And that's a good deal. If you could, in the middle of a game of Magic, just have an option to push, like, spend one mana, like, draw a card, you would win the game. Like, if you were, like, forced to do it every game on, like, turn four, you would win more often than you would lose. I think that's a good exchange. Okay, obviously we want this on top. But I'm not sure if I'm going to replay it or not, because I do have the 4-3 haste and the ability to double spell now, but I am falling even further behind. So I might have to just replay the dragon. So if I... Play the dragon and attack. I take like seven if they have something. Go to three. If I draw an answer to the three, two, I'm not dead the following turn. But I'm in pretty rough shape anyway if they can answer the, the regent. Let's say they can't answer the regent. Am I worried about an alpha? No, I eat the gale drifter or the uh, I eat the patrician geist probably and take five. That seems fine. So I think I'm dead if they have a bouncer removal for this regent. And I think I'm fine if they don't. And I, all I can do is make them have it, probably. I don't think holding back the Harrier to trade with the zombie token is really doing much for me. Thanks, Shark and Bake. Which one is Blessed Defiance? I don't know anything about that, Tails. It hasn't happened to me. I'll, I'll check if my opponents play some weird cards. This opponent's got a 26-card deck. So we know the opponent has spells, because they just went draw two, discard two, and chose to discard a three one. Past that, we don't know what they have. Okay, so... I do want to try and end this game qu as quick as I can... If I trade with either Flyer, I'm fine with that. But this card's going to flash back at minimum. So they're effectively at like 17. I don't know how I can win this race. I don't even know if it's possible. I can play like the 4-3 and attack for 10. Well, then if they hit me back... So then they're at 7, assuming they gain 2. If they hit me back for 7... Probably, I can make anything unable to block, so they really can't do that. So that actually, I might, that might work. So I do have the option to get aggressive. Of course, they, we know they have spells in hand. They just drew two, discarded two, and discarded a 3-1 flash. So they probably have something they can play, like a counter or a removal. So I don't necessarily want to play one big spell as opposed to two cheap ones. So I think what I'm going to do is start by playing um, some of the cheaper spells. See if they get countered. Obviously, I don't want to discard my hand. Okay, so it doesn't seem like it's a counter unless they're holding it for some, like a removal or something better than that. Uh, sorry about the arms. It's just the Florida summer and I happen to wear like a sleeveless shirt today. I'm not like trying to show off my new buff arms from working out. Um, okay. So what are we doing? feel like sending the Moonville region's pretty risky. Even the Harrier, like, I, I don't know. Like I would gladly trade it for a flyer if they blocked. What could they flash in? Like Nebelgeist minus two minus one. They could also just have the blue instant that gives minus two minus so and draws a card. I think I'm just not going to enter combat at all. So I did something there that I didn't explain fully. I played my creatures pre-combat. The reason for that was if they tap their mount at a counter one, then they can't play a trick in combat, which means I can attack with the Lamholt Harrier and the Regent much safer, right? So like by leaving their mana up, 
I, I play things pre-combat and then find out whether they have a trick or not. Since they let those resolve, presumably they have like a combat trick, not a counter spell. If they counter those, now their mana's tapped, now I can go ahead and attack. So that's why I chose to play things pre-combat there instead of post-combat. And that's when you generally want to do so. When you're looking for information as to what to do in combat based on what happens with the spells you're casting. That's when you choose to do it pre-combat to get that information so that you can make better decisions regarding combat. So that's problematic. They just played a 4-5 or five flyer. I can make it unable to block, so I can still attack this turn. And I think I'm going to have to, or I'm going to end up losing in the air to that. They only have 9 in the air. It might be a good time to get really aggressive. What if I make the 4-5 or five unable to block, and I send, like, everything but the regent? They could trade off with the Harrier, so I won't be able to make it unable to block again. I could even send straight up everything. They have two blockers. They're both. If they want to kill the Regent, they have to double block it. If they want to kill the Harrier, they're trading a Flyer for it. Is there any chance I'm going to die? Four, seven, so they two, five, nine, eleven. So they don't have to block, and they could swing back with everything. So if they have a removal, they could win that way then. I mean, I can't attack with anything unless I make the Soul Guide unable to block, so I pretty much have to do that. The question is, what do I want to attack with? I definitely want to send, like, this 3-2. It would be a good trade for their Flyers. The only things that can block it, this Candle Grove Witch, same deal. The question is, do I want to offer Harrier for their Flyers, and do I want to uh, attack with Regent? I think next turn, I have, like, the 4-3 Haste Alpha potentially... No, I think the Harrier's ability is too good. I'm just going to send the two creatures the that aren't the Regent, which is stopping their Flyers from attacking back, and the Harrier, whose ability is really important, I think. So I'm just going to send the two that I'd be happy to trade for their Flyers or get in damage with. I mean, I wouldn't really call Regent 3 for wanting if they double-blocked it, given the two damage would hit like a zombie token, but... I would be happy with with Moonveil Regent for their two flyers. My concern is more them taking the Regent hit and then attacking me back with their little flyers. Yeah, the zombie token could be killed by Regent, but that's hardly a card. It, uh, it barely has an effect on the game. If I have a three toughness creature back, then it can't attack profitably. They don't have a sack outlet out, and it can't block. So it's not exactly having much of an effect on the game at the moment. Now, I might lose this game to these Flyers. That's entirely likely. But I'm just saying it's not really the uh, it's not really the zombie token that's concerning me. I'll probably end up having to block the Soul, Soul Guide Griff next turn and then just finish it off with the Regent's ability. The reason I didn't do that this turn is because it would just open the door for the other little Flyers to keep attacking. Plus, I might be able to deal them lethal with it if I draw the right cards. Well, speaking of drawing the right cards, so they left two mana up again. I don't know exactly what they have. I definitely believe they have something. Um, I know they can, like, fl flash this back. Um, other than that, so they're at 15, effectively. They probably have, like, minus two, minus O, which is also basically effectively at 15. So the question is, can we get 15 through counting this Lunar Frenzy for six? So the Frenzy... If we attack with everything and we don't spend any mana, they have two blockers. Let's say they block, like, two of the two twos. Six, that's not, that's not going to be 15, right? Six and six is 12. So we're not going to, we're probably not going to lethal them this turn. Yeah, I think we're just dead to the bounce anyway, so we can ignore that. Because if they bounce the regent, they just kill us with their flyers, right? But we're not dead on board. Like, I mean, we can block a flyer and take five, like, and then win next turn. So I think we want to just um, do whatever damage we can, hope they can't kill us, and then have lethal next turn, right? Which is not much, I guess, if we're only attacking with the village watch here, but I don't know what else we can realistically do this turn. 
I can't really send two twos into the three three without making unable to block. I can't lethal them this turn. Yeah, it gives trample, but it still wouldn't be enough damage. Like if they block a two two with a three three and I pump that one with the frenzy, that's less damage than if I pump an unblocked one because I have to overcome the extra toughness. Now, don't get me wrong, it kills the creature, so it could be better for that reason, but it's not more total damage. So, I mean, we're dead if they have, like, a bounce or something for the Regent. If not, we have a reasonable chance to close next turn now, I think. With all the mana for the Frenzy and the extra 4-3 in play. We'll just have to see what they have. Oh, wow. You know, I might be bad. Uh, I was thinking it wasn't worth blocking the Griff last turn to finish it off. I missed a line. I could have just blocked the Griff and then dealt two to the Patrician Geist, and then that would kill the Griff uh, when it shrunk. Now, all of that said, they've been leaving up Trick Mana. They own, they have something. I don't know exactly if it's the minus two, minus O oh draw card. That would be my guess. There's a, there's a trick. It's one blue and a colorless, minus two, minus O, oh, make a zombie draw card. That's my guess as to the trick that's in their hand. But uh, they, I don't know for sure what they have, but I'm pretty sure they have something. I don't think they just keep leaving up this mana and not countering anything in a tight game as like a bluff or something like that. They could clearly have spent their mana. So I don't know what they have, but I do predict they have something. And I think it's the minus two minus O oh, draw a card, but there's probably other things it could be. This is day five of the format. So anyways, though, if they make this attack, we don't have to think because it's blocked the four, five or die. So no decision there. If they let it die, we have to decide whether to hit the 2-2 to try and kill both flyers or hit them to try and lethal them. I think it's hit them because how do we win if they survive another turn? Even if this works, they still have one flyer we have to draw removal to. Whereas there's a good chance we can deal them nine with this Lunar Frenzy. So I think I just deal them the two here. Yeah, I don't think they have a bounce or they would have used it. I think they have the minus two minus O, but if not, it's something else like, you know, a white card that does three to an attacker or something of that nature. It, they basically can't have a counter or a bounce. They would have used those. I mean, don't get me wrong. They could have drawn it this turn or maybe at the end of last turn off the flashback on the that white blue card drawing spell, um, Faithful Mending. But uh, they, that's not what they had two turns ago. And they still have whatever they had two turns ago unless it was a bluff. So my guess is minus two minus O still. You see, like, they chose not to bring this uh, Whale Drifter in play here, right, from their graveyard. So they're leaving all this mana up to cast something. We don't necessarily know what, but they definitely have something. So our choices are we can make their creature unable to block and attack with everything, or we can just attack with everything, let them block, and then play our Lunar Frenzy. Those are our only choices. It's now kill them or we die. So, which way gives us a higher chance to win? If it's the minus two minus O, if we make this unable to block, we have lethal either with the Lunar Frenzy, then they can make it eight, not nine, then we can still pump for like two. If uh, we attack with everything, we let them block, and they have minus two minus O, clearly the Frenzy is more damage, right? Not much more, I guess, but a little more damage. Yeah, I mean, we're going to go for lethal, there's no question. The, the question at the moment is do we want to activate the Landhold Terrier or pump or spend an extra four mana on the Lunar Frenzy? Which one plays around more things is the question is the question of the moment. And I, I don't know the answer. Um, again, relatively new format. If it's Revenge of the Drown, it's better for me to use the Harrier, right? Because then I make this unable to block. Then they put the Village Watch back. No, then I can only plus two. Then I'm a point short. If it's Revenge of the Drown, I pretty much lose either way. Because I have to go for the Frenzy. Yeah, I don't think we can realistically beat Revenge either way. We're one point short. Yeah, I agree. It might not be minus two, minus oh anymore. It might be Revenge of the Drown. I mean, they might just have nothing, but then we win no matter what. 
I'm going to let them block. I don't know what they have, but I think if they have like a bounce like or something like that, we just lose. That makes sense. That's minus two minus oh. It's just the uncommon version. Okay, so that makes sense. So now we should be able to win with Frenzy, I think. Since we, it's good we didn't use the Harrier. If we used the Harrier, we would have lost. Well, assuming I didn't just rope out and it still lets me play the Frenzy, but I'll try and grab it as soon as they block. Because it does give Trample, so I think on the 4-3, this should be lethal. Got him with Exaxes. But yeah, like I said, it was minus 2, minus 0. It just happened to be the uncommon one, Nebelgeist Intruder. Not the common one that I kept naming. Thank you, Desi. Appreciate the subscription. Science always wins. That's a big part of why I started recommending your stream to everybody, Deathsea, because you're very good about, like, these are the possible options that are available at this time. This is why I'm going to play around this one, but not these two. And that's one of the biggest skills that comes up in limited turn by turn. Playing around what you can, no more, no less. Now, that game, unlike the first game, Frenzy did produce a lot of value. It was a tight game. I don't know which cards would have won and lost me that game, but Frenzy clearly increased our win percentage there. It played a significant role in us winning the game. It's really hard to quantify and evaluate, and I won't claim to have any precise answers. As usual, I mostly try and point you in the right direction as to how to think about things, as opposed to, like, this is what's best and I'm sure, because... If it's something that I'm 100% sure about, you probably already know it because magic's so hard to assess. All we can really do is make our best guesses and think, hopefully think about things correctly. Uh, I don't have an exact amount of drafts in mind, Francius, but this is my first and I will probably do at least a second. Okay, so we can't attack into that, but we can play our better two drop. I don't know if we're going to have the ability to turn that Coven on anytime soon, so maybe it makes more sense to play the Harrier to force a trade. Although the Harrier is probably better in the late game anyway. My normal rule for two drops, if you haven't heard it, is like if you have two, two that are both like two twos like this, whichever one is going to be better in the late, late game is the one I don't play. Because assuming you curve out the rest of the way, that one will still be in like your hand, the, the, the one you don't play coming into the late game. Okay, I'm going to play the Vampire and not attack, the reason for this particular line. I don't want to trade with the 2-1 because it's my Neonate's Rush target, and given I'm sitting here missing land drops, I really want to cast Neonate's Rush if I don't draw land next turn to help me find land drops. So, just got to chill for a turn. I don't really think of it that way, Jordan. Um, I think blue-black is a good deck for sure. Probably if you had to force one deck on sat two days ago, blue-black was the correct answer to that. But what? how much are other people taking the blue and black cards above the white, red, and green cards? Like, by now. How much will they be tomorrow? How much will they be next week? Like, I, the, it's not like construct. I mean, constructed. There's meta game too, obviously. I mean, more if anything. But basically, like draft finds a balance, and like I don't think thinking of like this is the best deck, this is the second best deck is super useful. I mean, it's relevant. You want to know how strong the different archetypes are. But what really matters, in my opinion, is knowing how to draft like all the good archetypes, like all the ways the cards can work together to produce a good amount of value. Um, 
Okay, so here I still didn't find land three. I, I want a Neonate's Rush pretty bad, like I said, so I'm going to hit that 2-1. This is actually bad. It even turns on their Coven with this uh, Dual Craft Trainer, but it's still the right play because, I mean, I need to find lands. Like, <laughs> if I draw a card right now and I find a land, I can play it. And if I don't play a land, I'm going to lose pretty soon no matter what. But I definitely think blue-black is very good, uh, a totally legitimate strategy, and if it's being underdrafted, you should be looking for it to give at least somewhat of a concise answer and not be off in the clouds, as I usually am. Um, okay, so do we have any attacks? Only with Coven. So it looks like we can't turn that on, so we still don't have land three here on turn five, so no options really, just cast things and pass the turn. Thanks, Dangle. Yeah, somebody mentioned that. I just forgot to do it. All right, so 2-2 two, two for 3-2 is a positive trade. Our, which of our creatures do we want to trade off? Probably the 2-1 pinger. We don't have a Neonate's Rush in hand. I guess we have one more in our deck. Be pretty bad if we drew that and we blocked with it, but it's still a 1 in 27. Uh, we're never activating the Harrier anytime soon. Is the one toughness a big downgrade? Not really. Yeah, I'll just trade with the... I'll just block it with the Harrier, I think. Actually, you know what? They could have minus two, minus O, like the one I kept talking about last game, or like plus two, plus two. Oh, it's double strike. What am I saying? Yeah, it's double strike. Sorry. No trade. Um, so what do we want to do? Take that much or chump block with, with the veteran? I think we probably take one hit from it before starting to block it. I guess we could also double block it to save the six and trade two of our two twos off, which is a pretty bad deal, but is it worth it? And I think we would probably want to wait one turn on that stuff. And even the, with the veteran chumping or something, we're going to gain one more life if we wait one more turn because we already have creatures to play. So I think we should at least wait one turn. Okay. So no real choices here. Can't attack on the ground because of the first striker. Can attack with the flyer because it won't have flying on their turn anyway, so it's not a particularly important or useful blocker. So like I said, now I think we probably do need to block. Even though we're still at 16, like we're taking four down to 12. So if we take another six, we're already at six life. It's pretty threatening. So I think we, we want to block. And then the question is double block or single block. And I don't think we're day nighting. I think double block makes more sense. Just get a trade. They first strike out one, we get a trade. We two for one ourselves, of course, but we kind of have to do that to gain the six life. So if you assume one of those creatures for their 3-2 was basically even, it's would you sack the other one to gain six? And the answer to that at this point is yes. Are we going to win? The answer to that at this point is probably no, but remember, we missed a bunch of land drops. It is what it is. Let's see if our uh, flying dragon can bail us out. Can we still afford to attack with the 2-2 flying on our turn, not flying on theirs, and isn't blocking anything? No, and they can tap things with their scab wrangler they just played. We are pretty much dead. Uh, Yeah, I like common duels, but they have really heavy diminishing returns for me, Datsy, because... The first time you, the first tap lane you draw per game, if it's in your, you know, you can just play turn one, it's usually not much of a cost, although it's become a much higher cost now that they're making good one drops for limited, which I think is a very good thing for the record. It creates uh, more tension in your curve. Um, but uh, 
So my, my default was to generally play like one to two because you very rarely draw two of two of something. But once you have three of a card, you do see two of it a decent amount of the time. So like I would usually in a two color deck be trying to get like, it varies format to format, of course, depending on how valuable the extra colored mana sources are and all of that. But my, my default setting would normally be to play duels that do like come in to play tap tap to add a red or white no other ability my default setting on that land would normally be to play it if it's getting me my ninth red or white and not to play it if it's getting me my 10th red or white and to play it if it's like my first one or two tap lands but probably not if it's my third plus you know like if you're a 16 land aggro deck i might play like seven seven two as far as that kind of a duel but if i had a third i probably wouldn't play it if I'm a 17 land aggro deck, I might play 881 to get to 99, and I probably wouldn't even play the second. That would roughly be my default, but obviously it varies a lot. What do you usually do? Okay, so what can we do? We can't kill the Wrangler. They're going to tap things end a turn. This game is over. This is a waste of everybody's time. Mine, yours, Elfendor's. This is just a waste of everybody involves time. Miss land drops for five turns, and they played infinite stuff. It's time to go to the next. Yes, this applies to Evolving Wilds as well. Um, like, if you don't have any synergies, being able to tap to add a red or white is probably better than the, the value of the thin out, having to choose between red or white. Obviously, you're always going to have, like, a red and a white because you're going to sack to go get whichever one you're missing. But if it sits in play and taps to add a red or a white, it can provide double red and double white for two different cards. Uh, if you have Evolving Wilds synergies, like, you know cards like like a delve or escape or whatever then evolving wilds is going to be way better than like a dual land that just stays in play and taps to add both colors but by and large they're not that different and sy other synergies aside you could start with that guideline i would say that there's generally a lot more value in getting to the ninth of a source than a tenth in most formats so like it's there's no magic number I, you basically get less and less value as you get more and more of a source because you probably already have one you probably already have two so like when you put the 15th white source into a deck that helps it less than when you put in the 14th which helps it less than when you put in the 13th so and and it works the uh, the opposite and also the diminishing return like the punishing value of the tap lands works the same way in that like if you draw one per game you usually play it on turn one or like on turn four when you happen to have a three drop and not a four drop and it costs you very little but if you have two two different tap lands in your opening hand you might have to miss a spot on your curve and not cast something in order to get a tap land in play so there, so I generally want to keep my tap lands to a minimum. Uh, and I usually don't want to play extra tap lands to get to a 10th source. But those aren't hard rules. Those are guidelines to start thinking from. Thank you, Asker5. Appreciate the subscription. So do we candle trap this? What's its ability? Whenever a creature in control dies, put a counter on it. So yeah, we don't really care if it sits in play, so we can candle trap it. Since we're not going to be paying the Coven and removing it anytime soon, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a creature with an activated ability. Like, you don't want a Candle Trap if you're not going to exile the creature, something that, like, draws a card whenever a creature dies, because it's just going to sit around drawing them cards. Okay, no real decisions. If they trade, cool. If not, cool. And then we're going to play the Search Party Captain, hopefully find land three. Do we trade a 2-2 for a 2-1 here? Seems fine. If they're attacking, they might have like a 2-3 blocker or something that prevents it. If I draw land, I have the Silversmith to reactivate it. But I think this game going longer probably favors me, given I have a handful of spells, including like this, which can rummage away lands, the Astronomer, the Sanctifiers can help get lands off the top of my deck. So I think by and large, that's a good block in this spot. We just want to like not take damage, make trades, and get a chance to play all our cards. Thanks, Travided. Okay, so land four looks good. Not a particularly effective turn to put out the uh, Silversmith. Pump that, and then attack. It just gets blocked by the Slaughter Specialist. So we'll just go ahead and get the Outrider out. This way, if they kill things off after we pump them or whenever, we'll get our counters. 
There's a disturb on this too. Looks good. Yeah, I didn't think that attack meant anything special. The question was, did we want to trade a 2-2 for a 2-1 pinger that was attacking us? Because that's about an even trade. And so if we think we're going to like take the 2 and attack back for damage, then we probably don't. If we think there, uh, our 2-2 two -two won't attack or block profitably, we probably do. And if we really want the 2, if we think the 2 life has value for us, like the longer the game goes, the better, then we definitely do. And that's what I settled on because these Sanctifiers can really help get rid of lands from the top of our deck. And then even if we draw one, the Astronomer can help us discard it. And they're a red-black deck, which is pretty aggressive in this format. So I feel like it, the longer this game goes, probably the better for us. So they left their mana up. Oh, well, if we attack and they don't have anything, they'll just block with Slaughter Specialist anyway. So this doesn't look like a particularly good turn to attack. We can just double spell, put out our stuff. Seems pretty straightforward. I'm generally fairly cautious when somebody has this many cards in hand and leaves mana up because, like, they clearly have stuff. But also last turn, like, with the uh, candle-lighted blocker here, like, we just didn't really have any prospects. So even though it's my best creature, I'm pumping the Astronomer because right now it can't attack past the Ambusher, whereas with a plus one, plus one counter, it can. When I do eventually remove the Slaughter Specialist. Um, so I think this turn we, we want a Silversmith probably. Just pump what? Like, we want to go for Coven if we can. Maybe. I guess it doesn't matter much. It'll let us get rid of the Slaughter Specialist and start attacking on the ground better. I definitely want to pump the Phantom because it has flying. The question is, where does the other counter go? Probably not the Astronomer. It's already our best creature. think making a 1-1 into a 2-2 has more value, but it does shut off Coven, potentially. Eh, we'll Coven when we Coven. We have a ton to do in the meantime. So what did they actually play? Target creature is pursued this one. If it's your turn, it gains trample. Otherwise, first strike. Okay. So they were able to kill my astronomer. Cool. That's cool. They're going to draw more cards. Okay, so... I can attack with everything. If they go for a double block, I get a real blowout with the Neonate's Rush. But if they put the 2-1 on the 2-2... Two -two, I then can't Neonates rush their one toughness creature, which I want to do pretty badly. So it seems like just doing that and attacking with every with everything makes the most sense, right? If we trade our 2-2 token for their 2-2 ground creature, that's good for us. We even gain a life. If we don't, uh, then we get into extra damage. So it's good for us either way. I don't really care about the foul play. Like, it's a good card, but I mean, I'm not, like, interested in saving any of my creatures with, like, Lunar Frenzy. I really wish Watsi would step up their arena game. Like, arena's the future. It's a wonderful program. Magic's a great game. Like, I don't know what's up with all these bugs and errors. Like, I've got no explanation. I'm not a tech guy. Thanks, Died to Gravity. Appreciate the subscription. Gravity's a really strong force, so don't take it personally. I don't think there's much that could overcome it. Yeah, I think I hit Mythic sometime over the weekend when I was playing, for whoever asked that. Sammy G. <laughs> that makes me feel better, Debo4. Okay, so we can't turn on Coven at all this turn. We still want our Dualcraft Trainer out. So I'm probably just going to attack and cast that since we can't double spell anyway. And we're one land away from double sanctifier or things like that. Nova Asterix. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I always assume it's expensive. The thing is, like, this is Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro, not like a startup. You know, like, 
if like some game like Flesh and Blood was like, here, we have a digital version. It's very primitive. We're a startup. We're going to improve it a lot slowly as we make money and develop and expand our customer base. I'd be like, yeah, that makes total sense, right? But is like Wizards and Hasbro really lacking for the funds? Like no matter what it costs, like if they have to spend another $10 million to make Arena work properly, you spend that, right? It's like your flagship product at this point. But I digress. Oh yeah, I never blame the programmers. I always, I yeah, I blame management, not the programmers, 100%. I assume they're not hiring enough people or good enough people or combinations of people or giving them enough resources or whatever. I always assume it's allocation of funds. Like I said, I don't understand programming well enough to speak about it like as assertively as I would like magic, but I always assume that anything can basically be fixed or done at this point regarding gaming, that it's just, if it's not working properly, it's because they're not allocating enough resources to it. That's just like, that's my default assumption that it's management's fault, not the programmer's fault. Even if the programmers aren't the world's best, WotC chose to hire them. Like some programmers are qualified for one job, some another. Your job is to figure out whether the programmers have the skills to do the job you want or whatever. So pretty much no matter what, I would always blame management in that situation. Um, okay, so do we just attack with everything? Do we have any other options? We can't turn on Coven, all we have are two and three drop creatures right now, unless we Lunar Frenzy pre-combat. If they were tapped out, there's probably a lethal there with Trample and Double Strike. I don't think I'm going to go for that from this good of a position when they have two mana up, and I can literally just double spell dropping two more creatures to the board, though. So the question is, do we want to attack at all? I think the answer is yes. I don't mind Neonates rushing the 4-3 away. They can't kill the Dualcraft Trainer since it has First Strike. So I think the answer is just attack out and let them do whatever they're going to do here. I think they're probably dead if I Lunar Frenzied one of the twos and it resolved. And then I went to combat and gave it double strike with the trainer. But again, if they had like a two mana removal spell, I could potentially lose a game where I'm a massive favorite and winning from basically all angles. So that's the kind of line I might take if like the situation was reversed. Like if they had five cards in hand and I had two and they had more life than me and they had a little bit better of a board, but I could sneak in lethal if they had nothing, I might go for it. But in this case where I have five cards there too, and a better board, and I'm up 12 life, I'll just double spell and play more things and not take such a risky line. The best way I ever hear that concept described is play to win until you're winning, then play to not lose. The further behind you are, the more you need to do, be willing, the more risk you need to be willing to take. The further ahead you are, the less risk you want to take. Okay, so they chose not to block with the 4-3, so just going to cast stuff. Right, maybe they weren't even dead because of the 7 toughness blocker, but either way. Maybe they would have had to block it with all three of these or something. Like, you know, 2-2 two, two on 2-2 two, two and double block the two th this 2-3 two, with the 7 power or whatever. They might have to block this with the 4-3 and the 7-7 seven, seven to stay alive, and I first strike out the 4-3. Like, whatever. But the point is basically not whether it was Xaxes or not. The point was it's not even worth risking, like, while their mana's untapped. Well, so we found out what they were holding. They couldn't play that when I had the first striker untapped, but we're at twenty-one, so we don't need it. We don't need to block. It's not particularly scary. They do go back to eleven, so we do have to figure out what we're going to do again. Um, so now I can make things unable to block. Again, they're down to one card in hand now, so we could go for the frenzy, but I still am just in a massively favorable position, and we don't particularly want to take risks. Um. If I make the 4-3 unable to block and attack with everything, super duper safe, but I don't have enough mana to even cast something post-combat, what if I just attack with everything? Then I can still finish the 4-3 off with the Neonate's Rush and play the Sanctifier post-combat. That looks pretty good. Like, I don't think we need any one of these cards. The only card I wouldn't really want to throw away would be the Dualcraft Trainer because that's power levels really leagues above everything else going on in play that I have. But that shouldn't die in this combat, unless they play the card in their hand. There's no blocks they can make where that dies. So I'm just going to let this happen. And then post-combat, I'll finish off the Village Watch with the Rush, play the Sanctifier. This line is good as long as they don't have a Sweeper. If they had a Sweeper, they would clearly have played it last turn. We have five creatures. So, I mean, they'd have to, like, top deck a Sweeper. Okay. 
All right, so let's finish off this nice werewolf with the uh, one damage. And I mean, if they cast something next turn, should be able to just attack for lethal, even if it involves playing the Frenzy. They can't be sandbagging a removal forever. They'd have to play it. They would have played it on the trainer. So next turn, if they cast something, then we can go for the win with Frenzy. If they don't cast something, then they might have drawn an instant or whatever, but we'll just attack out. Hey, sorry about the flood, uh, SRMJ. And uh, good game. Your deck looks sweet. Yeah, that's what I was mostly talking about, Nova Asterix. And I was saying, like, it's a totally powerful and reasonable play, but we were just up so much that I didn't feel like it was worth the risk. Obviously, the two turns ago, they could have had an instant in their hand, but then they didn't play one, so, like, it was unlikely they had it on the following turn. But it's just, we were just up so much, it just felt so unnecessary to me. Uh, no, just the deal one, S SRM. Uh, I had the Neonates Russian hand, but that was that was my trick. Oh, yeah, and I had Frenzy, yeah. Sorry, I talked about Frenzy like a thousand times. I wasn't going to play Frenzy while you had the open mana because of the risk of blowout. Whereas if you block with the 4-3, I can just bury my two power creature and then Neonates rush it post-combat. So that's what I was going to do. But I did have the card uh, Lunar Frenzy in my hand. Okay, so I'll happily trade my creature for either of theirs, so I'm probably going to attack. It also attacks for three and only saves two as a blocker. If they take it or block, either way, it's just uh, select a Sanctifier here post-combat. Now, do I want to trade the Sanctifier for either of theirs? Probably not. I'm on the play. I think I can win this race. Wait, are they on the play? How do they have an extra creature out? Never mind. They're on the play. They just missed a land drop, I guess. They also have one card in hand. Did they just mulligan to four or something when I wasn't looking? What's going on right now? I was reading the chat at the start of the game and got a little lost. One, two, four, seven cards. And it's presumably their fourth turn, turn two, turn three, turn four. So if you start with seven and draw three, that's 10. So they mulligan three times. Yeah, they mulligan to four. Okay, well, I didn't know that, but good beats. I think I'm still happy to just race. I think it's a race we win. With the Lunark Veteran giving us life, and even though they're attacking first, like, we're already dealing more than we're taking, and we're gaining life. Plus, I could always chump with the Veteran at some point if I want to. So, I'm not going to make a trade down here. Sanctifier can even attack into the Embodiment of Flame. Okay, well, I know that can come back. I don't want them to be able to block with it. Can't attack with the one toughness stuff anyway. So just go ahead and get rid of that, see what we get. Now, no real choices. I'm cool with this trade. It helps clear the way for my small creatures. If they take it, great. If they block, great. And then post-combat, land harrier, of course. This is a, that would be like the most aggressive attack of all time. <laughs> when they started to attack the Harrier, I was like, wow, they already fell behind on board and they're still attacking with the Harrier? Okay, so, um, Gavany Silversmith here. We don't want to attack with the one ones unless we pump them, probably. I guess the Veteran for a Phantom would be a, a fine trade, but obviously the Harrier can block the Veteran. Maybe, I don't want to trade the Perforator for the Phantom, but I would trade it for the Harrier. Yeah, it seems like just Silversmith up the Veteran and the Perforator attack with everything. It lets them trade away the Harrier, which I don't love, though. Because I have 7 mana and not much to do with it, and I'm way ahead on life totals after this attack. So the Harrier sitting in play has a lot of value right now. I know in previous games you've seen me trade off the Harrier pretty willy-nilly, but the thing is, I usually had a bunch of spells in hand and ways to get other cards. I'm, if I draw lands over the next couple turns, I'm not going to have much to do with my mana besides sink it into the Harrier. And I'm way up on life. So I really don't want to trade off the Harrier, to be honest. So I'm not 100% what to do. I think I might Silversmith the Veteran and the Perforator and attack with both of those and just not send the Harrier. I shouldn't have played a land because this tells them I can bring back the Veteran immediately, but whatever. 
I'm pretty sure if they're going to block here, it's going to be uh, the Perforator, not the Veteran anyway. They'll probably put Harrier on Perforator. So, I mean, I made like a somewhat conservative play here, not sending the Harrier for potentially free damage. But I think I really want that Harrier. If they play like bigger creatures, its activated ability is going to give me attacks when they might have been able to blank my board and stalemate the game without the Harrier in play. And I do not believe they're going to win this race. Okay, so now I can Silversmith just to have more out before I start Harriering, or I can Harrier. If I Harrier, I get a profitable attack with the Veteran and the Silversmith, because if I trade for their Phantom and then bring back my own Phantom, that's that's a good trade. If I don't uh, Harrier, I have no attack. So do I want to Harrier? Yeah, I think I do, because I'm one land away from playing Silversmith and using Harrier, and... I'm not really, like, in a rush to empty, like, my hand, get, like, a little bit more power on the board. That doesn't really accomplish anything if I'm not attacking them at this point. Like, I'm firmly on the aggressive. It's the same reason I didn't send the Harrier the previous turn, is because I felt like that activated ability could be game-winning if I flood a little. If I draw all spells from here, I'm going to win no matter what, basically. But if I do draw lands, I kind of want the ability to make things unable to block. I don't know if that means they're going to play the Sweeper or something, but... I don't need the three life, so I'll take it and see what happens. Um, all right, so what do they have? They attack, they pass the turn. I guess their logic is I can make it unable to block anyway. So, all right, I don't see how I don't play this for the partial haste. I'm just going to spread out my resources. I mean, there's like a rare white sweeper. They probably don't have that. Well, the Flash 3 one, they have to have drawn that turn or it would already have been in play. Um, also, like, it actually makes them less likely to attack, not more. Because if my, if they attack, then when I attack with everything, they bring in the Flash 3 one, I can pay 4 and make it unable to block. If I pay 4 and make uh, the their silver, their, their uh, Gavany Silversmith unable to block, then when I attack, they can Flash in the 3-1 and trade it for the Wolf and then turn off my ability to make things unable to block. So the three ones should make them not want to attack. It shouldn't make them attack. Hey, we finally drew the best card in our deck, Angel Fire Ignition. So Falcon with Pit Fighter, one mana, two one, and then it has this ability, two mana, discard a card, sacrifice a vampire, which could even be it, right? It's a vampire. Draw two cards. That's a pretty powerful card. A 1-mana 2-1, then in the late game, you can discard a land and sack it to get two new cards. I, might just, I, I would want this trade normally. I think I don't because I want to play Search Party Captain, so I have to attack in order to lessen its cost by one. But if I had it, like, you know, if I didn't have Search Party Captain in hand specifically, I would have blocked there. I don't choose my opponents, it's just whoever uh, they throw in front of me, Merrick. So now I probably do want this trade. I think their creature's a little better than mine. I see no reason to leave these two in play. Maybe a target for Angel Fire, but I still have another one. And hopefully I'll draw more creatures or I'm probably not going to win anyway. Well, you're not that incentivized to use Angel Fire when they're tapped out, right? If anything, you're more incentivized to use it when they have a blocker because if you use it when they're tapped out, you're gaining the life no matter what, whether the creatures trade or hit them. So the tramples are relevant. I mean, the Vigilance, if you want the blocker, the Indestructibles are relevant. Like the best time to use Angel Fire, aside from, you know, killing them or something, which is obviously always the best, is when they have like a 4-4 and you have a 3-3, so you can't attack profitably without playing it, right? You'd normally rather play creatures before your Angel Fire ignitions. Um, that said, right now, there's nothing like with Flash, so you no reason to do really much of anything. I mean, I'd love for the Sanctifier to flip. Um, I mean, not flip, but, you know, trigger. Uh, but whatever. I need to just draw spells, basically. So you see how last turn, if I had used the Angel Fire, like, it was just dealing two extra damage. Now I can use it to get in. 
I'm probably not going to because I drew the Outrider, but if I hadn't drawn the Outrider, it would be a better play this turn. This is a coward stream. But, I mean, really, it's not about, uh, like, I'd, obviously, to be clear to anybody listening, it's a joke, but really, it's not even about that. It's about value, capturing value, in the sense that you get more value off Angel Fire Ignition if it lets a creature attack when they wouldn't have had a profitable attack otherwise than if you used it when the creature already had a profitable attack. That's not to say you should never use it when a creature already has a profitable attack, because some games your creatures will always be able to profitably attack. But that you don't capture the most value by using it when they're tapped out, necessarily. You do get the counters for, long, for a longer term, and the longer you have the counters, the more value you get. But it's such a powerful card, at whatever point you get that, it's going to be awesome. So speaking of which, now we have nothing else to do. We don't have a profitable attack otherwise. Seems like it's time to use our card. I think pretty clearly we just use it on both, right? Spread our resources around. Thank you, Slith94. Appreciate the subscription. Um, I don't, yeah, uh, so, uh, thanks, uh, I mean, I'm not officially back or not back, I mean, I was never officially gone, but, but I do appreciate, like, you know, I, I, a lot of people seem to be enthusiastic when I make magic content, and I do really appreciate that. It is one of the main things that drives me to do it, like, obviously, compensation matters, but has never been my primary reason for pursuing magic, never ever did I imagine it was going to be my most lucrative activity, so, you know, the desire to share my thoughts with you and uh, the fact that you all seem interested in them is, like, my pro biggest motivation in the game. It's not even close. But, anyways, that said, um, as far as thoughts on this format, I think life total matters more than it does usually by a lot. I think it's a... It's an aggressive format, not in the sense that you can't block, but in the sense that, like... Basically, a lot more games are won and lost while people still have cards in hand because of all the zombie tokens that fly around dealing two. It feels to me like the effective starting life total in this format is around 16 and not around 20 because of all the decay. That's not to say you can't win with control strategies, defensive strategies. There's plenty of good blockers. There's plenty of cheap removal. I'm not saying the format isn't balanced. I'm just saying I, my biggest takeaway so far is I would view this format as though you're starting life total 16 and draft and play like accordingly, at, like, you know, until it's not. Obviously, your life total is literally, tw if your life total is literally 20 on turn five and they don't have any decay tokens out or whatever, you're at 20 at that point. But I would go into games expecting that I'm going to take like two to four damage over the early turns that I basically can't stop by any profitable means. Okay, so I'm going to pass the turn, use its ability as we go tonight, I guess. I don't really want to attack and get double blocked. So I want both of those. I have to put one in the graveyard, then it's going to be the search party captain. If I could choose, I would put neither in the graveyard since I can cast the captain and then just play the regent off drawing it. So unfortunately, the sanctifier's ability, since I already drew all the lands in my deck, is not working out profitably at this point. Um, but I do think I have to put one in, so I'm going to bury the captain. But basically what I'm saying is plan your curve... Plan the amount of card advantage that's going to be in your deck. You know, plan your ability to interact along the lines as if you started a game with 16 life instead of 20. Like, just, like, envision it that way as you're, like, planning your deck's curve and stuff like that. And your ability to interact. I'm not saying that you need to be hyper aggro or that means, like, you know, aggro is the best or anything like that. Okay, so I'm going to play the Regent. I'm just going to play the rush here because um, I get a new card using the Regent's ability. Discard my hand, draw one. Yes, please. And then I get another one. This time I'll decline since I have another spell in hand. Not the worst. So they obviously have something. Um, do we want to block? If the life totals weren't so distorted, I almost certainly would, because when the region dies, I get to deal two and get a free kill on a Sanctifier. 
So if I block the Outrider and they play a trick, the Regent dies and pings the Sanctifier. That's a really good turn for me. That said, I have a million mana. I really want to draw extra cards when I cast my spells. And I have a huge life total advantage. So I think what I'll do is probably put the Candlegrove Witch. No, I don't want to block the Candlegrove Witch on the Sanctifier. Because then post-combat, if they have removal, I don't get the free kill. I think I'm just taking five here. Because if they have like a deal four for the Regent, something that destroys the Regent... I get to deal two and get a free kill on the Sanctifier right now. So I'm just going to take it and see what they have. Because if they have the removal, I'm happy I took it. Because then I get the deal two from the Regent when it dies. And if they don't have the removal, I'm happy they took it. Because then I can just kill them because of the life total like situation. All right, so let's start by playing this. Draw a new card. See what we get. Discard our hand. Draw a new one. Yes, please. Discard our hand. Draw a new one. Yes, please. Okay, it looks like the party ends there. Of course, this game should pretty much be over since we just spiked Coven and put them to one. You thought this was a dragon? I thought it was Experimental Frenzy. No, oh, somebody just said that in the chat. I promise I didn't even look. Yeah, great minds think alike, Silver MS. <laughs> Moonveil Frenzy. So again, I don't know how they can make this attack at one. Um, I mean, I don't think I can accidentally die. If they play a sweeper, they still die to the regent. Not really sure what the deal is. I guess this block with the astronomer. Oh, they can go to three. That's not going to help them. They're just going to be dead on board. I mean, there's a fine trade with the astronomer and the sanctifier. I'm no longer worried about them killing the regent and me getting that free two for one I talked about last turn because I'd rather just kill them since they're at one. I guess they pretty much have to have a sweeper now. I'm not going to block with a 3-3 double strike. Well, a sweeper, they still die to the region. I don't know. I feel like they're just dead. I mean, they have a lot of cards in hand, but I just don't know what they could possibly do. Oh, wait. The region checks on resolution, so they could play a sweeper, and they had one. Okay, good beats. So now I lose if they draw a land to play that... Uh, fire a card out of their graveyard. But if they don't have removal, I can attack with the perforator and get in the extra point, so that's good. Ha! <laughs> so they're going to play a second creature and gain one, so the perforator ping's no longer going to kill them. Pretty sick game. Do I have any ways to burn them out? I have one more Neonates Rush, which is lethal right now. Deal one, they take one, and then attack. Gavini, the, <laughs> still got it, y'all, still got it. Call by one outer. I don't, I don't know if it was the only card in my deck that could win this game, but it's definitely a good draw. <laughs> Gotta love it. What? What just happened? They don't take one. What does this thing do? Maybe I should have read their rare. If a spell would deal damage to you or another permanent, you should prevent the damage. Okay, whatever. Bad beat. It wasn't even necessarily wrong to cast it. What am I going to do? Hold it indefinitely, hoping a 2-3 flyer dies that I can't kill? But it did ruin my fun. I will acknowledge that. Okay, so I can make the 2-3 unable to block an attack. I get in the ping, and then they don't gain any more life. Again, if they draw the removal for the Harrier, they're going to win. I mean, it's not really rip lethal, right? Like, there's no way for me to, like, make them take the one. Like, I, I fully had no idea what Rem Carolus did, to be clear. I thought they were just dead. But even if I knew what Rem Carolus did, I would actually still just play it, right? Just to cycle it. How do I deal them the one? Anyways, I guess what I'm hoping for now is that they don't draw a land for the removal and then I can attack for lethal next turn. Like, again, I had no idea they weren't about to take the one and die, but... I would still, if I knew what the Rem Carolus did, I would still have just played the Neonates Rush there. Because what else am I going to do? Like, like this is always going to prevent the one until I kill it. I have, like, maybe one or two ways left in my deck to kill it, and it's a tight game. So I want to just cycle it and get to the next card. Uh, three, six, ten. I'm two lands off of uh, the three activations. If I don't have any ways to rummage the lands, though, I should play them. You're right. But if I do have ways to rummage them, then I might want to hold them. But it looks like my one or two ways to rummage are gone. So you are right. 
it doesn't protect itself. That's true. But if I deal at one, it's still, and that they still get the one to them prevented, right? So like, what is pinging it with Neonate's rush for one doing? Right, but this wouldn't die if I Neonates rushed it. So I don't understand what play y'all wanted me to make. Let's imagine you knew I knew exactly what Rem Carolus does. You want me to Neonates rush the Rem Carolus? They take zero and the Rem Carolus rush takes one, right? Oh, maybe I could have forced them to block with the two, three. Sure. Which is a slightly profitable trade. It's not like a huge deal, but it's a slightly profitable trade. Yeah, this was a good game. I can't believe I lost that sweeper. And then I thought I still had the win again, and then they, I didn't because of Rim Careless. That was that was uh that was good. Um But I don't think I punted at all. I mean, I think like I block even blocked one creature and took three when they played the sweeper, and then I think I would just cycle the Neonates Rush there. Maybe I would trade the Predator for the Rem Careless, but I still couldn't kill them. Like they wouldn't. Like, they wouldn't die when I ping this, right? So they would just trade with the perforator, they would go to one, and then that's all that would have happened. Oh, I don't know if I have outs from here. What can I draw? Um, I can draw Village Watch, but they have a blocker. Lunar Frenzy, so I can't throw away my only creature. Lunar Frenzy might be my one-outer if they don't have removal. Not a fake one-outer like the Neonates Rush, like I thought was a one-outer. But uh, I think if they don't have anything, then Lunar Frenzy for a million might be lethal, so. What was the line? Rush the Rem. So they stay at two. They don't take any damage, but the Rem takes a point. Then I make the, rem, the Veteran unable to block. attack. I don't understand how they're going. I can force them to trade the Rem. But unless it's they take one like later in the turn if the creature dies, they're not taking any damage. There's no way there's no line there that like kills them. It's I could have made the veteran unable to block, rush the rem, and attack, in which case they would finish at one and trade the rem for the perforator, which is not even like crystal clear that it's a good trade for me. It looks good because their creatures are rare, but if I lose my only creature, then I don't have a target for the uh whatchamacallit, the card I keep talking about, the lunar frenzy. So it's not even clear that that like is better it might be it might not be i'm not really sure but either way we're dead but yeah no i definitely thought they were dead and they were not because of their rares ability uh and i had no idea and i'm not pretending i knew because i didn't i just completely thought they were dead there and then learned they weren't uh upon the res resolution but i think i likely i mean i 100 percent i'm not going to just hold the neonates rush there they're going to gain life anyway um so the question is like, there's the other line. I'm going to cast it there and deal them nothing with it. So the question is just cycle it like I did and then pass the turn or pay for and make the 1-1 one, one unable to block and force them to trade the 2-3 flyer for my perforator. And that's, I think, a pretty close call because it's not a bad trade, but I do lose the creature that will lethal them if I draw the pump spell or just like a threatening attacker because I'm up so much in life that like now they don't have to hold blockers back for it. So I mean I think it's I think that's close because it's a profitable trade for sure. Yeah, I thought I won that game two different times. I literally thought they were dead when they played the sweeper, but it checks on resolution as well. The the dragon ping and I thought they were dead when I played the neo Nate's rush, but they had that 2-3 flyer out. Hall of Famer.
Yeah, so that's it. It's in, well, 48 hours and 40 minutes or so. Whatever time that is for you locally. This hand is rough. I think I'm going to keep, though. We're on the eight outer for the mountain. We've got three lands on the draw with four drops. Do I have any white two and three drops? Yeah, I have plenty. Most of my early drops, in fact, are white. So my good draws here are a mountain, because that lets me cast a red card on turn two, or white two drops. So I have eight mountains as a good draw, but also like Gavity Trapper, Lunark Veteran, Candle Grove Witch, three Celestis Sanctifiers. So I have a lot of white two and one, two, and three mana cards I can draw, or I can draw a mountain. So basically bad draws are planes and like, you know, red cards and good draws are white cards that cost three or less and mountains. I use on tap just to track my deck. Like when I'm sitting here looking through my deck, like telling my outs, I'm looking through the on tap thing. What did you want me to do there, Dr. Goldhead? You wanted me to trade my 5-4 for their 3-2 or something? I'm, I'm confused to what you wanted. I'm not saying you're wrong. I don't remember that term perfectly. I'm just confused to what the line you liked was. So I can Gavany Silversmith both and attack, and then they don't have a block. Otherwise, I'm not attacking. Or I can just play Outrider. I guess it makes sense. I don't know that I'm winning this race, but... I can't block their flyer either way. Just as pretty scary. But we do have the Lunark Veteran and some pings. So there's a decent chance a race favors us. Okay, so I want to draw a land more than a two drop right now. I think I have a pretty good amount to do in my hand. I may choose all spells for the rest of the game, but I think right now that's what I want. So if I resolve the three on Jissa, I can finish it post-combat with Neonate's Rush, but if they like counter it or something, I'm in really rough shape. think I don't really want to attack another open mana here. So I probably want to just go Lunark Veteran and Odrix Outrider. If they have removal, they would use it to kill the 4-3 when it attacks anyway. If they don't, well, if they don't, I definitely would want to attack with the 4-3. But what if they go like block with Jissa and then give it minus 2, minus 0 or something like that, and then they get the 4-3 after Jissa? I don't think it's worth entering combat here unless they tap their mana. It just seems too risky. Now, if they do play the counter like they did... Now we can attack with the 4-3, because if they want to trade Jissa for it, that's good for us. So once again, another example of where you want to play your spells like pre-combat, if you can. Find out what they have. Hey, Bjorns. Nice to see you as well. Okay, so this time I'm going to put the land in the graveyard. I'll take another Silversmith. I'm not saying one more land wouldn't have some uses, I think land five there. I mean, we used all five right away, and we probably will again. But uh, now I think we want a card as powerful as Silversmith. So they keep leaving up a decent amount of mana, though they did play the counter last turn. I mean, they look ready to block. They didn't even attack with the Abomination. I'm not really sure what I want to do here. I might cast Perforator, and then I can just, like, Neonates rush their 2-1. Um... I could play the Silversmith and get aggressive, but I'm just too worried they're going to have Nebelgeist or the minus two minus O trick I kept talking about. I think what I want to do here is just play like fairly weak spells. I don't want to slam Silversmith into their counter, but if I play Perforator, I can then like pass the turn on their upkeep. I'll hit the two one so they can't get like mana out of it. I think I'm pretty comfortable with kind of chilling here. I'm further advancing my board.
Hey, thanks, Lion. I have never had a beard before. I am 37 years old, turning 38 next month. And since I started growing facial hair, the longest I've ever gone without shaving is like maybe seven days. Yeah, them leaving the man up is scary, but assuming they don't have some great catch-up card like a sweeper, we're getting further ahead every turn. It's not like we're not adding things to the board, right? So they keep leaving up to, so I'm, I think it's probably the minus two minus zero, and I think that's a pretty good trick, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if they had that. Um, that makes me not want to just, like, play the 4-3 haste and crash with the 4 power or something. I could, what, if I silversmith up the Gavin, this one to a 4-5, they'll just group block it. Attacks just don't really seem great to me right now, but developing my board does. So I think I'm probably just playing silversmith and passing, just pumping my smaller creatures and just continuing on about my business. I'm getting ready for, like, a big attack. Because if they have a trick and they want to keep leaving mana up and not casting much, I don't want to attack, deal them some damage, and have a creature die. Then they get like a decayed version of it under Gissa, and it's not lethal, and then they can start spending all the cards in their hand. So like what, what I'm trying to do is just like get to the point where I can play Village Watch like and turn all my creatures or something like that. So I'm going to start with the Neonate's Watch here, because if I draw a land, I can play it in double Lamb Hall, uh, hall Terrier. And again, we've already pretty committed to playing around Sweepers. Um, what I'm trying to do is just dump everything I can in play and get ready for like an Alpha. Maybe that wasn't worth it because it gave them a card. I don't know. It might let them cast things. I should have probably done that on their turn. But if I drew a Mountain, I would have been able to play another Harrier. So there was a reason to do that, but it was probably probably a little better just to assume I probably the chance of getting them out was not worth giving them the card on the in their next end step, so they have one less card to play a land and cast something. That said, remember decay tokens can't block, so we're getting pretty ready to alpha here. Speaking of pretty ready to alpha. Um Well, that actually makes us not want to alpha. It makes us just want to pump our four three and attack, right? Because then nothing bad can happen to us. Like, it can't die because it has indestructible. And minus two minus so wouldn't even save Jis or any other blocker. So I think that changes the line to just play it on our creature with the most power. And then we can attack with that and drop the Harrier. And then next turn, of course, play the Village Watch and attack with everything for lethal. If they have the bounce, they have the bounce. I mean... I don't really care which of my creatures they bounce. I guess Silversmith is a good reason, but I think it's way more likely uh, that they have minus two, minus O, oh, and then Gissa can block a five power creature and they can give it minus two, minus O. Oh. The bounce is like fine. I think the minus two, minus O oh is substantially better than Geist Wave. The one mana bounce on common is excellent, uh, but Geist Wave is pretty mediocre. If you have a lot of stuff of your own to bounce to like have comes into play effects and everything, it can be good, but... I don't think two mana bounce uh bounce a permanent is that good in the in this format or just in general. Okay, I don't know. Unless they have some way to gain a bunch of life in combat, they're just super dead, right? They have three blockers. Like if they have a removal, if they have two removal, they're still dead. They have to like give life link to Jissa and play things. So, I'm going to assume they're dead. I don't know every card perfectly yet. Um, if there's some, like, uncommon that, like, you know, gives just a lifelink and plus two plus O, oh, and th then maybe they can survive with that or something. But there's no amount of removal that's going to save them here at five, I don't think. They just played two, and they'd still have to kill one more creature to go to one, two more creatures, uh... So they need, they kill two creatures, and they need a third removal to only go to one, basically. And then they'd still be at one for next turn. It's not like I'm dead or something. Yeah, Veil, minus two, minus two to all creatures. On Mythic Uncommon, which is the Mythic Uncommon?
not even sure what card we're talking about. I mean, I don't know the names that well yet. Um, obviously, if it's an uncommon, I'm sure I've played against it. But oh yeah, Morbid Opportunist is excellent. Yes, I I, I wouldn't. Qu I think people use Myth Mythic Uncommon pretty loosely. Like to me, Mythic Uncommon means like Zenith Flare, like Risen Reef, like cards that really should actually be banned or moved to like Mythic. But yes, that card is fantastic. It's absolutely you should first pick it. It's just a very good card. So I'm playing the Flame Channeler here first because when I cast Neonate's Rush, it will flip, right? A spell does damage. That said, no targets for it. Like I said, if you're thinking, like, why don't I slam Angel Fire Ignition? It's like, they're, they're, if they play something that can block 2-2s two profitably, it's going to open up more attacks. And if they have removal, I kind of want to give them a chance to use it first. So I don't generally try and play stuff like that first. Okay, so if I attack, they can trade, and then they're going to get two 2-2 two, two zombies with decay. That's, I still get in two damage, though, and I don't really care if they attack me back. I'm not super worried about racing. The real downside might be, though, letting them trade off with these two creatures, which are pretty good. Like, next turn, if I play the dual craft this turn, if I angel fire one of them next turn, I'll have Coven. So I can basically attack with everything. So I think I'm just going to chill for that reason. It's less about giving them the 2-2-2 two, two, two decays, because, I mean, I have a big life gain card and I'm on the play. Like, So I'm not really that worried about taking four, let's say. But it's it's way more that like I want to be able to have Coven next turn with the Angel Fire Ignition. Yes, if I Angel Fire, I dodge Death Touch and all that, and I just get a profitable attack for four. But I think that's substantially worse than putting Dual Craft Trainer out, right? Dual Craft Trainer is going to be sick. If I pump one of the twos, I already have Coven. So what I can do now is, like, Angel Fire Ignition the Flame Channeler, and then I can, like, Double Strike, like, anything, like, can they block? I have to double strike up the dual craft uh, trainer, I guess. Or they can block it with these two. But if I double strike up the dual craft trainer, then they just have to chump it with the 1-1. One, one, and they have no block on it. So in order to get Coven, I have to play the Angel Fire Ignition. So I pretty much have to do that. And then the Candle Grove Witch is going to have Flying... I just could just not send the dual craft. I can just give double strike to the 4-4 flame channeler here. And then it's going to be eight points of uh, lifelink and they're going to have no profitable blocks. So that looks better. I just won't send the dual craft trainer at all. And I don't need to play it on the candle uh, witch because that has flying so it can attack profitably anyway. So we'll give double strike to this 4-4 indestructible. I'm not going to send the trainer though because they can double block it with the Cathar and the death touch creature. But these two creatures just have great attacks now. They just, this has trample, so they can't even really chump it. And the witch has fly. So I'm pretty sure this is the best line for this turn. If I really need Angel Fire Ignition token somewhere else, it has flashback anyway. But for, as far as this turn, this just like, there's no way to profitably attack with the trainer unless I give it double strike. And if I give it double strike, they're just going to chump it with a 1-1. One -one. It's such a low cost for them to save all that like damage. Whereas by throwing it over here, like, I deal an extra four damage and gain an extra four life. That seems probably better than killing a 1-1. One -one. Okay, so if I Angel Fire... Oh, they got rid of Angel Fire. Okay, never mind. So we still have a game. So I have my Double Strike, though. So let's say I ping the 1-1 one, one token with Neonate's Rush, so they can't block with it. Flame Channeler will flip to a 5-5. Five five. Then I attack with that Double Strike and Candle Grove Witch with Flying. My other option would be just attack with all of them right now. I can give double strike to the flame channeler and then the dual craft. What is their block? If they block it with the three, four and the two, two, I can like first strike out the three, four and ping it, but it's still going to die to the two, two. So I don't want that. So yeah, I think I don't want to send the dual craft trainer. I think what I want to do 
is ping the 1-1 one, one token, so they have to block with one of their real creatures. And then I can give double strike to the Flame Channeler, and then they have to block it, or they'll be dead, because it's literally threatening lethal as a, as a five power double strike. I could hit them for four in the air, but then they just, you know, don't really, then they can like double block it or don't have to block it. Right now they have no profitable blocks. If they double block the embodiment of flame, I can just first strike out the death toucher and then it's going to end up living the embodiment of flame. So right now they just have to chump embodiment of flame with their five drop here, the three, four or the two, two death touch and take two. So that seems like it's probably my best option. Hey, Max, how's it going? Uh, I don't know the names. Oh, Ghostly Proce Ghoulish Procession. This card is probably not good unless you have sack outlets. Like, it's like two mana delay makes some zombies later. Like, you're probably not going to get one the turn you play it if it's turn two or three or whatever. If you play it in the late game, you will, but then how many are you going to get off it? So, like, if you can use those bodies profitably, it's a pretty good card. But I wouldn't want to have to, like, as an aggro deck, play it on the early turns. And if I'm an aggro deck and I play it on the late turns, what is it going to deal? Two damage? Four damage? So I think, like, I would, I think Ghoulish Procession is probably not great unless you can use bodies for profit, like you have sack outlets, in which case it's probably very good. Because it can consistently ge generate bodies pretty easily throughout the course of a game. So if you're able to cash in two twos for more than two damage, if you're able to cash them in for, like, a card... Like, then it's a potentially very powerful engine. I should probably block, right? This is just to, they want a creature to die to trigger something or something. There's not like, I don't think there's anything that's going to kill dual craft here, is there? I mean, they could have like plus two, plus two, but they could use that in combat anyway. Yeah, whatever. I'm at 28. If I was at 18, even, I'd probably block. But at 28, I probably just shouldn't block. Like, I barely... I practically don't have a life total. I'm literally at 28. Well, my creature wasn't going to take damage because it has first strike. So there is the three mana black creature that's, that kills a creature that took damage. But my dual craft wouldn't even take damage. Well, right. The, the, the reason to block would just be to save two free damage, but that's why I said even if I was at 18, I'd probably block in this spot because I think it was pretty free, and, and they were probably attacking to get in damage to trigger something like Bat Whisper, so it was pretty free to block, but I was at 28, not 18, so, like, who cares about saving two life? I practically don't have a life total. Okay, so anyways, uh, the 2-2 Flyer, has, same deal, has a profitable attack. As far as the ground... My 3-3 three, three First Striker can't attack profitably because they can still double block with the 4-2 and the 2-2. Two, two. But if I make one of those unable to block, then it can. So I think if I play the Harrier and just take away a blocker from theirs from them, their whole board collapses and I can pretty much just attack with everything. I don't think it matters much whether it's the 2-2 two, two Death Touch or the 4-2. I'd want to give de Double Strike to just like my smallest creature, I think. So probably the 3-2, I guess. Because I think they pretty much, the 2-2 flyer, they don't have a block on. They have 1-4-2 and 1-1-1 flyer to block with. So if I'm, I don't think they have any profitable blocks. They're not like dead, I think. They can like double chump, go to like three. But basically all I want to do is spread it around, force them to double chump here. I'm not sure if I can get in more damage by giving double strike to the flyer. Yeah, I can, but then they all... No, then they still have to block the embodiment and t and uh, take the Sanctifier. So yeah, I missed like one point of damage. I could have had them in basically the same spot in that two. So the optimal play there is, I think, double strike... Double... Is to uh, double strike the flyer. No, then they'll just chump the flyer and save four. And then they take three and two... Yeah, I think it's pretty much the same. Three and three. Yeah, no, it is one more damage. Yeah, the optimal play there is to double strike your flyer... Because then you force them to chump the that or the five, that and the five, and then they end up taking six instead of five. So I missed a point of damage. The optimal play was to double strike the smallest creature, the flyer. You're welcome, Smunky. Thanks for hanging out. Okay, their creature can't block, so the only decision is which two drop to play. We want Chandler in play in case we draw something that does a damage. We want the Harrier in our hand because it's the one that's good in the late game. 
Again, Harrier is really the embodiment of this concept, which uh, is one I came up with. I'm not saying I'm the only one who ever figured this out. It's not like that advanced, but it is, uh, you know, basically if you have two two drops, you put the, the more better one is in the late game than the other, the more you want to play the other one. Like that's how you decide which to hold and which to play. And it's true of three drops and stuff too. And Lamb Holt Harrier basically does nothing in the early game because you never want to spend that mana activating it, but is a powerhouse in the late game when you have nothing else to do with your mana anyway. So Lamb, the point I'm trying to make here is Lamb Holt Harrier is the kind of two drop. If you have any other two drop to play, you probably want to play that one and hold Harrier because on the early turns, it's two mana, two, two, no ability. And in the late game, it's a two drop that is a game winning card. So it's just a good embodiment of that concept is what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so here, I don't really want to trade with the 3-2 Sanctifier for the Siege Zombie. If they have something, it's not that big of a deal. So it seems like a pretty easy Silversmith attack with both. This is just max value out of the card. We basically have no profitable attack without playing it, and we can profitably attack with both creatures if we do play it. It's just pretty much, and it uses all our mana. It's just a no-brainer, basically. Thank you, Equations of Motion. Appreciate that subscription. Celeste Sanctifier is not great, not horrible. It's fine. Um, nothing special. You know, serviceable three drop. Okay, so same as last turn. I'll happily trade the veteran for the Siege Zombie. The only question is, do we want to play our creatures first to gain life? I think we might as well. Because, I mean, I'm not going to bring back the 1-1 Flyer over playing these other two creatures. Um, Innistrad's pretty aggressive, but that doesn't inherently mean it's good or bad. Like, if the games are interesting and your decisions matter, um, I'm not, I don't think it's going to be, like, a Dominaria or whatever for me, like, one of my favorites, but that's not to say I won't like it. Um, okay, so we do not have Coven. We can make one creature unable to block and one creature pacified with Candle Trap. Um... The Candle Trap creature can still block, so they're going to take 6 and go to 2. But it won't deal damage. So I think I probably want to Candle Trap the Scoundrel and make the Siege Zombie unable to block. Could be Candle Trap the Siege Zombie and make the Scoundrel unable to block. If somehow they stabilize, which I don't believe is possible and they're going to do, the Scoundrel is a much better creature from here. This doesn't have ward or anything, right? No. Remember, it shuts off the ability. So even though it can block and live, I mean, it shuts off its ability to deal damage. So even though it can block and live, that doesn't really matter. Like they can block a 2-2 and take 7, or they can block the 3-2 and take 6. Either way, my creatures live. So they pretty much have to have a sweeper or the game's over. Hey, not bad. All the rage is blue black zombies. And what are we? Did we just get win six or win seven? We got a seven and two with Boros. Six and two, maybe. I'm not sure which. Yeah, that was seven. So cool. Uh, we got a fir our first uh, ranked on stream draft. We got a seven and two with a red white Boros deck. Like I said, I didn't think this deck was anything special, but we had some rares to win with in Moonville Regent and Angel Fire Ignition, and we had a good curve. The Lunar Frenzy didn't really impress me, but it doesn't seem like a horrible finisher. But I think I would rather just have more cheap curve stuff, and then I can just rummage away extra lands and stuff. I wasn't impressed with it. All right, and let's get back in the queue. I'm definitely doing at least one more. This might be, I might do one more after this. I might not, depending on how long this one goes. But let's get back in the queue for draft number two. A uh, werewolf does enter the battlefield flipped if it's night. If it's nighttime, night then uh, things enter on their nightbound side, and if it's daytime, they enter on their daybound side. Time to open a sweet ooze. I like the sound of that. How about a hollowed respite? What is this? Exile target non-legendary creature, then returns to the battlefield. If it entered under your control, put a plus one plus one counter. Seems more fancy than good. Like, I'm sure I'm going to play this card if I play blue-white, but without ETB effects, this isn't that impressive. Like, you can use it to tap a creature of theirs or get a plus one plus one on yours, trigger an ETB effect. 
Like, it seems fine, but I think Gavity Dawn Guard is almost certainly better. This is the one we saw pack three last time, but I took a red card because my first two picks were red. And this card is not, like, amazing, but this card's pretty good, right? It's, like, a much better version of the three mana 3-2. Three you get an extra toughness. You get the ward, right? And another that, it's the, and, and the ability is more powerful, too. It's just basically a, a very nice card. This is the, the uh, black creature that kills a creature that took damage that people were talking about. The commons are not impressive. I mean, they're they're actually pretty bad. Rejuvenator's fine. Elementals is fine. I think this is a pretty clear Gavany Dawn Guard. Like I said, the only reason I even took the red on common I took over this pick three last time was because I had two red cards, picks one and two. Gavany Dawn Guard is uh, pretty excellent. Now, Ritual of Hope, I think someone played against me once, but I don't think I've had yet. I mean, I assume like in all formats, if you're going wide, this card is really good. And if you're not, it's not. But I don't really know how often you go super wide with white. I don't think it's really a super wide white format. I think white's aggro in this format, but it's more of just like what I just had. It's like you just play creatures and use Coven to keep attacking. It doesn't feel like it's a make a million tokens type of a format. Thank you, Bitterness. Appreciate the subscription. That's not to say Ritual of Hope isn't good. I think it's good. We're trying to assess how good it is. Uh, Blood Tithe Collector is, is excellent. Five mana, three, four, flying the discard a card. Outland Liberator is also pretty good. Nice 2-2 two, two Werewolf. Um, so we could stay on color and take Gavity Silversmith, which I think is one of, if not the best, white common. Ritual of Hope, if we think it's better than Silversmith, but I probably I think Silversmith is probably better. Pick one, pack one. I, I might take like the Collector over the Silversmith, but I think following up Gavity Downguard, we'll stay on the Gavity tribe and go with the Silversmith. I think Silversmith is likely better than the Uncommon Pump Spell. I could be wrong on that. I can't be wrong by a lot. Like, the Pump Spell... Like, they're both good cards. Like, I don't... This, the Pump Spell, depending on how the format plays, could be a lot worse than the Silversmith, or it could be, like, a little bit better than it. But unless White was just some all-in tokens deck every time, which it's definitely not, it can't really be a lot better than it. Because Silversmith is good in those kind of decks, too. Okay, so staying on color, we could take another Silversmith. Um, going off color, I mean, go, silver. I like Trapper just fine, but Silversmith is definitely better than it. Um, otherwise, we could take, like, Stromkirk Blood Thief, which is a good card. Again, maybe a round as good as Silversmith, like, pick one, pack one, when you can still go Black Red Vampires or something. But if we're going to end up Black White, we're just going to be prioritizing Black Vampires. I mean, this just seems like an easy Silversmith. Apparently, it's Draft White Day. Craig Wesco, somewhere, if he's not watching, is pleased with me. So now the, white, the best white card is probably the Sanctifier, maybe the Soul Guide Griff or the Morning Patrol. They're all pretty close depending on the curve. As far as off-color cards, there's literally nothing good. I don't think Drives Revival is good. This is just three mana. Don't impact the board is just like not really where you want to be in Modern Limited. Um, I think this is a pretty clear just take whichever of these three white cards we think is the best. We have a three and two fours. I think the Sanctifier is probably a little bit better than the Morning Patrol, but I could be wrong on that, especially if we don't end up white, green, or white, red, like if we don't end up with werewolves and stuff. Um, I think they're both like serviceable on exciting threes. That's how I would describe like both of those cards. So we're pretty committed to white. We don't have a second color. Homestead Courage, like maybe with enough, enough synergy or small creatures or whatever, but I don't think that's something we're particularly interested in. Yeah, Gale Drifter is excellent. Definitely the best non-white card in the pack here. So we're just going to take that because it would be that or Homestead Cur Courage. White-Blue definitely does like a Spirits Disturbed deck. That's pretty cool. Um, so again, it looks like we're seeing blue. There's not really any white here, but I mean, with two sil Silversmiths and a Dawn Guard, we're 100% committed to that. So I think we just take another Gale Drifter. Seems like a pretty easy pick. That said, our curve is getting high now. We have four fours already, so we have to devalue four drops here a little bit. But we only have two three drops, so we can definitely take a really good three drop like Falcon Abomination over a pretty mediocre two drop like Bat Bait Hook Angler. And that seems like a pretty clear choice. Yes, we need two drops, but it's only pack one, and we're not like flooded at three or anything. Thank you, Kribos. Appreciate the seven months of support, and thank you for the compliment as well. Um, so, I like I said, I don't really like Cathar's Call. There's plenty of removal in this format. It just doesn't seem like a very good card to me. Um, 
hate to be so committed to white blue, but because we're clearly seeing black and black's a really good color. Maybe we can drop white. I mean, I don't really care about the sun gold barrage, so I'm going to take the siege zombie, but I'm still not planning to drop white here. But if white's just not open and like blue black zombies is, we might have to move into that. It feels like we're seeing blue, but not white. Remember, we got all these white cards early. I might want to just try and figure out how to splash the silversmiths or something if necessary. I don't know. So if we are thinking along those lines, green is probably more attractive than red. Rejuvenator already gives us a free way to splash potentially. So unfortunately, I was hoping to just see blue white from here and try, you know be able to draft the easy way, but there hasn't really been playable white cards in these packs. So I'm not really sure what we can do. This card does not look good, Otherworldly Gaze. Devious Cover-Up also does not look good. Um, yeah, I guess we can take the Harrier in case we want to play red. So this pack is not going especially well. It started out all right, but I don't know what we're going to see now. These cards are not going to go in our deck no matter what. They basically just don't matter. This card could be okay if you really want like a cheap defender and you have a lot of graveyard cards, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think we'd be more likely to end up just red-white aggro with these two early drops. I don't think these cards really matter. So not that like tabling Harriers necessarily tells you much. It's just a serviceable two. It's nothing special. But it doesn't seem like red is being overdrafted when we're getting these 13th and 14th pick. All right, so right of harmony whenever a creature enters the battlefield. This seems like more of a constructed card. You have to like spend play a creature after get get your card back and then if you flash it back you can get a second card wahoo but borrow time is really good removal and single white so if we do end up on some kind of green blue or green blue or blue black or red white we can try and pick up a few evolving wild some kind of non-white i know i said white in those if we end up on some kind of two color non-white we could potentially try and splash silversmiths and borrow time if we want to otherwise well there's not much in this pack i mean Baneblade Scoundrel is excellent, but we're not super, we're not particularly looking at black. There's no good red or blue cards, so I think we pretty much have to take Borrowed Time. If there was a good uh, blue card, we could prioritize that since we saw blue much later than white in pack one. But with no good blue cards, like there's not really like any reason not to take Borrowed Time there. All right, Ambitious Farmhand I like a lot. That's a nice two drop that like even though a 1-1 one, one isn't useful, it turns into a 3-3 three, three lifelink, which you get your cards worth of a card back out of. And then you also are up a card because you got your planes. So, and that's and I like playing 16 land in these aggro decks, but that makes me want to have cards like Ambitious Farmhand to help me make my land drops. Uh, foul Play is probably better than the Farmhand or a round is good. It don't, there's lots of good two-power things to kill and then you draw a card, but we don't know if we're black yet. I think we're back to being pretty committed to white, given we went borrowed time in a Farmhand. Too good on commons. So if we go white blue, Nebulgist Intruder is a card I like a lot. It's it's uh it's a nice combat trick. It's pretty easy to kill a creature and really swing a board with that. As far as the white cards, Candle Grove Witch is a fine two drop. All of these three are again fine. Like I like Luminarch Veteran, I like Witch, I like Guardian. They're all cards will stick in my deck. None of them are particularly impressive. I think blue white is our most likely scenario, and Nebulgist Intruder is by far the best of these cards if that happens. So. Olivia Midnight's Ambush this late is awkward. Um, that should never happen, basically. I mean, I guess this could have been a really good pack. Um, there is a rare and an uncommon missing. I guess it's only fourth. Um, it shouldn't happen often, but it's possible the other black player took uh, an uncommon or something. But I still think we're looking to stay the course here, and there's fine blue and white cards. I think the Ritual Guardian is a perfectly fine card. Like I said, I think life matters more in this format than it does on average. So I think you should look at abilities like Lifelink and Haste as better than they normally are. Because those are the cards that swing life totals by more. That's my one kind of like, you know, macro, not micro level thought so far. Is that basically it feels like life total matters more than usual. I, I can't really try and table anything because there's already pick five. The Gatekeeper's, you know, not like some busted card or anything, but it's pretty good. Getting a two-drop that mills you in the Disturb flashback format, and then, you know, the tap ability is good, and then trade it off, bring back a 3-1 flyer. It's just an, an all-around efficient card. Basically, both halves are good. Uh, it's, it's not a broken card. It's not going to dominate the game or something like some blue-white gold on commons might, like some of the gold on common cycles might, but it's just a very efficient card. 
So speaking of, if we're going to try and do this uh, disturb thing, then maybe we'll play the amalgam here. Get a little removal for blue-white out of the silver bolt, a color that has a hard time killing creatures. Pretty easy Gale Drifter. I don't really like Component Collector. I don't think it's like unplayable, but I think we're going to be looking to attack on the ground. And while I don't love Silver Bolt either, it is removal for a color combination that doesn't really have access to it otherwise. Or at least much good access to much good removal. Obviously, there's a little bit. Like, I have a borrowed time. Um, so, five four drops, not, and they're all really good. So, we don't want four drops. Like, even a good but not great four drop, It's it, I mean, it's going to be our sixth four drop already. Because it would have to be better than Silversmith or Gale Drifter to make our deck, which is pretty hard to do. They're both excellent. Um, got one five drop, plenty of threes. How are we on twos? Farmhand and Graph Keeper. So we, we need to fill out our two drop slot. We only have two. Uh, we don't have too many fives, but a five, a fours, but a five, a four drop has to be quite good for us to take it. Like a, a serviceable four drop is never going to make our deck. Yes. Organ Hoarders will still make our deck, but basically like something worse than like Gale Drifter or Silversmith isn't going to make our deck. So that's the point. A four drop has to be really good to make our deck, whereas a two drop doesn't. Like, I only have two two drops, so any mediocre playable two drop, I'm interested in. Uh, a mediocre playable four drop, I'm not interested in. So that's where we're at curve wise. And three is in between, but we have like four three drops or something. Three creatures and a removal spell we can play. Well, that's a white two drops, and it's rare, so hopefully it's good. Enters the battlefield or attacks, exile up to one card. That's fine. Nothing special. Choose a color. It gains hexproof. That's good. And can't be blocked by creatures that color. Okay, not a broken card by any stretch. This is like probably like a B a B tier card, as in it's first pickable, but it's not like exciting. Um, that said, the other blue and white cards in the pack are definitely worse. So no real decision. Um, Faithful Mending's fine if we table it, but I don't think that's a particularly good gold card. Shipwreck Sifters looks good. Like, I have a lot of uh, Disturbed Creatures, but I think Sun Gold Sentinel's probably better. Yeah, I think Sifters will be good for me. If I get if I table the Sifters, I'll probably play it. I have a lot of Disturbed. Like, one, two, five. So I'm currently on five at the start right now. Um. Okay, so... Not Organ Hoarder, by far the best of these cards... So the question is Organ Hoarder or Candlegrove Witch, because if I'm not going to take Hoarder, it's because we need a mediocre two drop. I do think that this is our sixth four and we only have three twos, but it's also the start of pack three. This pack had, I, I think white, we're more likely to table the Candlegrove Witch than the Hoarder by a lot. And we have the whole pack to pick up more twos. So I think it's right to take Hoarder now. A few picks later, I might justify the two drop over the Hoarder, but I think at this point we still want Hoarder. Okay, so now I think we're definitely just taking the better of the two two drops. Uh, with Disturbed Synergies, I think it's probably the Angler. We can tap something with the Gatekeeper. Is that our only Disturbed Synergy? Well, we can mill it with the Amalgam and then get it. Mill it with the Organ Hoarder and then get it for free. Put it in the Graveyard with a Sanctifier and then get it for free. Yeah, I think that's clearly enough to take the Angler over the, uh, the, the Grove Witch. Okay, pretty easy removal spell here. So this pack went all right for filling out our curve. I mean, we didn't crush it on power level or anything, but we're now at four two drops that we're definitely going to main a uh, one mana removal spell, and we've only picked up one four mana or more card. So that's good. So now it's between Gavany Silversmith and Falcon Abomination, and this is where I'm actually going to make a curve pick. I think Silversmith is better than Falcon Abomination in blue-white, but this would be our seventh four drop. So I think we take Falcon Abomination. I don't think we're going to splash black. We didn't even get that Olivia's thing. We don't have anything to splash. So again, it's not like we can't play a good four drop like Dualcraft Trainer and it's excellent. But because of our curve, I think we just take Candle Trap, which is close with it anyway. Um, okay, well, looks like now they're going to force me to play one more four drop, unless I want to cut a Gale Drifter because it's that or a five drop. <laughs> All right, and we get our eighth four drop in Organ Hoarder. You see why I try and uh, keep the curve down where we can? <laughs> so at this point, we're going to probably cut the Amalgam. It's probably worse than any of our four drops. Now we can grab Sifters for another two. I'm pretty happy that came back. So Disturb is good for us. 
Um, we actually have so much of it. Maybe we're going to really want to play this amalgam. Am I going to cut Gavany Silversmiths, though? Like, what am I going to end up cutting? Like, my four drops are incredible. I mean, I can cut the Sanctifier. I mean, I don't have to cut fours. I don't have any fives or sixes. It's okay to have eight four drops, zero fives, zero sixes. Eight would be a ton of fours if I also had like three fives and a six or something. But another way you could view this is I have eight cards that cost four or more mana in my deck total. Yeah, I can cut a Gale Drifter, but I do have some Disturbed Synergies too, right? I have the Shipwreck, the shipwreck Sifters. I have the Devoted Geek Graph Keeper, which mills two cards. And if I play Disturbed Cards, I get to tap things. Or on tap. Just tap. And then if I... And then I have one other thing, I think, too. I forget what. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. Organ Hoarders, which mill... They mill cards. You look at the top three and then, you know, I can put the Gale Drifter in the yard and take something else. So I have some synergies with the Gale Drifters. And they're excellent cards. But I'm not saying it's, like, impossible we'll cut one. I might not cut anything. I can play eight cards that cost four mana as long as I don't have any fives or sixes. Like I said, another way you can view this is I have eight cards that cost four or more. I can't, like, you know, Amalgam would be good in my deck as well. I'm probably not going to play that. But I could just play 16 lands here with my curve topped at four. And then I have plenty of cheap stuff. I, I ended up with one, two, three, four, five. I have five two drops. A one drop, some removal I can use mana on. Plenty of threes, plenty of fours. I mean, I think this is right. I don't think I want to be cutting Silversmith or Gale Drifter for, like, Sanctifier. I think I probably have enough to do before turn four most games. And it's really more like 17, because anytime I have two, I can get a land with the farm hand. And, the, and then I have stuff like the Shipwreck Sifters that draws a card. So it's it's... It's, like, really going to play more like a 17 than a 16, because I have, like, a couple cheap ways to draw cards, like one or two, and then the one two-mana card that gets a land. Oma oh, Ben. I'm a Ben. Oma oh, Ben? I'm a Ben. If that means something in some language or something, I don't know. But my opponent's trying to steal my name. Yeah, 16 is pretty much the new 17. Actually... In a format like this, where you really want to use your mana on the early turns and aggression matters more, I, I actually would play 17 more in a lot of decks, but I mean, I don't have a card that costs more than four mana. And remember, farmhand's basically a land. Like, assuming you have two, it gets you land three every time. It's not like a creature that taps to have mana that might live or might die. Like, I, this card just morphs into a planes. Like, it does more than that, obviously. You get the 1-1 one, one and or 3-3 three, three also. But literally, like... It's two mana, put a planes in your hand. So cutting silver bolt doesn't help the curve thing, because this is something I can do if I'm stuck on three. I'm not saying it was on cuttable, but I don't have much removal. I feel like this is a deck that I didn't want to cut silver bolt. So I'm I'm gonna end up using silver bolt on one of those creatures probably. Although I guess I can just take two and wait till end of turn. Like, I'd rather use Silver Bolt than Borrowed Time, because Borrowed Time can kill anything. But if they attack and don't pump, and don't, I can just take two and see what they do and possibly hit a better creature, because these are both pretty terrible creatures right now. If they don't play anything else, I'll kill one end of turn. But that only costs me one damage. And if they play a three drop, being able to kill their three drop with the Silver Bolt is probably better than using it on one of these two pretty poor creatures. See? Glad we waited. Not that the Brimstone Vandal's great, but a better target. Okay, so do we want to play Organ Hoarder or Gale Drifter? 3-2 could block the e Crasher profitably, but not the Stinger. So that's going to be the case either way. I don't really see the value of flying right now. So I think I Organ Hoarder. Surprise, John Orange. Okay, so... What do we want? I kind of want all of this. Probably the Nebel Guest Intruder to get them in combat, though. The Veteran front half. Well, next turn I can double spell if I take the Veteran. I can play the Veteran and the 4-drop, like Silversmith or Gale Drifter, and really try and swing the board. And the life game would be pretty valuable for me. And they have, like, all spells in hand, right? Like, 
They missed a land drop, I think. I think, actually, the Luminarch Veteran makes the most sense. Even though it comes back from the dead and the Nebelgroos Intruder is such a more powerful card, my hand is all spells. I'm going to have endless stuff to do forever. Remember, I can also pay the Disturb costs. I think what I want to do is be able to swing this game. Like I said, life feels really valuable in this format. Like, I hope this play isn't going too far with that concept. Because, I mean, the concept, the view is correct. Life is worth more than in this format than it is on average. I can tell, like, I have near certainty on that. Now, whether the play of taking Lunar Lunar Veteran, because I feel like in this game, the life is going to be more valuable than the Nebelgeist, Nebelgast Intruder, that's, I have way less confidence in. Um, okay, so... I want to get the Silversmith going. They don't have a block regardless. The question is, where do I want the Silversmith counters? I want to counter on itself because the 3-4 stops the Stinger from attacking and the third power. Basically, the fourth toughness stops the Stinger from attacking me and the third power lets me attack into the Crasher. So the Silversmith pumping itself has a lot of value. So the question is, do I put the other counter on the Veteran or on the Hoarder? I think it's actually the hoarder. I think the veteran does not going to really attack or block. So I think what I want to do is go veteran, silversmith, counters on the hoarder and the silversmith, because those creatures are going to trade and attack and block. Let the veteran do its job of gaining me like four or five life. Yeah, Mr. Morph's answer was correct, Thirst for Meaning, as far as my opinion. No one can say what's absolutely correct, but Mr. Morph answered exactly why I think that. Yeah, same, Flame Dance just saying the same thing as well. Yeah, there's just a lot of reach and a lot of disposable attackers that you can't block profitably. Like, Decay is most... The most common way Decay tokens, like, turn... What they most commonly produce is damage, because... If they ever have a window to attack, you, you don't want to trade a creature for them because, like, then your creature will be gone forever, so you take two. And they can't block. So if you don't have a sack outlet, what they do is just attack profitably whenever they can. And there's also a lot of reach, a lot of, like, things that ping for one and stuff like that. So it just feels to me, like, like roughly like you start at 16 and not 20. And there's no precise math there done, by, by the way. If somebody actually takes the data and the stats and molds it, and it's like, yeah, you know, Ben's right, life's worth more, but you actually start at, like, the equivalent of 18.4, I, I you could believe them if the results are solid. I've done no math. It just feels to me like your life total is more valuable. Like, it feels like you effectively are under meaningful pressure sooner than you are on average. And it, it feels pretty distinct. Like I said, that was my one big takeaway from gaming this weekend. Um, okay, up to two target creatures can't block this turn. Fine, we want to race that. Um, oh, we're already down to four, though. They got us really low here. So, And they're going to be able to do that again next turn. So I have to, or any turn. So I have to play Borrow Time. That's basically not a choice. And then I can just present a blocker, though. So this seems pretty straightforward. Just borrow time the two power flyer. And then I can attack with both, right? If they attack with both... Oh, I can just get rid of the card. I didn't even realize the Sun Gold Sentinel did that. Okay, well, good stuff. Um, hey, at least every blatant mistake I've made today, as far as not knowing what my cards do, has involved a rare, right? It is day four of the format. I know the commons and uncommons pretty well, but not the rares that well yet. Okay, so since that happened, both my creatures can block. So the question is, what do I attack with? If they steal the Sun Gold, if I have another blocker up, am I dead anyway? Only if they have enough mana to pump the Stinger, which they won't. So I kind of want to have a second blocker up, I think. We have a lot more resources than them, so that makes it easy. If I'm going to leave a second creature back, it's super easy. Attack with the one with more power. The 3-4 is a better blocker. The question there was whether we sent the Silversmith or hold it back. But I think holding it up is right. Because now that I don't have to end this game quickly, because I'll just eventually lose to that sorcery, because I exiled it from the abandoned the post, because I exiled it with Sun Gold Sentinel, we have way more resources than them. Well, the Devil's Ability won't kill me if I can block it. Like, if they play that thing making something unable to block and I have one blocker... Oh, you're saying, like, if, if I wasn't exiling it, whether I have one or two up, yeah, I would just be dead on board. You're right. The Devil's plus two plus so would have lethal me. So I would have to have, what, three up? That, that thing makes two things unable to block? Yeah. 
I missed that. Yeah, you're right. Um, okay, so what can we do now? Trades are good for us, but we want the Phantom out. We remove the thing that makes two things unable to block. We're going to have play two blockers. So I think we can pretty comfortably attack with two things. The question is, do we send a third? No, their board's going to collapse next turn. We don't really want to make aggressive or risky plays. We want to be able to beat like a removal or steal a creature even. So let's say I attack with two and I have three up and they play steal a creature. They then have four creatures to my two. I can block two and take two, which shouldn't be lethal because I can take three, which is not four. So yeah, I think this is a pretty clear... I'm just going to play this pre-combat so if they make any trades, I, uh, I get my life. Attack with the two that are better to attack with, I think. And play the Gale Drifter. This doesn't, like, have Vigilance or something, does it? I know I know about the Coven, but, like, that doesn't really change anything. Oh, wait, but if I play a three-power Flyer, then if they steal that, they have Lethal. So I shouldn't do that. I'm winning by enough. If I send the 3-2 and I play two blockers, I'm dead to, like, steal a creature or potentially removal, right? So I, I think I want to have three blockers up, not two. Now I can't think of a card that kills me. Two creatures can't block doesn't kill me. Steal a creature doesn't kill me. I mean, I'm, look, I'm sure there's some obscure card or something, but I think we lose to commons. Yeah, I can make the set unblockable, but it doesn't gain vigilance or something, right? My creatures were basically already unblockable. If they blocked, I was happy. I'd rather my creatures not be unblockable. Now, if it gained Vigilance, if you use the Coven, I'm interested. But choose a color, it gets Hexproof. Yeah, it doesn't gain Vigilance or anything. So I can't get an extra attacker. Okay, so they drew two new cards, so we have no idea if they have removal or not. Think at this point, I'm just attacking with everything. Like, even if they can some, if they kill something, and then they make some blocks to survive... I'm going to get life off the Phantom, they're going to lose creatures, and I can drop a blocker, two if I can bring back the Angler. I don't really see how this can work out poorly for me. Like, if they drew one removal, I'm pretty sure this is not, like, problematic, this attack. Um, I don't know if it matters, but... I'm not going to use the Sun Gold Sentinel's ability to prevent them from blocking now, because I can always give it pro-red later. And frankly, uh, I just want the, the more important issue is I want the two mana available so I can bring back the uh, the one two flyer here to have an extra blocker. So super happy about this. If they don't play anything, every one of my creatures that dies gives me life, makes it harder for them to beat me, and I'm way up in resources. Every creature they lose makes it harder for them to sneak in lethal. Unless they have, like, that black mythic that, like, sweeps the board and drains me, I feel pretty good. That card probably wins them this game, because I take one for every creature that dies, but that's, like, some obscure mythic. Not protection, sorry, just can't be blocked. So if they block after, I can't actually give it protection, like, it would still die. But the, the larger point there um, was basically I'm happy if they trade. And what matters is being able to produce as many blockers post-combat as possible, but preventing trades there isn't in my interest. Like, I want them... If I could push a magic button and bury three of my creatures and bury their three creatures, I would push it, even though it was a trade down, because I would gain three life, and then they would lose their ability to sneak in lethal. And I was up on... I was up a ton on resources. Hey, we're playing the Filthy Robot, another streamer. I know who they are. I grew this beard over exactly the past two months. The last time I shaved, I looked it up on Twitter when I, because uh, I tweeted about like day seven, day 14, when I actually knew exactly what day it was. The last time I shaved was July 27th. Or sorry, 17th. July, it was July 17th. So if you want to know what I look like after two months and three days of not shaving, you're looking at it. <laughs> saying Barry shows my boomer, you're not wrong. Listen, I'm not I'm not in denial. All right, so I can play the farmhand to get another planes for next turn, but a 3-2 can trade with their 2-3 zombie lord, and I think that's actually profitable for me. As good of a two-drop as the Sentinel is, Blade Stitch Scab out of blue-black is probably just even better. I mean, I understand I can kill it, but I might need this to kill something good. I have a bunch of, like, small, grindy-ish stuff. 
So it's kind of a blowout if they have the minus two, minus oh, but I think it's worth it. They're on the play. I think this is a trade I want to make. Okay, I don't think there's any real decisions here. Go ahead and use this. We're trying to buy time before playing the Sifters, because if we draw any Disturbed card or Spirit, we, we want to discard that. Uh, I do not want this trade. I'm not even that far from turning Coven on, potentially. Like I said, if I draw a Disturbed card, I can turn on Coven right now. One, two, three. If I don't draw a Disturbed card, I cannot. So now I have to think a little bit more. I might still just go for it. I mean, Falcon Abomination would be fine, but I don't need to block the zombies yet. I think what I want to do here is play the Farmhand, get a Plains, and then play the Sifters. If I draw a, um, like a Disturber Spirit, I'll probably discard it. If not, I can just discard a land, because I already have mad extra lands. So this lets me use all my mana and get about as much value out of the Sifters as I can, because I already have a land that's practically a dead card. So, I mean, I get my next card. If it's a Disturbed card, I'll just discard that so I can have one, two, three. Now I don't even know. Do I even want to attack with the Guardian for the three life, or do I want to wait to possibly flip the Farmhand? Let's not be greedy. I can, like, this... No, this isn't a three power. Actually, I might not have another three. I have all twos now. Hmm. I don't care about giving them the Decay token. So this is a good trade because it gives me three life. The question is, is it better to be able to flip the Farmhand? But you know what? I don't think I'm flipping the Farmhand anytime soon. I think, like, next turn I can use all five on Gale Drifter here out of the yard, Whale Drifter. And then I can use all six, Borrow Time and Falcon Abomination. And that, so that gives me two, three, four draws before I'm really interested in flipping the Farmhand. I'm not saying flipping the Farmhand wouldn't be slightly better than that, but the odds they have no removal and, like, it's barely even better for me. So I think it makes sense to wait. See, we already have another three. Okay, so here, though, I'm just going to play the five mana Flyer. There's no, like, real good target for removal. This uses all of our mana. Let's see if we can clean this dirty robot. Thanks, Phil, for noticing. <laughs> Everybody's a lot more interested and impressed by the beard than I was expecting. I mean, I'm glad people seem to like it. I mean, I think it looks fine. I knew it would be like thick and everything once it came in. I'm a hairy guy, for better or worse. Okay, so that's a creature we do want to get rid of. Anytime it switches from night to day, they draw a card. We don't want that. Doesn't look like I have much of an attack on the ground yet. So I think this is just borrowed time, the Sage, and play my Falcon Abomination and just continue attacking in the air. Seems like that's our current path. We could probably flip the ground at some point, given the Coven on Ambitious Farmhand. And we have two, three power creatures now. But I think for the moment, we want to be pressuring them in the air. And we definitely don't want to just leave around the Sage that they can just, like, pass the turn and draw an extra card and then, like, cast an instant or two and then flip it and draw another card. Like, this game, I don't know for sure if we're going to win. It's definitely looking good. But if we lose, we're not losing to aggression. We're not losing quick. So the, so we do not want them sitting around drawing extra cards. Like, this game is not going to end anytime soon. They're at 18, we're at 21, and the board's getting pretty cluttered up. Now, we have better stuff than them, so I'm not saying we're not going to win. I'm just saying we're not going to win fast if we win. Okay, so they have a 2-2 Death Touch and a 1-3 to block with. So they don't really have, like, profitable blocks on anything if we do attack on the ground, like, with with three threes. Um, unfortunately, since we have three white, three blue, I can't play the double white, three drop and flip the Ambitious Farmhand. So I think continuing our Aerial Assault is better for now. The Gale Drifter gives us the ability... Uh, to flip the farmhand next turn if we want to go aggro. And if we don't, it adds a flyer to the board to attack anyway. Meromorphic knows. I live in constant fear of anybody drawing an extra card for free. Like, if somebody plays, like, four mana draw two, I don't care. They went up a card, they went down four mana, whatever, right? But, like, if they can get free cards out of their creatures, nothing scares me more than that in, like, all of Magic. <laughs> okay, so we we aren't going to play the Organ Hoarder and Double Spell unless we get a two, because I don't want to take a land. I don't need a land at this point. So I think we just play both three drops this turn, which, again, on future turns will give us the ability to, to flip this farm hand. Um, but we can't play the down Dawn Guard, flip the farm hand, and attack this turn, because Coven is double white and Dawn Guard is double white. So again, kind of last turn, basically nothing happened. I added the 
the three two flyer to the board and they exiled it so i think again we just want to use all of our mana or as much as we can and put out our stuff and get ready for a potentially like aggressive attack if they if they don't play anything or if they just add another two two to the board or whatever if they clock keep the ground clogged before we alpha we want to add as much of the ground as possible if they kill a flyer for example this turn like they did last turn then we'll flip the farm hand and attack with everything on the ground for sure remember this two two can't even block so we're getting to the point where ground alpha is starting to look pretty good well that's really scary so i think they might have that sweeper um I don't know. They might also just be trying to trigger something. That I don't think I should let that deal me damage. I have to assume there's a reason they're attacking. You just trade like the 2-3 for it. This creature and that creature are about even. Yeah, so they were just trying to get that last card out of my hand. That's why they made the attack. So they have two blockers. Now the 3-4 is bigger than anything I have, but the all-out attack still looks pretty good. I can organ hoarder and flip the farmhand since I drew a land. So I think what we want to do here, I don't mind throwing away one creature to deal them eight or whatever. And I so if I don't attack, if I don't have an attack with any one creature, they can just block it with a three four. But if I alpha attack and flip the farmhand, they have a three four profitably eats my three three, and then one three bounces with a two two, and they take two four seven nine. So the question is, would I sack Gavany Dawn Guard to deal them nine? The answer is obviously yes. So um, what I want to do first is cast the Organ Hoarder in case I draw um, something that can kill the 3-4, like Candle Trap. Now I don't have to let them eat anything. That's way better. So now what we're going to do is switch gears. I'm not going to send the 1-1 Farmhand since I can't flip it and they could eat it with the 1-3 Larder Zombie, but I can just send everything else now. Well, actually, though, maybe now I don't want to send the zombies until next turn, right? Because they're not helping anything get through. Like, now, if I send these three creatures, their only profitable block is the 3-4 on the 3-3, and they take 4. If I send the 2-2-2 two, two, two zombies, they get to put the 1-3 on a 2-2, two, two, and they take 6. So I'm sacking both zombies to deal 2 damage. That doesn't seem worth it. So I think... I send these three creatures. You see how I'm reducing it to like a value decision? That's what you want to do when you play Magic, right? Like option one, if I send the Dawn Guard, they take four and they lose nothing and I lose nothing. Option two, send all five of these. They put one three on a zombie and three four on Dawn Guard. So they take six and I lose both zombies. So I, so I faced a choice last turn of do I want to sacrifice both of these zombies to deal two damage to them? Maybe you think the answer to that is yes. Maybe you think it's no. But being able to think about it in those terms, like reducing it to that choice, that's how you like can then assess your options and start the reasoning through to, to reason through them by figuring out like what the final product is of your play, of your options. Okay, so again, I don't know. I don't think they have a sweeper. They're probably trying to trigger something like the blood life like last time. I don't know. I don't have I'm not gonna chump it, so I'm not gonna block because I don't have a three three. I don't have a free block. It's a question of whether I trade organ hoarder for their two two or something, which I'm not gonna do, obviously. Okay, I don't really see any decisions. It's just to exile their creature. I'm going to turn on our farmhand now just for, like, auto pass value and then attack with everything. Their 4-4 can eat something, but they're at 10 and we're attacking with 7 creatures and they have 2 blockers, so I'm comfortable with that. If they have nothing, they're dead because their smallest creature is 2 power and they're at 10. So 7 minus 2 means 5 are getting through. 5 times 2 is 10. But even if they have a trick, they're still taking 8. Like, they can kill 2 of my creatures and take 8. I'm comfortable with that. Gave Filthy Robot a nice cleaning, a nice washing. Hopefully they're a little less dirty.
I think what you want to do, Pabloy, is at least try and like think about it the way I just did. Like, you know, when you so it's fairly intuitive to most of us to not throw away our resources for damage because you don't want to do that the vast majority of the time. So if you're just trying to decide whether to do that or not, try and think about like if I attack with these two creatures that have a profitable attack, what is the end result? I get an even trade and they take two, and even trade is around even value, so it's two damage. Let's say on the other hand, I alpha and everything. What is the end result? I lose these two creatures, I kill their one, so I throw away this one card, and they take how much damage? Six. So do I want to throw away this card to deal four? That doesn't describe the situation perfectly, but that will get you like to a pretty close estimate of what's going on. Okay, so we have to mulligan here. Um, clearly we're going to keep, probably just going to bottom island. We have ambitious farmhand, so this is effectively a three lander on the draw. With two two drops and silver bolt, yeah, that just seems crystal clear. I mean, we have a four drop, but remember, this isn't a two lander on the draw; it's a three lander on the draw. We can always play farm hand to get a land. Hey, that's not easy to do, Void Grandma. Congrats. Okay, so I'm gonna play the three two first. It's not exiling a card, but it is attacking for three and not one. If we draw a land next turn and they play like something mediocre, I'll probably silver bolt it. If they play something mediocre though and we don't draw a land, I'll probably play farmhand and get land four since I have two four drops in my hand. So we'll have to judge whether it's better to play farmhand or use silver bolt based on whether we draw a land and how good the creature they play is if they play one. Okay, so they played a creature, but not one we want to silver bolt. Um, it can't block ours. Now we drew a three drop, so we now have a decision between farmhand for land four, so we can play our four drops on curve and make our land drops next turn potentially, or play a three drop that can attack our block profitably. If we assume we can silver bolt their drop next turn, they don't have a good block on either three two, so I think I'm going to take the greedy line. and play the Ritual Guardian. If I didn't have the Silver Bolt, I'd be a lot more inclined to farmhand, so I can play my Flyer and my Organ Hoarder, like, immediately. Um, but given I expect my 3-2s to have a profitable attack, the only way they won't is if the opponent plays, like, a 2-4 here, like, or a 3-4, something I can't Silver Bolt that blocks these. Because like, if they play, like, a 2-2 Death Touch or a 3-3, if I draw a land, I'll just attack, trade, and play my 4-drop. If I don't draw a land, I'll just Silver Bolt their blocker. So the only way they effectively blank my 3-2 is by playing, like, a 2-4, something I can't Silver Bolt or attack and trade with. Okay, so that's not a creature I'm particularly excited to Silver Bolt. We have an attack anyway. It looks like it's a pretty clear farmhand play the planes now. So we don't miss the land draw for the turn, but we can't put the Gale Drifter out yet. But we got in the three damage anyway. So that's kind of why I took the greedy line here. Because I felt like the three two, the extra 3-2 would be likely to attack or block profitably, assuming they played something that interacted with one of my two 3-2s in play, but not both. In which case, I deal the three damage anyway. And if I drew the land this turn, not that I wanted to or didn't, but just if I happened to, then I can play the Gale Drifter on curve, and I still got in that extra three damage. Now that I didn't, I used two mana instead of four. That's not great. But it's basically like I play the Gale Drifter a turn later. It doesn't really cost me damage because I got in three damage. I wouldn't get in otherwise. And I'm clearly on the aggressive in this game because the light tolls are 20 to 12. Ironically, that's the kind of card that would have actually cost me that three damage. Because it would have blanked my attack and I can't silver bolt it profitably. Anyways, though, now we can just start playing flyers and see how that goes. This thing's not a wolf or werewolf, is it? No, we need some fire, not silver, to deal with a scarecrow. Thank you, Chem26. Appreciate the subscription. <laughs> always a humble stream, always a humble stream. I always say this, and I don't say it to be humble, and I don't say it to push any one agenda. I just say it because it's true. 
Luck is the largest factor in winning any game of Magic, and I don't even think it's close. But skill matters too, and even if luck is 60 and skill is 40, or luck is 70 and skill is 30, I'll fight over that 30 or 40, right? Like, that's the point of the game. Okay, so, take the four. Can I attack back in the air? Yes. Can I double block? Yes. I'd have to lose my flyer. I don't really have an answer to the 4-5 if I don't double black block and my flyer comes back from the dead. But I think we're winning by enough that I should probably race. Hit with Gale Drifter, play another one. Seems like it's pretty hard for them to successfully race this. And I can mess around. Like, I can end up, like, double blocking later, chumping with the farmhand. Maybe I can flip it. If they get too aggressive, like, to pressure me, I can always attack back with the farmhand if I can flip it. So I think we're in a position where we want to make them answer our flyers. I think this is a race we're winning pretty comfortably if they can't. Okay, so now we can't flip farmhand, but we can play organ hoarder and silver bolt if we want to. I think we organ hoarder pre-combat, see what we get. I think that's... A pretty clear first option since we still have the ability to cast whatever off it or use silver bolt um do we want gale drifter or organ hoarder probably organ hoarder we can just play the gale drifter from the yard anyway there's no reason to think um that one power is gonna matter Okay, so I have a profitable double block on the 3-4 with two 3-2s. If they kill one, I have the Silver Bolt as backup. So this seems pretty automatic. Can only take so much, but I don't need to make a bad block to prevent this 4 yet. And I can't really get blown out here. I mean, if they play something, I finish that off with Silver Bolt. I mean, I'm still winning the race pretty handily. Okay, so I'm pretty glad I didn't use the Silver Bolt, because I'm going to end up just attacking with the two Flyers here. They can block with the Soul Guide Griff, and then I can finish it off. I don't have enough mana to play the Flyer from the Yard, but I do have enough mana to still play the Organ Hoarder. I guess now that I drew the Bait Hook Angler, another option is to maybe flip the Farm Hand, but if I spend two and three, I don't have three for Silver Bolt. Yeah, we just want to keep banging the air here pretty clearly, I think. I could send the 3-2. If they block with the two one ones, the Unruly Mob would grow to a 4-4 four, four. if I don't bolt it. I could bolt it, but then I'm not bolting the Griff. Yeah, it's just keep keep banging in the air is definitely the right play here. I guess I should have Organ Hoarded first, maybe, in case it changed my options, like I just explained how you pretty much always do last turn. But because I might have drawn removal and then rather done that, and now I'm basically going to Silver Bolt the Soul Guide no matter what. So I uh, should have done this pre-combat. Other than that, good beats. So if I had Organ Hoarded first, I would have Candle Trapped the 3-4, attacked the 2-3-3s, three, three, and then played the Bait Hook and still had the Silver Bolt chilling. Still had the other 3-2 Flyer play, which would be a little bit better. The Flyer in the Yard I'm speaking of is the one that's going to go to the Yard when they block. So other than giving them a big unruly mob, I'm in no way against double blocking this with the two organ hoarders. I don't see myself having a profitable attack on the ground. If I'm going to end up chumping it, seems better to do now. If they have a trick, great. They can kill all my ground creatures and keep their four or five around. They're at four. I'm mostly concerned about attacking in the air. Ouch. So that's not great for me. I mean, I can still candle trap that. I can still get rid of it, potentially. Um, like, two, five, so it's one, three to use this, one to play it, and two to play this. So I can do all of that, so it seems pretty clearly correct. I'm turning Coven on. Obviously, they're not dead. They're going to one, but make them have to have an answer for the flyer, and then... The bait hook angler will end up dying because they have to block it. They can't take it. And then I can present another one power flyer. So even if they kill this gale drifter, we should be looking pretty good. The reason I played the bait hook there instead of discarding it to the sifters, um, 
No, maybe I would have been able to turn on Coven anyway. Maybe that was better. But remember, they have to block it. Like, it's representing, like, a, and if they attack, I need to block. Like, it's representing, how do I word this the right way? It's already in the yard if I want it to be. Like, they can't not let it go to the yard. So I'm not sure whether it was better, because either way I could have made the play I made, and then the end result would be Sifters in play as a 2-3, Angler in the yard. But if I discard a land to Sifters, I'm kind of getting a free 2-1 body to throw around. Because, again, the Angler's already in the yard if I want it to be. They're at 1, so all I have to do to put the Angler in the yard is attack with it. They can't take it. I guess if they theoretically play an 0-3, it could end up not forcing trades. All right, so like I said, happily chump here. The only real downside is maybe I can't flip the farm hand, but I mean, the real fight's in the air. Well, that doesn't save them. They need an answer for the scale drifter. Um, okay, let's see. If I play the sifters, if I draw land, I'm happy to discard it. They can gain three life. Oh, they can sack all their creatures. Yeah, because they gain one. Yeah, I said that doesn't help them, but I guess, yeah, they can sack all, literally all their creatures. Um, okay, so I guess we're going to end up candle trapping the flesh taker. It's scarier than the unruly mob anyway, I think. I don't know why I did this pre-combat or why it matters. Oh, you know what? I can play the Sifters, and then if I draw a, a card, I can activate the Coven, and then I can lethal them this turn with the extra one from Farmhand. So I probably should have started with the Sifters. Don't ask me why I'm playing so sloppy. Um, but yeah, I probably should have started with the Sifters. Eh, I don't need to lethal them. I probably just want to hold this. Well, I can't exile this. I don't have a two-power creature right now. But I think... I'm just going to attack with the Drifter. If they kill it, I'll bring out the other one Power Flyer. If they sack all their creatures, then, uh, well, I'll still bring out the other one Power Flyer. But basically, this play was not, it's highly unlikely to be anything that I would have not, anything but exactly what I would have done. I just had absolutely no reason to Candle Trap pre-combat. I guess the only reason to do that would be, like, if they can give Flying to the Flesh Taker. So... I can't exile the Taker uh, because I don't have Coven. But I mean, now, like, I'm going to hold the Sifters in case they play a Sweeper, but they have to deal with two different Flyers. Like, if they play a Flying Blocker, I guess they can block the Gale Drifter, sack it to the Flesh Baker before damage, but, like, to prevent the one from the hook, you know, because they'll gain one. But I don't really see, like, they're just sacking another Flyer. They're just falling further behind. Like, that's not a path to victory. Yeah, I didn't have Coven at, as in Trith. If I had Coven, I, I would have done that, which is probably why my inclination, without really thinking about it too in-depthly, was to play it pre-combat. But, but, uh, but yeah, I, I didn't have Coven, so there wasn't really any way to do that. No, it's cool. Yeah, I don't even know what all the cards do either. I mean, listen, I don't read the previews and stuff like that, so I'm seeing some of the rares for the first time. Like I said, I probably did about 20 drafts this weekend, you know, which is a good amount, but you know, not, like, infinite. So, like, I know all, and played them all out. So, like, I know all the commons and uncommons, but I don't know all the text of every rare by any stretch. So, I mean, don't beat yourself up. Like, and thankfully, they've been making the cards more and more complicated. They've got activated abilities. They've got flashbacks. They've got, you know, they used, like, a ton of the text, you know, like, and which is a very good thing, in my opinion. You know, like, I'm... There's some things I'm not happy about, but the design perspective of let's make magic complicated, it is the best game, the most complex game. Let's not try and be Hearthstone light. Let's make the game, you know, hard and challenge people. I am all for. 
People need to, we don't need to protect people from these game losing blunders that make them feel bad. We need to tell people, you don't need to feel bad. Even Hall of Famers and top pros make game losing blunders because magic is that hard. Like, you know, my, my philosophy is embrace magic's difficulty, not, uh, not protect us from it. So anyways, um, rant over, back to the game. Can't attack into the 1-3 profitably, but I have a 2-2 two, two flyer to play. And then next turn when I play the Silversmith, I can pump the 2-1 and then I can attack profitably. So we need to chill for this turn. Yeah, I, I agree, Nickel the Hero. That's the main reason I do it. I just started pre-releasing before there really was much in the way of previews and like this whole season. And I just love going to the pre-release and seeing the new mechanics and cards and reading each card for the first time. You know, like maybe it's just nostalgia or whatever. Cause you know, this is like 1995 when I was like in middle school, but like, I don't know. I like it. Okay, so they played a 1-4, so making a 3-2 is not going to give us a good attack. Uh, this thing even has reach, so I don't actually think we can get a good attack this turn. So I'm not sure if I play the Silversmith. Well, I guess if I make it a 3-2 and they double lock, I can trade with the 1-3, but then theirs comes back, which is a 3-4 flyer, and mine comes back as a 1-2 flyer. I'm not, like, scared. They're going to get... This is going to die, and they're going to get to bring it back at some point, but there's no reason to make, like, an even to slightly unprofitable trade to let them bring that back. So I don't think we can do anything too productive now against this 1-4 and this 1-3. So I'm going to wait on the uh, Silversmith and just play this Sifters. I'll happily discard a land. Obviously, I already have plenty. I need to wait on the Silversmith because I don't know where I'm going to get value out of putting the plus one plus one counters. Since it's nowhere right now, because I don't think I'm breaking open this board where I can have good attacks into the 1-3 and the 1-4, I want to wait and then see how things like shape up. So that I know where to put the Silversmith counters for profit. All right, what is this thing? Three mana, three, three. I don't think I've ever seen this card yet. Is this the ooze you were talking about when you said, I hope I, you hope I open a news? Uh, whenever a land card is put in the graveyard from anywhere, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Remove three counters. Return it to its owner's hand. When it leaves the battlefield, return up to three target land cards from your graveyard to your hand. Okay. Well, thank you, CC Drash. Appreciate the subscription. It does seem like more of a constructed card, but obviously they have ways to get lands in their yard potentially, including this Covetous Castaway when it dies. Seems like we're not really going to do much better than this with Silverbolt, so we should probably just go ahead and Silverbolt it. It's not like a great turn cycle because I don't have an attack, but it seems like the best Silverbolt is going to do, and that card could definitely generate some value. So taking this turn off and killing it seems like it makes sense to me. Hey, thanks Equations of Motion for gifting out a sub to Ryan Sachs. Okay, so what are we going to do now? I still don't see how we're attacking profitably. And I don't really think Silversmith is changing that. So let's go collect some organs. Yeah, I could have silver bolted the 1-4. It would have given me a little bit more of an attack, but the 1-4 seems like such a worse creature than that 3-3 three, three rare. So I can play the 3-2 flyer, or I can get it from the yard and take Candle Trap. It has to be take Candle Trap. Getting rid of... I probably have Coven, and getting rid of that 1-4 should open up the board for me, I think. I mean, I like this set more than Strixhaven and D&D uh, &D Limited, for sure. But I don't know I don't know if I love it yet or not. I try, I try and reserve a lot of my judgment. I try and take the first week or two to mostly just learn and, like, try and kind of give everything a fair shake because I'm always going to like a new set. Literally, in my opinion, the best four days of the year every year are when the new set comes out. So, like, because it's a new puzzle to solve, you know? So, like, I try and just play and learn and see how I'm enjoying it and get, a, you know, get a sense of that. Not, like, really... I, I'm, I'm big on, you know, trying to... I'm going to judge things. I'm a human. I have biases. I have feelings, too. But since we recognize all of those things, I try and do my best to kind of, like, you know, set them aside when I'm trying to learn. You know, like, when I'm trying to get, gather data accurately. Um, whether that's how much I enjoy a, a format or how aggressive it is or which colors are the best or what cards overperform and underform, no matter what. Um, okay, so I try not to even think about things like that is what I'm saying. Okay, so what do we want to do? Uh, we can get rid of the 4-5, but then we don't have an attack. We can get rid of the 1-4, then we can attack with like the flyer, which is just one. 
None of that seems very exciting. I think I'm just going to put out another creature and chill for now. Like, I'm at 26. If I'm not going to get in an exciting attack, I see no rush to use the Candle Trap. I'm not under pressure. I can't really pressure them. It looks like I'm not going to win the fight on the ground. And it looks like I'm not scared of like a 6-6 on the ground either. So I think we want to Candle Trap the Flyer. They're down to two cards in hand. Does this thing do anything? Return a card besides add mana. Like obviously Root Coil Creeper is a good two drop for Blue Green. Because it's a 2-2 two -two that taps to add one. But like, and it can even give you two. But besides the mana abilities, does it do anything? Returns a card with what? Flashback, which they don't currently have any of in the yard. Feels to me like we want to be trying to attack in the air. What I could do here, though, is still wait one more turn on Candle Trap. Because I could play Silversmith, Pumping Gale Drifter, and, like, Abomination. And then I have an attack in the air with the 4-3. And then they might even pass the turn to try and flip this uh, Wing Shredder. So they have a blocker. And then I can kill it with Candle Trap next turn. So that looks better to me. This gives us a profitable attack for four instead of five, so we're missing one damage. And we're using, like, four mana to put the Silversmith out. And I'm pretty happy to put the counters on the Flyer at this point. Remember, like, way back on turn four, I said I didn't want to play the Silversmith or turn five, whatever, because I didn't really know where I wanted the counters yet, because I didn't know how the game was going to shake out? At this point, I feel pretty confident. The ground is just going to be some ultimate stalemate, and I'm going to win this game if I win it in the air. So now I know that as long as I'm putting the counters on the flyers, I'm pretty happy. Okay, so I could Candle Trap and remove the 1-4 and attack for 7, and they have no good blocks. But since I have Nebelgist in the air, but since I have Nebelgist Intruder, I could also just like... Attack with the 3-3 three, three, and 4-4, four, four, and 4-3. And then they might go for double block on Gale Drifter. And then uh, I can get them with Neville Gist Intruder. Or they might go for double block on Abomination. I get them with Neville Gist Intruder. So it seems like Candle Trap and Remove the 1-4 is a fine play. But because of the Neville, Neville uh, Gast Intruder, I think there's more value in just like letting them block. Because I think we're probably going to get to... Um, Kill a 2-2 kill a flyer for free. If they double block the 4-3, I would get to kill the 1-4 for free. If they double block the 3-3, three, three, I can't kill the 1-4, unfortunately. Just the 2-2 two, two flyer. But still a pretty nice free kill here. Am I going to use all my mana next turn? Probably not. So I'm going to hold the candle trap rather than show it to them. It could even be the difference between them passing the turn to flip the bird admirer or something like that. Okay, cool. This went pretty well. So they got a 2-2 flyer, which can trade with, like, my 2-1 flyer. They can't pump yet, right? They don't have four up. No, they do because of the creeper. They can pump. Okay. So I can't send the 2-1 flyer. So I think what we need to do now is candle trap away the 1-4 because this thing is just... A counter on that makes it a 2-5. It can flip it. it. This thing is just the biggest flyer. As I've been saying over and over and over again during this game, the ground is just an utter mess. Like, neither player is going to have meaningful attacks on the ground through the end of this game. So we, the real fight is in the air, which means we definitely want to kill the Bird Admirer. I can't send the Nebelgeist Intruder because they can block the Abomination and put a counter on it. But I can send the other two because if they trade with one of those, that removes their last flying or reach creature and opens up uh, the air for the intruder and my other flyers. So I think the best we're going to do this turn as far as, you know, we're at 28. We're not worried about taking a little damage. We're not worried about, uh, you know, if they do attack back with like a four or five on the ground or something. We're only worried about pressuring them in the air at this point because we're up 14 life and the ground is a stalemate. Or, you know, if we take a few points of damage, we're at 28. So the way we best interact with that is by killing uh, the one four reach and attacking with these two. Because this thing puts a uh, plus one plus one counter on a creature, so they have a 3-3 three, three flyer. So I can't send the 2-1, but if they want to trade their 3-3 three, three flyer for my 4-3 here, or 3-3 three, three flyer, I'm really happy about that. It clears the way out for the uh, little flyer to start attacking, and for the other one of these two flyers to keep attacking on subsequent turns. 
Because this Falcon Abomination is going to be able to grow into like a 5-5 flyer by next turn if they want. Because they have the Hound Tamer. So basically they probably should take the 7 here and we're just getting 7 damage. But if they block, that's good for us. And if they take 7, that's good for us. So we can't know whether it's better for them to block or not. But we know attacking is good for us. Because if they block, we're happy. If they take it, we're happy. So clearly attacking is good. Okay, so now their flyer is bigger than ours, so we don't have an attack. So our choice is Abomination, Gale Drifter, or Organ Hoarder. If we Organ Hoarder, how many cards do we have to interact with their one flying creature? We have a Candle Trap. Silverbolt's not really going to work. We have a Borrowed Time. So we have two clean outs, basically. We have a 19-card deck, and we see three cards. And we'll see a fourth by next turn. That seems pretty good. So I think there's more value in organ hoardering to try and hit those two cards than there is in uh, bringing another 2-2 flyer in play. If I hit Candle Trap, I can play the planes and attack this turn. If not, um, which of these is better? Do I want the Farm Hand or the Dawn Guard? If I hit the other removal spot, I just play the Land and Pass. Um, what does this do when it flips? Look at the top four. You can put a creature with three or less into your hand. And this is a 3-3 lifelink. So they're both 3-3s, three and this has the ability to find more creatures. I don't think I'm lifelink has any value for me. I guess the planes is not useless, because I have so I've drawn so few lands this game, which is a good thing. Like I've been really lucky to draw this many spells. But still, this ability seems better. Like it might tutor up a creature. But basically, we have candle trap and uh, Borrow Time as clean outs to their flyer. And then I also have Devoted Graph Keeper, which if I play that, and then I play like uh, something from the graveyard, I can then tap their only flyer. So we have a few cards we're looking for in our 16 card deck here. You don't really want to think like that, y'alls, because uh, it could also get you one card closer to your removal. Dawn Guard, assuming you're not, like, digging through your deck, stacking, you know, effectively, like, going through your whole library, just, like, if you're just randomly milling four cards or randomly putting four cards on the bottom, that doesn't increase or decrease your chances of finding your removal. It's just neutral. That said, we haven't found our removal yet, so we don't have an attack, so what do we want to do? Um, are they just going to deck? Like, do they have a way to close? They have seven cards left in their deck, and we're at 29. Um, I don't know. Either way, probably want to just put as much out as I can. And I want this out in case they pass and it flips or something, or I decide to pass and flip it. And either way, I'm only getting two power worth of flying out this turn, whether I bring back Gale Drifter or play Abomination. So this line actually just seems pretty clear. If I really want to try and swarm in the air, I could also send my two little uh, ground creatures that turn into flyers, my 1-1 one, one life gainer here, Lunark Veteran, and my Bait Hook Angler. They'll just eat both of them, and then I can just play them again as one power flyers, and then I can alpha with all my flyers. So that's an option too, but they're at five cards in hand. I mean, I don't necessarily want to even make aggressive plays like that. Like, I'm winning in the air, and I'm decking them. Okay, so I just want to block this, but they can put counters on it. How many? Two. They have eight mana. So if they put two counters on it, they might even be dead. So I'm not, like, scared they'll do that, but it can, it's a six, seven that can become an eight, nine. The bait hook angler, I would like rather die than stay alive. So let's say I block with that for two. I need to put another seven power on it. So I can do that. I don't have any four power creatures, but let's see if I have creatures I don't care about. Like I kind of want this veteran to die. I'm at 32 and it can turn into a one flyer. So that's three, six, nine. That looks pretty good, actually. The downside is they don't have to spend any mana, and I still lose all the creatures, though. So maybe it makes more sense to put some things with more toughness. I think this is good. Maybe not. Is this opening me up on the ground too much? Maybe I just should just chump with the 2-1 and then bring it back. I mean, I do want to kill their stuff because decking them is a very real path to victory. They have five cards left in their deck. So I am going to have to block that again next turn. But I also might just win in the air or whatever. So I have six mana. My flying situation is three, five, seven. So no way I'm doing anything in the air right now. So it looks like...
Let's see. Yeah, it doesn't look like much is happening as far as combat. I think we're just putting stuff out. Um, we definitely want to get the Sun Gold Sentinel in play because obviously we can sink mana into it to deal them damage now if we want to. So that leaves us four mana to work with. So, I mean, we can have an extra 1-2 flyer out, but I think we're better off just putting the Ritual Guardian in play. Oh, I forgot I could exile something. Do they have anything worth exiling? Maybe Devious Cover-Up in case they have another Devious Cover-Up so I can deck them. Because, like, even if they manage to not die to my flyers, they literally have five cards left in their deck, and I'm at 34 and counting. I don't know how they're going to win this game before they deck. Seems near impossible. I mean, they could have some random card that reshuffles their whole graveyard in or something like that. But they have four cards. I'm at 34, and the board is about even. They can counter their own spell, Axel. Obviously, like, that's a good play if they're going to deck, not to let them counter your spell, to make them counter their own spell, but they still don't literally deck. Unless they rewrote the card and changed the tax, but you used to be able to counter your own spell with it. Okay, so they're attacking with two, three, threes, a four, four, and a six, seven. Again, we want to make blocks if they're relatively profitable. Obviously, we can afford to take whatever damage we want. Um, so, what are our blocks look like? We know they have the ability to pump twice. Not three times, right? Five, eight, nine, ten, eleven. This adds two from graveyard, only one for ability. So one, two, five. Yeah, so it looks like they have two pumps. Yeah, I mean, I just don't need to take a bunch of damage and make risky alphas. Like, they have four cards left in their deck. Like, decking them is a much safer path to victory than trying risky alphas. I'm not unwilling to try alphas, but I'd rather just make a bunch of blocks. Like, they can only pump twice... So, like, if I make a bunch of profitable blocks, it can't really go that bad for me. Um, does, what does this thing do? It only grows during their upkeep, so that's a good one to kill. So if we put six on that, that's pretty good. I could also attack them with all the flyers and the one unblockable creature and potentially just lethal them. So I'm not going to block with any flyers, but ground creatures are super disposable right now. Um, so let's say I put, like, this and this there. That's an excellent block. If they want to double, if they want to pump, they can kill both. Theirs is dying. And then let's say on the 3-3 three, three token, I put, like, a 3-2 and, like, a 2-3. That looks good, too, right? If they double pump, they can kill both. Their creature still dies. And then do I have any other profitable blocks? I can do, like, 3-2... And like one, two. And if they want to double pump that, I guess they get me there, but then they don't get me anywhere else. That seems fine. Oh, right. When this creature dies, then they the shuffling cards. Yeah. Good reminder not to attack into the ghostly castigator unless it's extremely profitable into the covetous castaway. Because then they can bring back the three, four. And then they can shuffle in three more good cards. I'd still be a big favorite to deck them, but. There's no reason to let them do that unless it's unless I'm going for the win in some good spot or something. No, they know it already mills. What, well, what they're saying is like when the back half of this end... Like, let's say I trade with the castaway. Oh, but it mills three cards. So once they have three cards in their deck, if I kill the castaway, they just die. Like on my turn, if the castaway blocks. Okay, anyways, they played another flyer, so they have two flying blockers, right? Or no, just one. They didn't. What am I saying? So they can block my biggest flyer, which is three, which means they take two... Four, seven, which is not 11. So I think we still are chilling. Obviously, I'll hit them for three because I don't need this back to block. And that might put them in alpha range. But other than that, I don't think we're in a position to attack. I know I'm saying and doing like some different things at once. Like I'm like, oh, our most likely path to winning is decking them. But then I'm still attacking them here with uh, my Sun Gold Sentinel instead of having it up to block and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm playing for multiple angles. We don't know for sure whether they're going to have a way to shuffle cards back in or something like that. I'm at 30. I don't need one extra 3-2 blocker. If they make an alpha, I'll kill them on the backswing. And 
I might be able to just kill them in the air by hitting them with the Sun Gold Sentinel and attacking with all the flyers. I do have four flyers to their one. So I'm playing I'm playing for both angles, frankly, just because we can. And sometimes those two angles come in conflict with each other, and we're trying to get the best of both. Okay, so what are my profitable blocks? Again, 6, 9, 11. They have two pump. Well, actually, that other creature's gone, so they have 10 mana, but either way, they have two pumps. Um... I don't want to block with flyers. I would happily bury the veteran at this point to bring out another flyer. So I can do stuff like 3-2 and 3-2, and then I need to put more power. That's not going to work. So I think I want to just double block. And then I'll put the veteran now on the 6-7, save the big damage, and... Uh, bring it back as a flyer. I'm out of creatures to play, basically. Remember, I still have those two removal in my deck, too. In my 13-card deck, I have a Candle Trap and a Borrowed Time. And if I draw one of those, I get rid of the Feral Falcon Abomination, and then it's just an easy lethal. Well, slightly less easy. Okay, so they have two Flying Blockers and are effectively at five. So if I attack with all the Flyers, they eat one trade with one, and go to one. I can make that same attack next turn, and it's only getting better. So I think this is, again, just... Hit them for three, keep chilling. Do they have anything profitable to get rid of? Anything with flashback? No. I don't know. I don't think these cards super matter. I'm just going to get rid of that, because it's like the scariest looking card. Foolproof logic by a, by a Hall of Fame pro. What's the scariest looking card? Get rid of that one. So again, I think they're pretty dead in the air, but they also have two cards in their deck. So, you know, we're trying to live the best of both worlds. Um... What happens if they kill this and it mills three? Then they can play the Castigator and shuffle three back in. I mean, there's pretty much no reason to do that. I can just put something on it. What are they attacking with here? So the six, seven. I don't want to block with any flyers. So I have like one, one, two to block with then. Okay, so I'm just going to chump the six, seven. Because there's no way they're lethal in me with the other creatures. And I don't want to block with any of my flyers. I think like we're probably just going to be able to all attack for the win pretty safely now. They have two flying blockers, so they can block like a three and a two and a three and a two. And then they take like two, five, six, seven, and die. Good stuff. And we're cracking the top 100 if we get another win. Okay, let's see. Pretty good hand. I think I recognize the name Clug as well. I'm not sure if they're a streamer or maybe, uh, well, you pretty much have to be a streamer, but if they play in the sweatsuit or something, I don't know. I just recognize the name. Um, okay, so we have two drop, three drop. I don't really want to trade Sun, Sun Gold Sentinel for their Timberland Guide, so it might be a good opportunity to hold that. 
I can play the bait hook angler or the farmhand then, and I think it makes sense to play the angler since it interacts profitably with the Timberland guide and the farmhand doesn't. And actually, this can't work out bad curve-wise because worst case scenario, if I didn't draw land on turn four, I can go farmhand, get a planes, play it, and play the sentinel. So whereas we were actually kind of caught between a rock and a hard place a couple games ago when I talked about whether to play the farmhand or not to hit land four, this time it's a super clear choice. We just play the two-drop bait hook angler that interacts with their two-drop better because if we didn't draw land four, we just get to use all four mana on turn four, and that's going to be very profitable, even if slightly less profitable than playing Gale Drifter. No real decisions here. Let's get our flyer going. I guess if they attack with the 4-4, I do have to decide if I block with both or not since mine comes back. I probably won't. The, Dawn, the Dawn Guard trigger is pretty good. Next turn, I can play the Farmhand and Coven, so that's pretty sweet. And then after that, I can play the Sun Gold Sentinel with Coven and a bunch of mana open. But that's getting a little ahead of myself. Let's see what they have here. Okay, well, that actually doesn't mess up those plans at all. So I think what I want to do now is play the Farmhand. In case they block the Angler with the Guide, I want to play it first, because my plan is to flip it. This thing's not a wolf or a werewolf, right? It's a beast, so I can't silver bolt it. So I think here... Now, I'm definitely going to attack, because this is a good trade for me. But I needed to play the farmhand first, so I could coven it while I have a two-power creature in play. Oh, Clug does alters. Yeah, that, that could be where I've heard the name. That makes sense. Well, now I feel extra pressure to win. I mean, I'm really bad at art, so I'm sure Clug crushes me at any alters or any art, so I've got to at least win the game of draft, right? Okay. That play was not by any stretch necessarily wrong. They can't just sit around taking three a turn, but pretty aggressive. Um... Oh, wait. Yeah, that's real. They could just pass the turn and then play one of these, right? And then it would go to Knight. So, yeah, that was a bad play. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm always one to try and think about why somebody would do something, but that doesn't really make any sense, right? It's already day, so they could just pass the turn and then it becomes Knight, and then they could just play one of these on my turn to kill it and still have the other one in their hand. So, that, that play actually doesn't make much sense. Um, okay, so I'm not against candle trapping the 4 4. But I also could save it for something that blocks flyers. But that seems unlikely. They're at one card in hand. Plus they have seven mana. Make another 4-4. Four, four. So I think we just dump our stuff now. Oh yeah, we can actually get rid of the other 4-4 four, four too. Still stand by the killing the 4-4 four, four beast with Candle Trap this turn. But maybe I should have waited. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they forgot they could wait. Like, I think they probably focused on... And I do this sometimes. This is exactly the kind of play where I'll make a bad play, the same, the double midnight ambush. Because what will happen is I'll be deep in the tank in my head on is it worth using these two ambushes to kill this 3-3, three, three, and I'll miss that I could just, like, pass and then only use one. Because it's a difficult decision. Like, if you imagine they couldn't pass tonight then whether they make that play or not is really close and hard, right? It's not an unreasonable play to use two cards that give minus two, minus two to kill a three, three lifelink. But, it, it, you know, it's probably wrong, but it could be right in the right circumstances. So what will happen is you'll tunnel on should I use both of these on that card or not, think through that decision for like 30 seconds, decide, yeah, it's just barely worth it, but I think it's worth it, and miss something like, you know, that's better. So yes, I do think that was just a mistake that they should have passed and waited. But it's, it, that's probably how it happened, and I frequently make mistakes that same way, where I tunnel on like a difficult decision, and then I'll just, I'm missing something else that's obvious. Okay, so anyways, I want to attack with the Sentinel so I can remove the flashback card. I, ha I don't have Coven, but I will after I play this. I obviously don't care if they double block, so there's no reason to use the Coven ability pre-combat. So let's just get rid of the uh, flashback card. They can double block if they want, and then I'll just give it pro white. Oh, wait, that's not what it does. I'm so I keep forgetting that's not what it does. Sorry, but that said, um, I also forgot they had the candle trap creature. Okay, I gotta stop thinking about the Olivia's Midnight Ambush and get back in this game. So for now, whatever. If I had paid the three pre combat and attack, they would just double block. 
I had the silver bolt up so they couldn't double block anyway. I don't know if I realized that without thinking about it or not. But uh, for now, I'm not going to silver bolt that and I'm not going to do anything. We'll just pass the turn and then I can camel trap. I can pay the three on the coven on camel trap and get rid of that end of their turn. But yeah, so as far as what was actually right on my turn, I probably just shouldn't have attacked because that was a free block. Um, but I don't think I want a sun gold white or green, white and green to get in the three. I probably want to just end of turn can't get rid of the candle trap four four, and now I can on tap sun bolt the sentry and they're dead. You know, fellow Joey, I don't understand that because it's not like streamers don't make tons of mistakes. Like you know, not that it would ever be right to be unnecessarily mean. But, you know, who's making fun of opponents for mistakes? I make mistakes every single draft. You know, like, every time you'll watch me, there's at least one mistake every five, six games. Like, probably more than that, but at least, you know, one glaring one. Magic's really hard. Like I said, you know, earlier, talking about the design for complexity, in my opinion, there's no reason to protect people from feeling bad because they missed an onboard ability or something. Let's just all not feel bad about making mistakes, playing the hardest strategy game ever, that people who are you know, pretty smart and started playing 25 years ago and are some of the best in the world at the game still make constant mistakes because the game is so hard. You know what I mean? Like my perspective is let's all just embrace that our opponents make bad plays. We make bad plays. Pros make bad plays. Amateurs make bad plays. The game is really, really hard. And then let's just, let's study the strategy and the, the decision-making to try and make as few bad plays as possible with the understanding we'll never play perfect. That's like my life magic philosophy my overview okay so clearly we're going to keep this even though we don't have an island we've got three cards we can cast hopefully we'll draw an island by turn four It's not like a great hand. We don't have a two drop either, but I mean, I would just never even think about mulliganing something like this on the play where I can cast three of my four spells and make my first three land drops. Hey, and for that victory, we got number 69. So that's a special accomplishment I've heard. Okay, we don't have any attacks. Clearly, a 3-3 interacts more profitably than a 3-2 against a 2-2. Plus, if they don't have anything to play and it gets the flip, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it is even much harder doing the spoon when streaming. I definitely make a lot more mistakes in my content than I do when playing, like, in a Pro Tour. But let me be clear and honest, I make plenty of mistakes playing in the Pro Tour too. Like, even when you're fully focused and not making content, Magic's still the hardest game ever. <laughs> okay, so I got my card. I didn't get an island. I um, think I'll attack. Like, maybe they have something, maybe they don't. There's not, like, a ton. And if they do play something and kill the Dawn Guard, I won't be happy about it. But it's really, like, it's not going to trigger again anytime soon. Like, I'm not double spelling, and I have no reason to believe they are. So I don't think I want to be missing this damage. Like, you know, if they showed me a pump spell, I wouldn't attack. But in the event where they don't have one, I'm giving up three damage. And in the event where they do have one, I'm trading Dawn Guard for a pump spell. And now that I've already triggered it by going to Knight, and I don't have mana, and I'm not double spelling anytime soon, it's probably not triggering again. So trading my 3-3 for their, anytime soon anyway, so trading my 3-3 for their pump spell is not that big of a deal. What is this card? Investigate if the spell is cast from your graveyard, investigate twice instead. Fair enough. I mean, if you have a lot of self mill, sure, but I don't really think that's a great card. Um, okay, so I don't want to trade my 3-3 for their 3-2. I don't want to trade my 3-2 with an ability for their 2-2. So now it looks like we've got nothing. Come on, Arena. Don't mess up the 7-0 by not giving me an island ever. Let's go. All right, at least we're online. A few turns too late for definitely to be, you know, enough, but now we got a chance. So 
I guess we're just going to start by putting out flyers. I mean, I can play, I can hit Coven if I play this one, but that's not going to do anything for me right now because I can't attack with a 3 2 this turn. Double spelling would be really good to flip that 6 6 over and trigger the Dawn Guard. I guess I can do that if I draw an island and can't if I don't. Do I want to double block with two 3 3s? Three I mean, they're not doing a whole lot, the 3 2 and 3 3 right now. And that creature has vigilance. Probably should. I mean, they didn't have a trick on turn three, but that was like 80 turns ago. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a blowout, but also not really, because these ground creatures aren't doing a whole lot. I can definitely put out other ones. Not really sure whether I double block the 6-6 six, six here with my 3-2 three, and 3-3 three, three or not. I probably shouldn't, because if I flip it back today, I'll get a Dawn Guard trigger, and then I won't lose both creatures on a double block. And all I have to do to flip it back today is draw an island, which I have, you know, seven of in my deck, or a white card that costs three or less, which I also have a lot of. So I'm on, like, two or silver bolt for that. So that's four, five, six. I'm on seven. I'm on and seven islands. So I'm on 14 outs out of 27 cards to be able to make it night next turn. So about 50%. Oh, yeah, I can also hit the island off Hoarder. You're right. Yeah, so it's actually way higher than that. That said, um, is that what we're doing? Yeah, I guess we don't really have anything else super productive. So hopefully, we didn't get it, but hopefully we'll get it off of this. Or a one drop. If we get a silver bolt, that works too. We have like two of those and two candle traps. All right, so no decisions here except do we want to attack and offer that trade? I don't see any real reason to do that. For example, if we bring back a, a disturbed creature, we can tap their blocker and then get in damage. Thanks, Tazy Lurtle. Kind of looks like a turtle shell on my face, right? And I am I did grow it because I'm lazy and I got sick of shaving. So, I would hope a lazy turtle can respect it. Uh, I don't want to even, even attempt archetype arc rankings. I mean, you know, I've done around 20 drafts. I've drafted each deck a couple times. A lot of archetype rankings are really, like, misinformation in this day and age because there's so much, like, metagaming, basically. Like, you know, like... Like, we, like, day two, blue-black is just an obvious good synergy deck, so, and, but it wasn't being drafted enough, so that deck is, you know, the bomb to draft. But then let's say five drafters are drafting blue-black in every pod three days later, blue-black could be awful to draft. So, like, I, I don't really love archetype rankings, especially in the information age. I'm all about, like, kind of trying to understand the different decks as many as I can, the ones that are good, try and figure out which ones are not good to avoid. You know, I'm not above, like, I'll avoid the worst archetype or two in the format. Some color combinations just don't come together well. But generally speaking, you know, the best color pair, the second best color pair, the third best color pair, the fourth best color pair are all going to make better decks if they're underdrafted than the best color, the, the individual best archetype is going to be if it's overdrafted. Okay, so what do we want to do? They're making a really aggressive attack, so I feel like they must have something. We have a lot of life, so we have some wiggle room. Um, the gatekeeper is better on the other side, so maybe we want to block with it. Like 2-1 on 3-2 just to say is a good trade. And then we can just see if they have anything and take eight. I think this is probably correct. I mean, they might play that plus one, plus one and fight something. Like they play a duel for dominance, but then I guess their creature will still die. So this seems fine. The problem is this thing has vigilance. So like I'm not successfully attacking on the ground. Um. All right. The intruder probably looks the best. Maybe I want the sifter. Um, I have like Gale Drifters to discard. No, I want the I want the intruder here. Okay, so we have infinite resources, so we want to make trades. We don't want to race. We still don't have removal. I can double spell and flip that back. Can I do that? Yes. Just bring out like three one flyer and two two flyer. That looks pretty good. I don't have any attacks then, but that's fine. We go back to day, which means I get a Dawn Guard trigger, and their brawler becomes small again. Plus, I'm not I'm barely even falling behind here. I'm, I'm gaining all this life because of the Lunark veteran.
So still no attacks. That didn't really change much. It wasn't like bad for them or anything, but. And then, yeah, we'll take that. So I will trade my 3-1 for their 3-2. I'm looking to play a grindy game. They're also down to two cards, so I think I'm getting to the point where I'll just trade my two 3-2s for their 5-6 if they attack. Maybe they have something, but I'm going to be able to furnish more blockers at this point. And honestly, maybe they have something, maybe they don't. Okay, well, now they're attacking a 2-2 and a 3-3, so now I believe they're way more likely to have something than don't. Um, the Dawn Guard's not switching back yet. So I think that we can block the 2-2 Timber Guide with the uh, Dawn Guard here and find out what they have. And then I'll also put the 3-1 on the 3-2. I know they can bring theirs back and I can't bring mine back, but they're up in life and I'm up in resources. Is there anything that pumps the whole team? Like, my plan is just to block all their creatures, and I'm assuming they have one trick to interact with positively somewhere, but is there anything that can really, like, you know, plus one, plus one to all their creatures out of these colors? Three plus one, plus one counters. So the three one would still kill the three two. And the three three, if they... They could put one counter on the tireless hauler and two on the guide and blow me out pretty bad. Maybe I should triple block the five six. And then just throw the three one on the three two. This looks better. I mean, they get two better creatures, but if I kill the 5-6, I'm really happy, and they have to have two tricks for that not to happen. And I don't even care about this little exchange. Like, if they minus 2-0 minus oh, the Soul Keeper or something, I don't care. I have more flyers to bring out to block their 3-2. I'm up so much in cards, what I'm mostly worried about is not, like, falling too far behind and accidentally losing before I can play all these amazing cards. If they didn't send the 2-2, I was getting to the point where I just didn't think they had anything, so I was going to probably block the 5-6 with my 2-3-2s. But clearly they have something, because they sent a 2-2 and a 3-3. Hopefully it's just that. I'm totally happy with their 3-2 eating my 1-1 one -one if this triple block goes well. Like I said, I can furnish more small flyers to block these. Okay, so I have 6 mana. If I can get Coven and attack, that would be really good. So I want to do that. Okay, so this looks good. So I can play the Silversmith. Counter on the Ritual Guardian, which will then be a 4-3 lifelink. And then I can't put the other counter on the Veteran, or it will turn off Coven again. Uh, with the remaining two mana... Oh, but that won't matter, because I am playing this. I can play the Sun Gold Sentry too. Okay, so I think it's... Silversmith, counter on Veteran and Ritual Guardian. Sun Gold Sentinel... Then I've got two, three, and four. And then I can go to combat and attack with both my creatures, my Lunark Veteran and my Ritual Guardian, which will have lifelink if they don't have anything. And they almost certainly can't have anything because they would have used it in combat last turn. So, like, we can pretty much safely assume they don't have a trick. Like, they could have a counter spell or something. I mean, they obviously don't because they would have countered some, some of the stuff I played. But they could have had, like, a counter spell, but they basically can't have a combat trick because they would have just played it in combat last turn. So now we get a nice attack. I mean, they could have like a flash creature or something like that. Lifelink is so good. Uh, I mean, I don't think I really need the counter on the Sentinel. It already can make itself unblockable. Um, I'm much more interested in turning that Lunark Veteran into something that can attack or block. A 1-1 one, one was basically a blank on this board. Like, I know that I could have attacked for one this turn either way, but a 1-1 one, one was basically a blank, whereas they only have a 2-2, two, two, a 2-1, two, and a 3-2, so now it's an attacker. Sentinel's also just not really a great target for stuff like that because it's already able to attack and block. So, like, you're, if you're speeding up your clock by a turn in a tight race or something, then, then it could have value. But there's not a lot of value in, like, enhancing your creature that already can attack profitably. It's the same concept as with the red-white uh, gold rare, how I was saying, like, yeah, they're tapped. I could get in a nice hit right now, but my creature can attack anyway, so I'd rather add something else to the board. And then when they play something big enough to prevent me from attacking, that's when I want to use it. So they can't prevent the sun gold from attacking profitably because of its ability, its coven. So I really want to enhance other creatures that might be blanked. Okay, so here I think I'm going to Candle Trap away the Flyer. It's a great target to exile. And then I still have enough mana to use Nebelgeist Intruder. So this is just almost a scripted turn. Just going to attack with everything. Honestly, I'm even just going to let them block the Sun Gold. Uh, now, I'm going to try an Intruder whatever blocks it. So, I mean, they're not going to get to kill it unless they have an answer for that. But, 
again, it's just not of that much importance to me. I'm up so much in resources. What I really want to do is just swing the board. I want to make sure I don't accidentally get lethaled out. Remember, I have these three cards in my hand. This this card comes back from the dead. This card draws another card. And I have three cards in the dead I, in the graveyard already I can bring out as creatures. So basically, the only way I lose this game is, is them sneaking in damage. It's not because they two for one me. It's not because I make a trade down. I just can't let them sneak in lethal. Hey, they had that exact card we talked about. I wonder if that triple block won us this game. If we would have went with the double block, if they had the defend then, which I don't know if they did or didn't, they could have blown us out. But since we triple block, defend didn't really do anything. They could have played it there, but they would have just killed one more of our creatures and theirs would have still died. Whoever's called this card, good job. Because this card was definitely not on my mind and I was thinking about double blocking. You might have just won us this game and kept the 7-0 uh, potentially alive. Okay, so what are we doing here? The Flyer has a profitable attack regardless. We don't have anything on the ground into the 6-6 six, six unless we find removal, so let's look for it. Oh, no, they have the 5-5 five, five anyway, so we're not going to have anything on the ground regardless. So let's just get more Flyers. Um... Favorite archetype so far? I don't know. I've drafted a lot of different decks. Like I said, I mostly go in with the mindset of trying to learn, not trying... Like, I'm trying to win, but I'm trying to learn how to win, like, over the long run. Not, like, get the win that match or that draft, even. During the first couple drafts, you know, like, obviously, like, you know, you're trying to do both at the same time. But, like, especially early in a format, I'm really trying to explore and learn all the archetypes and all of that when I'm drafting. So I stay open, like, to the max. So I, I don't really have, I drafted like a ton of different color combinations so far. And like, you know, I've had each one like two or three times. So like, I don't even really have a favorite deck. I mean, I agree that blue black is excellent. I think blue red, blue, I think black red probably makes a really good hyper vampire aggro deck. I think white is a pretty aggressive color where Coven can make it pretty easy to keep attacking. Kind of like Exert did in a Monquette for white. I think Coven functions similarly to that. Um... So you can use, like, Zombies, Blue Black, Vampires, Black Red, White Aggro Coven decks. And then Green, I think, is mostly about exploiting werewolves because they're really big, really fast. So you want to do the Daybound, Nightbound thing well and have good werewolf synergy and stuff. But I'm not 100% on exactly, like, you know, I have no idea how to rank them. And again, on Arena, there's so much content information I feel like, you know, the formats get real warped by that. Like, everybody's connected. Like, everybody playing ranked in Mythic. Like, maybe not if you're playing, you know, like, in, like, you know, Bronze or whatever. But, like, everybody playing, like, Diamond and Mythic on the ladder is, like, on Twitter or on YouTube or on Twitch or watching videos. So, I feel like, you know, for example, I remember in Call Time, this was the most pronounced I've ever seen. Because Call Time was functionally a two-deck format. There was variations on green control and variations on, like, red-white hyper-aggro. Like, maybe sometimes you went, like, red-black or whatever, but it's the same deck. <laughs> or similar. Similar. It's, it's functioning similarly. And anyways, I remember people were just like, Snow is overdrafted and not that good, and they were right, but then, like, everybody was drafting aggro, and the, you were tabling Bergstriders, and the Snow decks were bonkers, and, like, you know, I was going, like, 7-2 and 7-1 left and right with Lindworms and Bergstriders. But then, of course, more people started drafting Snow again, and it kind of found its balance. So, like, you know, when you ask the question, like, what's the best archetype, what's the second best archetype? Are you asking to win your next arena draft, like, at this point in time? Are you asking if draft had hit its perfect balance? Are you, you know, like, I, it's a really complex thing. And the only thing I would say is don't tunnel. Be aware that magic is dynamic. Other, what's best depends on what the other people are doing. And just keep your eyes open and don't tunnel. Um, so if I attack the 2-1, I trade with the 1-1. That's not great. I can pump it into a 3-2 later. Seems like we just play our 3-3 and pass the turn. Like, my advice would be try and learn how to draft as many color combinations as well as possible. By all means, avoid the ones that are horrible and prioritize the ones that are better a little bit. Weight them. 
But like, try and learn, especially at the start of formats, try and learn how to use all of the cards synergistically so that when the best color combinations are being overdrafted in your pod, you can make great use out of the other colors and draft the best deck. Like you want to, you want to have as many weapons in your arsenal as possible. That's how I view draft. It's not like I don't weight the better colors slightly. Like I, I don't force very often, but I like obviously if black red is the best deck, then I'm going to slightly prioritize black and red cards. But like you want to learn how to have multiple weapons in your arsenal because what if there's five red black players in your pod? So like that's how that's generally my approach. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to call it Coven and Coven, like, interchangeably. I'll try and get used to calling it Coven, but, you know. You know, if you watch me or Voxy stream, just understand you're learning how to say things wrong, not correctly. You might get good limited strategy from me and Voxy stream, but you're not going to get good pronunciation. I can promise that. Um, okay, so what are we doing? We can attack with a 3-3. They can trade with theirs. I think their two 3-3s are probably better than mine, so it's probably a fine exchange. If I make it a 4 4 first, they can still double block it. So that's not very exciting. I'm, I guess if I pump both, I could then attack with uh, both. And if they want to double block the Dawn Guard with the Candle Grove and the Trope, then I could kill the Candle Grove, which would be really good for me. So I think I can make this aggressive play. I'm not really sure if this is right or not. I mean, if they put the two 1 1s on the 3 2, that's like even ish because the 3 2 comes back. If they trade off the trope or the candle grove witch for the dawn guard, I'm happy about that, but not like ecstatic. I feel like I can swing the race back, given I have a life linker and a candle trap, so I can double spell and kill something, like pr at least prevent it from attacking, if not blocking, if I want to switch gears. So I'm not sure about this aggressive line. Obviously, I can't block those now. We'll see what they do. The trope's pretty good if it's going, though. They're basically getting two free power and toughness a turn. So I need this game to be a race that ends quickly. Although I guess now I can candle trap and remove the witch. Or the trope. Not both, obviously. And I'll probably remove the witch because it's scarier that they're making a 1-1 a turn than getting a plus one, plus one counter a turn. Though both are bad for me. But let's say I pre-combat remove the witch. Well, I don't really need to do it pre- Oh, uh, well, it, it could open an attack with a 2-3, but it doesn't because they have a 3-3. Three, three. So I don't really need to do it pre-combat because if they block with it, I'll be pretty happy. So I think here we're looking to like candle trap the witch and then just exile it to deny one ones or play organ hoarder. Probably play organ hoarder since the three twos are really good blocker. So maybe I don't even, well, I'm going to candle trap because I have the spare mana, I think, post-combat anyway. Is silversmith better? I can pump this into a three three and then it has an attack. And then the other counter goes on itself, so it's a good blocker. Yeah, that looks pretty good, actually. So I'm going to keep being aggressive. I think I lose the long game this time. I'm not sure that I'm going to win the short game, but I definitely lose the long game. Given they have Tapper and two free 1-1s a turn, I can cut it down to one, but I mean, they still have the other one. So I think I want to be aggressive. Even if they accidentally sneak in lethal, I expect I would lose this game to the Tapper and the free 1-1s like in the long run anyway. Now I'm going to put the Candle Trap on the one I'm going to want to remove more since these two creatures are the same size. And now I have a block. If they want to tap and hit me, they can, but then they're using two mana tapping main phase. This is a pretty tight game, I think. Like, I'm not feeling great. Like, I think I'm an underdog, but I think there are paths to victory. Yeah, I didn't even think about that I cut myself off from Coven. That might not have been great. Okay, but they still have to tap my creature if they want to attack. They'll get in a ton of damage, but their creatures don't have Vigilance except this 3-3 that they really don't want to block with. I guess they get a 1-1 token in a turn. So if they don't attack with the 1-1, they can hit me for 9 and then have, like... The 3-3 three, three, and the two one ones. Oh, yeah, it gets flying from Coven, so they can also just hit me for three. That's pretty good. 
Yeah, I didn't even think about that, Zupol. It might change the play. I'm not sure, because like putting the counters where I did produced a lot of value. But it might have been it, it might have been wrong. I didn't even think about the fact that it changed, that it uh cut me off from coming. Okay, so I can organ hoarder and try and find the other candle trap. Can't really do much. If I go to combat, I can attack profitably with well, I can't yeah, I can attack profitably with the 4-4 because they can't block with the witch, and then if they double block with a 3-3 and a 1-1, whatever, and they can't block with the two three threes, or I kill the trope, which is fine. So I'll probably just do that and play Gale Drifter. Um, this is not actually going well. Maybe Gale Drifter doesn't even block their flyer because it's a 4-4, four, four, not a 3-3. Three, three. Maybe I just play Organ Hoarder and try and find Candle Trap. Yeah, I think I have to play Organ Hoarder. I'm not going to die in the backswing, am I? If they tap something and I have two blockers, three blockers, so I have two after they tap something, then I can block two of these and take six. Yeah, it's not lethal on board. So I'm going to attack with the 4-4, still trying to sneak in that damage. and play. But I'm going to play the Organ Hoarder, not the uh, Gale Drifter, because I'm going to look... I have another candle, whatever it's called, or borrow time for next turn. Another candle trap, that's good. So now I can slap that on the 4-4 flyer again. That's a, that makes this a lot more manageable as far as trying to race. That was a pretty good peel. I'm not... I'm still probably an underdog, but... Like, I do have the Devoted Graph Keeper, so I can bring out a 2-2 Flyer and tap something that way with the uh, Graph Keeper's ability. And then maybe have, like, some creatures that can attack. And then maybe I can, like, sneak in a lethal or something. Well, this is the game we wanted for 7-0, right? If we get this one, we earn that 7-0, that's for sure. Opponent just making an extra 1-1 one, one and getting an extra 1 plus 1 plus 1 counter the whole game. This is an extremely, extremely good game of Magic. Like, if I lose, I'm still super happy I played this game. I mean, 7-0s are pretty rare, so I'm always a little disappointed when they, you know, don't happen towards the end. But uh, this this was this was epic. Like, I, I, it's like, what, turn 10, 11? I have no clue if I'm going to win or lose this game. I think I'm probably, like, 40% to win or something. Okay, so what can we do? We don't have Coven. We can get it by bringing the 2-2 out, 2-2 flyer from the yard. Then we won't have the mana to activate it, but we can tap something. So if they have one good blocker, like that 3-4 that's really stopping us, I can tap that by playing the Gale Drifter from the graveyard, and then I can go to combat. Remember, their 4-4 is Candle Trapped, so it's a free block, but it's not going to eat anything of mine. And if they don't have Pump, it's pretty hard for them to kill me on the backswing. I just need to have one open up blocker. That said, because of the ward, they can't tap the Dawn Guard, so it could be right to send just that. Um, because they can't really free block it, because then they'll lose their 1-1 one, one maker. I could send other things, but the first thing I send, they get a free block on. So, like sending two creatures, like Dawn Guard and Graph Keeper, let's say, doesn't make sense. Because, I, because the Candle Witch can't block the Dawn Guard, basically. So it just gets a free block on the Graph Keeper anyway. So the only way it's right, it's not right to send two creatures, basically. Dawn Guard has a profitable attack. Now I could send three creatures, and then I have two up. That's acceptable. I'm not dead on board, but that doesn't seem like much better. So I think we just send Dawn Guard and let them chump with a 1-1 one, one, or double block with a 1-1 one, one and a 3-3 three, three, or whatever. I mean, this wasn't a bad turn cycle. We didn't take any damage. We got a flyer out, and now we have Coven. So next turn, I can remove their Candlegrove Witch, and they no longer get free 1-1s. One Still not saying that means we're going to win this game by any stretch. Uh, like I said, this is a pretty packed board. They've got a Tapper. They just played another flyer. They're getting a free plus 1 plus 1 a turn. But that does change things in a profitable way for us. We can now start connecting in the air, and they lose their 1-1 one, one Chump Blocker that they've been making every turn. Hey, you're welcome, Stork. Thanks for playing. Okay, so I think now that we have seven mana, pretty straightforward. We really want to play Gale Drifter and remove their blocker here. Um, don't think I'm likely to attack with anything besides the Flyer, assuming they tap the 4-4. Four, four. So I'm going to go to combat. If they attack, if they tap the Whale Drifter, 
If they if they tap the Dawn Guard, I'm definitely attacking with just Whale Drifter. If they if they tap the Whale Drifter, am I attacking with anything? So trades with their 3-3 three, three Flyer, 3-3 three, three Trope Creature are good for me. So it feels like I should be making an attack now. What happens if I just send, like, everything? Can I die on the backswing? They have 3, 6, 9, 11, but they have to make some blocks, and I can play a blocker. Um, I could also play 2, but then I'm giving them a free block. So I think now I definitely want to do this, because I don't want to give them free blocks. And I can definitely send, like, more things profitably. I can't send the 3-2s into the 3-4, though. And if I send a 3-4, they can double block it, and it trades for a 1-1, one, one, which is a fairly small, which is not a great trade. But on the other hand, I'm, they're still getting a plus one, plus one a turn. Like, I still have to win through aggression. Um, I don't know that this is the turn for it, though. I guess Gale Drifter can block Candlegrove Witch, so I think I don't have an attack this turn. It's rough. But they're not making 1-1s, one, just getting counters, which is not good for me, but... Hopefully, we'll find a way to tap, like, to win in the air. Our blocks on the ground are fine. And they don't have any flying blockers. They have the Candlegrove Witch to attack, but I can block. That's not great. It's going to hit Gale Drifter. Yeah, good play by the opponent. That was a pretty bad one for me. Hey, nice run, Void. Well, I can't... Let's see. What are we going to do? I don't know. Thought I was looking okay again, but now that they killed the 3-2 uh, the flyer, I'm not feeling as good. So I can cast both my cards, and I pretty much have to. I don't have anything to play from the yard. I want something to play from the yard, potentially to tap the one good blocker. Um, I'm not dead this turn, though, in the air... Can't really attack profitably in the 4 or 5 unless I'm alphing, which I'm certainly not doing this turn. If I'm going to make a big attack, it's going to be next turn, because I'm going to have the life link, which I'm going to need to gain 3 life to stay alive from their Candle Grove Witch. So I think this turn, we're, we're clearly not attacking. If they don't tap the Whale Drift, the wall, what is it, Wall Drifter, Whale Drifter? Whale Drifter. If they don't tap the Whale Drifter, I'll attack with it, probably. I can't see how we have a ground attack otherwise this turn, though. Okay, well, now I don't know what I want to do. Actually, maybe I don't send the Well Drifter because I'm about to play a 2-2 flyer, so I have a double block on the Candle Grove. So do I want to deal two to take three back? Definitely not. So, all right, I'm chilling. I was expecting they were going to tap the Whale Drifter, in which case I had no attacks, clearly. I didn't actually think that they would tap a 3-4, but fine. I, have, I don't think I have a profitable attack either way, but this gives me a profitable block. It gives me the ability to double block their 3-3 three, three flyer with my 2-2-2 two, two, two flyers. Don't have anything. If they pass the turn, it goes to night. I get to trigger the Dawn Guard, and then I have my like turn to play things. That would be good. Just don't have any more spells. You're on exactly five lands. You had a stone nut draw. I've been fighting and fighting and fighting. My draw was very good, too. And by don't have anything, they play some rare. Hopefully this card's not busted. Okay, well, protection from werewolves, not a big deal. Tap to add mana. Oh, six mana, put a plus one plus one counter on all creatures. That could be problematic. I don't think that necessarily ends the game. I mean, it's a really powerful card. It could go on to win, but if we draw well over the next turn or two... Probably going to enter combat. I'm really hoping to draw something this turn. This is like the biggest key turn. Because if I can like tap or bounce or kill the morning patrol, I'm going to have a pretty good attack. If I can't do anything, then I may not. Um, so they have one, two, three, four. So I really want trades now before they're able to start pumping their whole team. So I definitely have to strongly consider attacks, especially if they get in damage and I'm not dead. This is too hard. There's like too much out. So I can hit them for four and plan to alpha next turn. Am I going to die on the ground? They have one, two. They can like, they have a lot of creatures and they're all going to get bigger. They have three, six. 
Gonna have like six ish attackers. I eh, have enough blockers. Think I hit them for four and play my flyer. My flyer blocks theirs. Is there any shot I'm dead? I have five, six blockers. They can like tap one. Then they can't activate this. I mean, they can get extra mana out of their creatures to activate this, but then those creatures aren't attacking. I don't think this can realistically leave me dead on board. I'm not 100%. But yeah, Gale Drifter I can happily block with because then I can play it as a tapper. And uh, it's going to be tight. Yeah. I still have no idea if I'm going to win or lose this game. What a game. Literally halfway through my deck. This is like turn 12 or something. And I, I think I'm somewhere around 50-50. I mean, this is a really scary ability. But they're not going to sit around giving plus one plus one every turn. Like, I can either kill them in the air over two turns. Or they kill me or on the ground with their creatures. But... If they don't have anything, they're dead. If they have plus three, plus three, I'm dead. This opponent's played really well, so I'm going to assume they have something here. But aren't they just dead in the air? Four isn't six. What do they have? Oh, they have mana from their creatures. No, they got me with Xaxes with the pump spell. <sighs> Sigh. There goes the 7-0. That was honestly one of the best games, though. That's probably going to go on to be the best game I play in this entire format, so can't really complain. I mean, I could have left one extra block flying blocker back as a chump if they tapped the Gale Drifter, but that's, like, ridiculous. Like, that two could easily have been lethal on the following turn. They have to have a pump spell or top deck it here at the end of the game. Good beats. Oh, cool. Um, well, this is going to be my last draft of the night at Mackie. So if you have a couple of minutes, can I finish this run where I'm 6-1? and one? So it ends with either two losses or one win, and then we'll do the uh, final cuts. Thank you, uh, Grango TV. Really appreciate that subscription. Yeah, they played really well. And yeah, they drew exactly six. And my hand was really good, too. So... Can't complain about that. That was just an awesome game. I wish they didn't draw or have the pump spell at the end. Would have been a super sweet way to 7-0 and close out. But like I said, we're 6-1, and that was a great game of Magic. Hopefully we'll get the seventh win this game. Looks like a good hand. And I had a good hand that game. You know, it's not like I got screwed or something. Like, that was just, you know, they had a good deck, a good hand, played well. Yeah, they drew well. I mean, they finished the game with exactly six lands and play on turn 20. But, like, you know, they played really tight as well. So, that's just a good game of Magic. Let's get the seventh win here, hopefully. Uh, Ephra. Look, it's 2021, okay? Like, anything that doesn't point exclusively in the direction that people want for politics is apparently, like, you know, just the worst evil of all kind. I don't know. I don't understand how people think. Anyways, Falcon Abomination, gain two. And back to you. Uh, what do I think of Corpse Cobble? Uh, if you have a lot of tutus to sack, but on, that's the one that sacks zombies with flashback, basically. Like, it sacks creatures to make a big thing with menace, and then it has flashback. I think it's probably not great, but situational cards get a lot better when you have, like, more resources to work with. Like, in the disturb, um, buyback format, flashback disturb format. And, like, so if you make a lot of zombie tokens, sack two of them. It's pretty powerful. You make like an 8-8 Menace. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably good if you can make enough zombies. Like if you're ma consistently making like multiple zombies a game every game, it's probably, you know, zombie decay tokens, then it's probably good enough.
Okay, so do we want to candle trap either of those? Not really. I don't really want to uh, silver bolt right now. If they sack the siege zombie to the awake awakener, I can always get it later with candle trap. I don't think I really have profitable uses for creatures in play. So the only reason to leave that out would be like if I was going to pump it because it has a profitable attack right now. Um, and I mean, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to put a silversmith counter on it. So I think this turn is basically just attack with the profitable attackers and then I'll play Ritual Guardian and pass. There's no need to silver bolt either of their creatures right now. Um, I'm not worried this will turn into a 4-4. I can always candle trap it. And I want to get my 3-2 lifelink in play so they can attack or block next turn. I assume this means they're going to go minus 2, minus 0. Oh. I just don't really care. They're killing a decay zombie token. Remember, I'm not saying their play is wrong. Like may maybe they want the uh, token out to sack to the Awakener. Maybe they want to cycle this because they don't have any more lands in hand. But that's basically them cycling it and gaining 2, I guess. Yeah, they didn't have to block. So again, we'll just see what happens. If they pass, I'll probably Candle Trap the Awakener so that I can attack. Blue Black's creatures are good, and they're, it's a really grindy deck, but they're, they don't have that many big things. Oh no, because then I can just Silver Bolt it in response, so I don't even have to do that. I can just go to combat, attack with the 3-2 Lifelink and the 2-2 Flyer. If they trade the Siege Zombie for the Guardian, fine. If they block and sack, I can Bolt in response. Okay, so they pass the turn. Not super unexpected because of the Awakener's ability. Hmm. This is actually pretty hard. What do I want to do? Like, I can attack and, like, let them block Ritual Guardian on Siege Zombie and just pass and let that trade happen. It's about an even trade, I would say, for me right now. They can't sack to the Awakener, really, while I have Silver Bolt up. I can't Silver Bolt the Zombie or something, because then they'll sack it to the Awakener. I'm happy to Silver Bolt the Awakener, especially now, because I have t that still leaves me two mana for the Graph Keeper. So I think that's the play... I mean, I don't have a ton of creatures right now, so I'm not super happy about trading off the Ritual Guardian, but I get my three life. I have a grindy Disturb deck. I mean, I have to assume I'll draw creatures. If I draw all lands, I'm not going to win this game whether the Ritual Guardian's in play or not. So if they're going to just sack the 2-2 Zombie here, I won't get the three life link or anything, but, I mean, I kill the Ecstatic Awakener. Seems good to me. Oh, no, I'm not saying their play is bad, Dr. Goldhead. It's just the question is, what can I do? What's the best thing I can do? And at this point, I think this is uh, my best option. Hopefully I'll mill a Gale Drifter or something. Well, or two lands. That's almost like drawing two cards. What line do you think is better, Rexus? Like, what did you want to do? Okay, so I would have definitely removed the Shady Traveler if I'd drawn a land this turn. 
Now I think I'd rather cast Gale Drifter, which means my only profitable attack is with the 3-2. Do I want to trade that for the Traveler or Zombie plus gain 3? I think the answer is yes. But they've been missing land drops galore. They could easily have another startle. So I think I'm probably just going to take this turn off rather than offer a, real, a relatively even trade. Obviously, I'm going to attack with the Abomination either way. But I don't think I want a Candle Trap. Until the Shady Traveler flips, it's just not like that scary of a card and Candle Trap costs one. I think the right play here is just not attack on the ground so they don't gain the ability to use another Startle profitably and just add another Flyer to the board. Because the opponents miss land drops, and they use that first startle basically to cycle it and gain two. So I feel like there's a decent chance they have another startle in hand. And they definitely have, like, all spells in hand. So we don't really want to attack when the upside for us is it's an even trade. Maybe we get our three life and we're at 23. And then the downside is they get to use their trick profitably. Now that they're tapped, we can just go ahead and candle uh, trap away the 4-4 flyer. And now I'll make the same attack with the 3-2 that I was talking about last turn. Because if they want to trade with either of those and give me my three life, I'm happy. But now I don't risk attacking into an open combat trick, and I get the same exchange. Is this a scary card? Counter spell, unless they pay three, who cares? Two, two, non-creature spells you control can't be countered, who cares? No, okay. Fine card and limited, but really more of a constructed rare. So with six mana, we can play farmhand, candle trap, and use it. But we have to play the farmhand first. If we play candle trap and use it, we'd only have one left. So this turn is scripted. Like I said, I'm happy to trade Ritual Guardian for, for uh, Siege Zombie and get my three life. I just didn't want to do that while their mana was up, and it was somewhat risky. Now that they're tapped, I'm definitely, my turn is full on script, and I'm not looking for better than a 4-4 four, four flyer to Candle Trap. And I'm happy to offer the 3-2 lifelink for the 2-2 two, two now, because I don't think it's going to do more than trade with that and give me three life. And they can't use a trick now. Obviously, I can't send the other two creatures because they would just have three kills. Yeah, farmhand is excellent. <laughs> Both the bird. Listen, I'm not really a hoarder. I don't even really like owning things. Uh, but, you know, organs are pretty useful. So if you're going to collect something, I guess. So other spirits get the Swamp one. Okay, spells from the graveyard are a little cheaper. So that's actually kind of annoying, though, because that makes that a 3-3 three, three flyer. But I can attack profitably with the farmhand as a 3-3 three, three, and the 3-2 three, flyer. So the question is, do I send just the Gale Drifter and the farmhand, or do I send everything? Because while, remember, they can eat a couple of creatures, they do come back from the dead and stuff like that. And they can't take eight. So if they block three... If I send everything, what happens? It's... 3-3 three, three on 2-2 two, two Flyer, 2-3 two, on, like, 2-1, two, 2-2 two, two on, like, 3-2 and take, like, 4. That's not better. Gale Drifter for either of their Flyers is good, and I have the mana to bring it back right now. And then Farm Hand for either of their Flyers is good, and they can't even block it with just the Shady Traveler. So the only thing is, if I send the Farm Hand, I mean, it's a profitable attack, but if they trade with the Gale Drifter, I can't bring it back out. So I I don't know. They also might have that minus 2 minus 0 that I keep talking about. I'm not sure what to do. Like I said, they keep leaving mana up while they have all spells in hand. I don't love this situation. I mean, I don't mind basically attacking with the Gale Drifter, letting them play that card and bring it back. I could also bring it back next turn pre-combat and tap something. But I could also just make this a 3-3 under their turn. Yeah, the Lunar Veteran I almost want to throw away also. So it can turn into a Flyer and a Tapper. And I think I kind of want to bring the Gale Drifter back next turn, not this turn. So I think I'm just going to send these three. They can use their minus 2, minus 0 oh profitably in one place. But if they don't kill the Gale Drifter, then the real fight's probably in the air anyway. And... I can start tapping flying blockers. So I think overall this is fine. So this feels pretty good. Like the Gale Trifter, even just trading with minus two minus O, means the ambitious farmhand takes out the other flyer. Or they take three from it, and I gain three. 
And then I have the Gale Drifter in the yard to bring back to tap a flyer next turn or a 2-3 or whatever. The drift, yeah, the devoted uh, Griff Graft Keeper has disturb, but I, if that dies, then I don't, I lose the tap effect. So that's like the last one I want to die, right? That's why I was considering the alpha. Like, obviously, if these creatures didn't come back from the dead, I would never alpha in this situation. It would be hor horrible to do so. Um, but I was considering the alpha because, like, I almost want some of these creatures to die, right? But for now, I'm going to sit on that plan. I'm not going to bring back a 1-1 one, one flyer now because if I bring it back on a later turn, I can tap a blocker. So we'll see what else they have. But that worked out pretty well. But of course, they didn't have the trick. That's why. If we know they don't have a trick, then all three of those attacks are profitable. The question was, what if they did have a trick? I don't really need Coven anymore. Oh, you're, you were just saying in case they play the minus two, minus oh, make sure you respond with, with the farmhand ability. Good call. I was like, I wasn't worried about losing Coven post-combat. The farmhand was the last important thing for Coven. But yeah, that was more of a reminder. Bearded Ben, indeed. Hey, that's what I needed to win last game, but at least it looks like it'll at least get us the seventh win. For now, though, I mostly just want to tap blockers, I think. I can save borrowed time for next turn because I'm not under any pressure. And if I tap the 2-3 and the 3-2 here... Well, actually, no. I tap the flying blocker so they can't block my flyer. And now I can let the 3-2 trade for the, the graph keeper, and then it comes back as a flyer, which is good for me. So this is great. I don't have anything else in the yard to bring back anymore. So now the Graph Keeper, I get in the damage this turn. The Graph Keeper will turn into its 3-1 flyer. And I'm trying to close this game out in the air. And I'm not worried about any attacks they might make because I'm at 31. You see how like all this life gain I've done with this like uh, Lunark Veteran and like the Life Link cards have made it so that my opponent's 2-2 zombies were not very threatening. If you take 10 life away from me, not this game, I'm at 31 every game, but like some of the games... I can't make these same profitable attacks because I would die during the, like, the backswing over the next couple turns. I'm telling y'all, like, I have a really high degree of confidence in this. I'm not saying what's better than what exactly how to value it. I, I'm just saying lifelink and haste are slightly better than you think they are in this format. Like, you know, like, they're slightly better. They're at least, they're significantly better by some, like, un, they're markedly better in this format than in an average format. Exactly what that means for each individual card, I don't know. But that's... That's my only current big hot take, big take. Right, it's not just the zombie tokens. Like MTG Mailing said, there's a lot of ping, a lot of reach. Not stuff that does 10, but a lot of stuff that does a free damage, two damage, three damage. So, like, between that and the zombie tokens, like I said, it just feels like I'm playing with 15, 16 life, not 20 to me. Okay, well, they did a lot. I think we're still in pretty good shape, but what are we going to do? We can borrow time, either a 3-2 flyer or, like, the 2-3 zombie lord. Probably just the flyer. I don't really care that they're pumping their ground zombies. I'm at 31. And then they have a 1-2 flyer to block with, which doesn't stop either of my 2-2s. Just means I can't send the 1-1. So, that all seems fine and dandy. Zombie Lord is really scary out of blue-black, but we have enough life that it's not really a concern right now. We're trying to close this game in the air. So hopefully they're dead. I mean, they have one flying blocker to our three lethal flying attackers, so they have to do two things. And that doesn't fly, and it's cool, but I'm not going to take lethal, and neither is that. So we got 7-1. Unfortunately, best game of the night. We lost uh, for the 7-0 last game, but what are you going to do? Uh, obviously, this isn't lethal, and none of this matters. They're just dead. All right, good stuff. 7-1 uh, and the previous draft. I got 7, but it was 7-2, I think. So 7-2 and a 7-1, not bad. I'll take it. Uh, unfortunately, we finished 65th Mythic and not 69th, so not quite that strong. But 
That was definitely fun. You can definitely expect more of these. Like I said, I'm drafting more than now that a new set is out. I'm definitely not going to be on any sort of schedule, but I will pop on and do two or three drafts whenever I feel like I have four or five hours to commit to a stream. So follow me if you like the content you saw, and uh, you'll know whenever I come online. We're going to finish tonight with uh, final cuts. One of my channel points rewards is uh, somebody will post a picture of their deck, and then we will edit it for them. So that'll give us a good five to ten minutes to discuss some of the card choices and stuff like that. This is the blue-white deck that we just went 7-1 with, if you want to see what it looks like. Um, like I said, the life gain stuff overperforms. I'm pretty confident in that. That was my one big takeaway from drafting over the weekend. Other than that, I mean, most of the cards everyone thinks are good are. I don't have too much hot takes to say. I think blue Black's a good deck. Organ Hoarder's excellent. Silversmith, get all these four drops are just excellent cards. Falcon Abomination's excellent. So let me find the, did you post, uh, whoever I'm doing the final cuts for, did you post a picture of it in the Discord? Or if you want to just post like uh, a photo of it, well, I guess you, you probably can't on Twitch, so. But yeah, I need a photo of the deck, the screenshot of the deck with like it and sideboard open, and we'll slap it up here on the screen and we'll build it. Um, I think Candle Trap is fine. Like, it's, it can double spell to flip werewolves when you want to. It can definitely swing a race, but if you're, like, like the more, if you're really aggro, then, like, yeah, I mean, their creature still gets to block, and, like, there's a lot of creatures that do things, so, like, turning a creature into a defender with zero power doesn't necessarily remove the creature. But Coven's also not that hard to get sooner or later. Like, you can't always have it when you want it on turn four or five. But, like, you can get it a turn later by playing the right creature or two. And then exile their creature then. That beard, indeed. Yeah, Gale Drifter's really good. Um, basically, like, you know, if you trade that card down, like, a mana, you're up a 2-2 two -two flyer. You remember what I was saying? Like, if you could pay a mana to go up a card in a game of limited, like, you would certainly be advantage. That's what Gale Drifter basically does. Like, it trades with a 3-mana creature removal spell on average, and you get a 2-2 two -two flyer out of it. I mean, I know you have to pay a bunch of mana for that in the late game, but if you stay alive, if you gain life, if you're able to leverage that body, you are gaining card advantage, which is the most valuable resource. Yeah, we got this. We went seven one, but we lost game seven at six and zero for the uh, for the seven zero, unfortunately. Um, so whoever's final cuts it is, if you're still around, um, I do. I need a picture. Okay, socks looks like they've got it covered. Thank you, socks. As usual, I'm not on top of things. Luckily, my mods are. So for anybody who hasn't seen this, uh, final cuts. We put up somebody else's deck and we build it for them, and we discuss the choices. Um, so let's see. First, I need to switch to display capture, show you what's up. Then, let me see if I can drag this up a little so we can see that whole two-drop slot. Okay. So, they've got a blue-black zombies. Looks like eight swamps, eight islands, which will most likely be correct, for, but we can uh, check the lands a little after. Uh, as far as the cards they didn't even put in consideration, I mean... Let's see. I don't think this is a larder zombie deck. It's a really defensive card. If the game goes long, it's a good win condition. It's a, in the sense that you sculpt your draws and uh, gain a big advantage over a stalemate. But a 1-3-for-1 one, one is a very defensive card, and this deck does not look very defensive. Startle, Vivisection, and Drownyard Amalgam are all certainly playables. But yeah, they have a lot of 4-drops, so I see why they started those Amalgam. They're not expecting to play those Amalgams. So assuming 16 lands is most likely correct... And they have another, like, there's 43 here and Amalgam's Viv Vivisection and Startle that are probably playable for their deck out of the board. That's 47, including those. Oh, I can just move them over, right? It's like Seal Deck Builder of some kind or something. Um, so Vivisection and Startle, I think are, I don't think there's any way this deck wants DB's cover-up. It's just a slow, expensive counter. You might play it if you have two in some kind of ultimate control deck or something, but that's not what this deck's going to do. 
Now, as far as this, we got to cut seven cards. They obviously have a million two drops. So any weak twos are a pretty easy cut. Weak two drop creatures. So I don't love the bait hook anglers, but it looks like they have a million shipwreck sifters, which is why they, you want to play every disturbed card you can, because then you can just discard it, get a two mana two, three, and get the card out of the yard. I'm really not a big fan of Geist Wave. That's the two mana bounce spell. So that's potentially cuttable. I don't think it's like, you know, way worse than... Um, Startle, which is also cuttable. I'm not saying it's in and Startle's in over it. Those are both just cuttable cards. Don't think we are cutting any of these Sifters or any of the Disturbed Creatures with how much of that we have. Uh, Scab Wrangler's really good. This card is one of Scab Wrangler's, one of those cards that might, if you, it's a lot better than it looks because you can trade it with their two drop on turn two or three, but if you hit a stalemate, you win the game. And even if it's not a stalemate, a lot of times you just play this card on like turn five or six and one other on tap creature, and then you use it as a tapper on their turn. And that's just a really powerful two drop. Then you get to untap and swing with everything or tap their flyer and attack in the air or whatever. Scab Wrangler is just like an excellent two drop. Uh, what is Spectral Adversary? Like I said, I know all the commons and uncommons and stuff, and even like these rares. Like I know Spectral Adversary, I just don't know the name. Okay, so Midnight Ambush isn't cuttable. Siege Zombie, we're probably not looking to cut from our all zombies deck. I guess Shifrick Sifter isn't a zombie. Maybe Siege Zong, well, we're still going to have a lot of creatures out, but... And this, the same thing with the Scab, I mean, we're not really a zombie deck. We're more of a Disturbed Blue deck here. So I guess we can consider cutting those, but... 2 mana 2-3 that pumps a few things is still a pretty good card. And Siege Zombie with all these small creatures is a pretty good card. Yeah, it's way more spirits than zombies, you're right. Um, remember, I didn't draft this deck. I, this is the first time I'm seeing it. So it's not like when I build after the draft portion where I know what I was drafting. You know, like this is now I'm like, this is like building a sealed almost. I'm like, this is my deck. Like I'm reading, I'm seeing what I have. Grafted uh, Revenge of the Drowned is good. What is Grafted Identity? Let me know what card that is. Additional cost cast a spell. Sacrifice creature and can't. Okay, so this is just great. Wow. So in the zombie token format, this card is just busted. Sack a stupid decay token and you got a four mana control magic. And it gets plus one plus one, which feels unnecessary, but this card's got to be excellent. Um, just is obviously good, good. I mean, I think just is probably worse than it looks, but it's still, it's still a good card. It's still a first pick, but you know, more of like that, like B plus a minus type, you know, busted, not busted, but like first pick type rare. I don't think it's like a board dominating card that often dies a lot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right. So yeah, this deck doesn't want vivisection. It's, it's going to go up cards a bunch of different ways. It doesn't even make two, two zombies that many. I like vivisection and a lot of the blue black decks with, with a lot of removal and not that much card advantage. But this deck's kind of the opposite. This deck doesn't have that much removal, but has a ton of card advantage. So Vivisection's easy out. Um, as far as these fours, they're pretty much uncuttable. So we're probably not going to want to play these amalgams because we're going to have to play all of our four drops, which is already six cards. Um, oh, I didn't even look at the threes yet. So I don't like Omnis Roost very much, but this might be the deck for it. Because not only is there a lot of Disturb, but with all these Shipwreck Sifters, you're just going to go through your deck. Like, you're going to get to keep making 1-1 Flyers. So, ne Ominous Roost is the kind of card that I think, like, you have... It can be really good if you have a ton, but I think people never realize how much you have to have before cards like this really overperform. But this might be the deck for it, because not only does it have, like, 6-7 Disturb cards, it also has a bunch of draw ones. So, it's really, like, a 34-card deck with like seven disturb instead of like a 40 card deck with seven disturb yeah that's five sifters we might also just cut a swamp we can certainly go to 15 lands when we have five two drops that draw a card so cutting a swamp is actually an option i haven't been considering nearly enough this curve wants 16 but remember we can just hit our land drop we play shipwreck draw a card discard one of our disturbed creatures like we want to so it's a two three and keep the land so i think we actually want to play 15 not so much because of the curve, but because of the five two mana cards that say draw a card. Um, I still think we probably want to cut the roost, though. Still kind of slow. Um, so I'm kind of leaning towards cutting these four cards. Is Startle doing much for us? What do we do with two two zombie tokens? We sack it to Grafted Identity. It's more of an opportunist non-token. How did they not make this card non-token in the Decay format? Are you for real? Um, so that's, there's synergy there. Dissipate's fine, but it's certainly cuttable as well. I mean, it's good if you're like passing and flipping a werewolf and then you have a counter up. This deck doesn't really want to pass very much. It's going to tap its mana on its turn almost all the time. So I think Dissipate's definitely cuttable too. 
don't think anything else is really too cuttable. No. All the so between these five cards, we're cutting four, I think. So I don't know which of these I want to play. I think Geist Wave is a pretty easy cut. Like I said, I'm not real big on that card. We don't have a ton of interaction, but I'd rather just have Startle over it, I think. I think Swamp is actually a pretty easy cut, too. I think this is a 15 land deck, given how much uh five mana blue five blue two drops a draw card. Although we might actually want to play nine seven. Oh, but we wouldn't play nine six, so it's gotta be eight seven if we're going down to fifteen. Okay. And then Yeah, I think I'm gonna play the startle. This is like a super grindy deck. I don't think we want situational power cards like Roost and Dissipate. I think we just want to do our thing and a, a nice combat trick like Startle. I think this is my build. It's pretty tough on the last cuts. Obviously, there's a really sweet deck. I love the Shipwreck Sifters thing. One thing of note, if you haven't had a bunch of Shipwreck Sifters yet, if you draw like one Disturbed Creature and three Shipwreck Sifters, you don't want to dis discard the Disturbed card to the first one because it pumps all of them when you discard a um, Spirit or a Disturbed Creature. So you may want to play Sifters and like discard an extra land or some slow card, not a Disturbed card. Then play your second Sifters, discard the Disturbed card, and pump both. So that's one little trick to keep in mind if you haven't had a bunch of Sifters yet, Ameke. Uh, your deck looks awesome. Good luck. Let us know how you do if you get a chance. You know, uh, always appreciate hearing how the deck did when we uh, added it on stream. All your cards look good. Um, love, like, love the curve and the synergy and all that. So thanks for redeeming. Good luck in your draft. Thanks, everybody, who uh, tuned in today. It was a lot of fun. Like I said, I'm not on a schedule, but there will be more of these just, like, pop on, do two drafts for four hours, and sign off. Um, so follow me if you like the content. Thank you to everybody who subscribed, despite how little I've been streaming. Thank you to everybody who still tunes in, despite how little I've been streaming. Good luck in your drafts. And who should we raid? course we'll finish with a raid who's on streaming second best drafter of all time is on is that the ham or the siggy or i never know with all the jokes and all the trolling and all of that Mike Torian is somebody who doesn't get in these conversations nearly enough for the record. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, he was like an absolute limited master as well and five Pro Tour top eights. And he just retired like in his prime to go work for WotC, which whatever. But uh, <laughs> as far as as a player and as a drafter and all that, uh, like he was absolutely great. Ham crushes it in every format. I, I'm not I'm not doing an actual poll, but I am looking right at the chat. Should I raid? I'm gonna give you a couple of choices if you wanna if you wanna weigh in. Should we raid Marshall, Boxy, Ham, or Ryan Sachs? Those are my four nominations. And then if I'm gonna look at the stream, I'm gonna look at the chat and whoever gets if there's a clear winner, I'm gonna raid them. I'm seeing a lot of Marshalls. A few hams, a boxy. All right, Marshall's a clear winner. We're going to raid Marshall. So for anybody who doesn't know, Marshall LR, I mean, obviously you know he is, limited resources, but I'm going to raid Marshall now. So hopefully you will enjoy his stream as well. Hopefully you enjoyed mine. I shouldn't say as well. It's like taking that for granted, but he chose to watch me, so hopefully you enjoyed the content. So it's Marshall underscore LR. Obviously, you'd think I know that. And again, thanks everybody for tuning in. Follow if you want to know when I'm on. I'm not promising a schedule. I am promising more small impromptu draft streams like this one. Um, you know, where I do like two, three drafts. And other than that, I'm now going to read Marshall. Good luck in your drafts, and I will see you next time.